And there it is. You're looking at the American-made rocket and spacecraft that will return American astronauts to the International Space Station from American soil for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttle last flown nearly nine years ago. Today, we're giving it another shot with our partners at SpaceX. Wednesday's first attempt was postponed due to that wild weather. But if all goes well today, we will mark a new first in NASA's storied history and usher in the commercial crew era of American spaceflight. At 3.32 Eastern Time this afternoon, NASA astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin are expected to lift off from Pad 39A aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft atop a Falcon 9 rocket. If the weather cooperates, today's attempt will mark SpaceX's first ever flight with crew and the beginning of a new chapter in human spaceflight. Good afternoon and welcome back to Kennedy Space Center, home of the wild Florida weather, which is why we're sitting inside again today, but this time a little bit closer with some plexiglass between us. Yes, and I'm Lauren Lyons, a senior Starlink development engineer at SpaceX, and joining us today is retired astronaut and NASA meatball lover, Leland. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lauren and Marie. It's great to be back. That weather was really wild last, last what, two days ago, three days ago? Yes, it feels like yesterday. I don't know, if we, depending on how much you slept, it could be the same day. <laughs> I but didn't I think much. it was Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> but down to T, I mean, T minus 17, uh, and our teams made the right call. You know, we didn't want to go through that weather and have something happen. And I think that, you know, we're back to this hollowed ground thing, Path 39A. We are, you know, my time back there was in 2008, 2009 on Space Shuttle Atlantis, launching to the International Space Station and building out the International Space Station. So now Doug and Bob can launch Crew Dragon and go to an assembly complete space station. Yeah, and I know it's it's been really touch and go with the weather. Yeah. We we're looking at it last night. We we're looking at it this morning. The teams are going to continue to monitor things. So it's kind of touch and go. But at last check, it was a 50-50 chance. So hopefully okay. those odds are going to be, I don't know if they're going to improve, but 50-50 is not bad. It could be worse, <laughs> right? Uh, so we have teams all over the country covering the action from SpaceX headquarters in California, Mission Control in Houston, and our social media desk in Washington, and of course, right here in Florida. Today's mission will be Crew Dragon's second test flight and its first test with humans on board. We're a little more than four hours away from liftoff. Bob and Doug have had their lunch and have completed their medical checks in advance of launch. It's about fifth or in about 15 minutes, NASA is going to turn the crew over to the SpaceX team. And once that happens, there are a series of key milestones to complete as we count down to T0. The first one is suit up. Now, the suit-up room is located in NASA's Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building, or the ONC. Here, the SpaceX team is going to help the astronauts put on their suits and perform key suit checkouts. From there, the next step is crew walkout. The astronauts are going to leave the ONC building for final goodbyes with friends and family gathered outside of the facility before they head out to the launch pad. And following final goodbyes, the crew will get in a Tesla and begin the roughly 20-minute drive to Pad 39A. Now, once at the pad, the crew will ascend the fixed service structure in order to board the spacecraft in a process we call crew ingress. During ingress, the SpaceX team will run a series of checks to ensure the suits, seats, and the vehicle interactions are all functioning properly. And after all the vehicle and crew checkouts are completed, the SpaceX closeout team will close Dragon's hatch with Bob and Doug safe inside. About 40 minutes before launch, the crew access arm, which is that long suspended walkway that the astronauts are going to use to board Dragon, it's going to retract away, followed by the arming of the launch escape system. Once the arm is retracted and the escape system is armed, that's when propellant loading on the Falcon 9 rocket will begin. About five minutes before liftoff, Dragon will be configured for what we call terminal count. This is when Dragon's onboard computers take control of the vehicle. And at T0, again, a little over four hours from now, from now, if all goes well and the weather cooperates, Crew Dragon and Falcon 9 will lift off from Pad 39A, carrying astronauts Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley. 
roughly 12 minutes after liftoff, Dragon will separate from Falcon 9's second stage, enter its activation phase, and begin using its own onboard propulsion system to carry Bob and Doug to their destination, which is the International Space Station. And as I mentioned previously, Bob and Doug are just finishing up their lunch, and we are currently awaiting their arrival to the suit-up room. And while we await that, you will notice over the course of this broadcast that we do not have crowds gathered here at, Ke at Kennedy Space Center. And that, of course, is one of the impacts of our protocols to protect each other and our teams. We would normally have tens of thousands of guests here at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida to view the launch. But even though we couldn't host a lot of guests here, you can still join us through every step of this historic mission from wherever you are. We have a team dedicated to those of you following along on social media and NASA's Tahira Allen is in Washington right now leading that effort. Hi, Tahira. Hey, Marie, and hey, everyone out there. My name is Tahira Allen, and if you are one of the 4.9 million people tuning in on Wednesday, we are so glad to see you here again. If you weren't able to witness the pre-launch activities on Wednesday, you are in luck because I'm here to bring you all the excitement happening on social media around the nation. This is a big day for both NASA and SpaceX, and we are ready for you to be a part of it. We had a lot of people engaged on Wednesday, so we want to see if we can top that energy today. We will be sharing your photos and thoughts live on air during today's broadcast, so don't hold back and show us how you're getting ready for liftoff. You can join the conversation by using the hashtag LaunchAmerica on NASA's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I'll be monitoring that hashtag Launch America all day to highlight your social media posts throughout the show. You'll also be able to engage in social media polls during today's broadcast. And so even if you tuned in before, these are brand new polls, so just head on over to NASA's Twitter to cast those votes. So I know most of you are tuning in from home today, but that doesn't mean you can't get involved in the action. Check out NASA's Instagram and Facebook to find our Launch America augmented reality filters. They place you right at Kennedy Space Center, and you can actually see the Falcon 9 rocket lift off in a pair of sunglasses. If you haven't already, be sure to check out our first ever global NASA social. So head on over to NASA's Facebook to join the group. We've got all new social badges, a nice fresh photo here, some Q&As with some very special guests, and also behind the scenes tours of Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And not to mention just an awesome community of people excited to witness this moment. So just right here in training, getting ready for that Launch America. So if you're just tuning in to get us started, we have a poll for you on Twitter right now. We wanna know what NASA logo you are sporting for today's launch, the iconic meatball or the iconic worm. Head on over to NASA's Twitter to cast those votes. And with that, let's head back to Lauren at Kennedy Space Center. Lauren. Thanks, Tahira. Uh, I don't want to sway the vote, but, uh, you know, I'm all about that worm. Meatball. <laughs> <laughs> the debate rages on. <laughs> Aside from our debate, the purpose or the main purpose of today's demonstration mission is to put Crew Dragon through the final operational tests to officially certify, certify the vehicle for human spaceflight. The SpaceX and NASA teams have put years of work in development, testing, and training to get us here today. And now we are just around the corner from seeing Falcon 9, Crew Dragon, and Bob and Doug lift off from the first for the first time and doing it from that same historic launch pad that first sent humans to the moon more than 50 years ago. Now, it's really good that we're inside today because <laughs> I'm, I'm still ready to run across there and try to hitch a ride to space on that Crew Dragon. It's a beautiful vehicle. What SpaceX and NASA have done together to create this incredible rocket, it makes me want to just run out that door right now and get out there. <laughs> well, you're not allowed to leave today, but Leland, I don't know if you've seen some of the comments on social media. You've been nominated by a lot of uh, followers to uh, fly one of the future missions of Crew Dragon. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's do that. Okay. <laughs> so we are just about three miles from Launch Complex 39A. Leland, don't get any ideas. I know that's not that far. Uh, that's where liftoff will happen in a little over four hours. And so we want to check in now with the team at SpaceX Hawthorne, where NASA's Dan Hewitt and SpaceX's Jesse Anderson are keeping an ear on operations. Good morning, guys. Hey, good morning, Marie. Thanks so much. First off, hashtag Team Worm. Uh, but hello from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. My name's Dan Hewitt. We're here for round two for this historic launch. 
And Dan, we're so glad to have you back here today. Hopefully the weather is working in our favor today. It looks really sunny and nice out there, so fingers crossed. My name is Jesse Anderson, and I'm a lead manufacturing engineer here at SpaceX, and we are so honored to be NASA's partner in returning humans to space from the shores of Kennedy Space Center. Ten years ago, we sent the dragon that's displayed right behind us on its first orbital demonstration flight. And I speak for all of us here at SpaceX when I say we could not be more excited to finally be sending humans to the International Space Station. And just as a refresher, today's mission is known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. This is going to be the first time a commercially built spacecraft will launch people to the space station. Demo 2 is an end-to-end -end flight test from launch to docking all the way to splashdown in the, in the Atlantic at the end of their mission. And this is the final test for NASA to certify SpaceX for regular crew flights to the space station. Right now, SpaceX and NASA have teams working together around the country. On the SpaceX side, they have teams at the Cape performing final launch day checkouts as we speak just to make sure Dragon is healthy and good to go. At the moment of liftoff, we will transfer authority over Dragon from our firing room in Florida to Mission Control here in Hawthorne. Mission Control will have insight and command of Dragon systems for the entirety of this upcoming mission. And since Dragon is a highly autonomous vehicle, our teams in Mission Control will be continuously monitoring the health and performance of the spacecraft through the entire duration of its journey. That's from liftoff all the way until Dragon splashes back down on Earth. While there are a number of people on headset here in Mission Control right behind us, the mission director is the one in charge. It's also where the SpaceX Corps, which stands for Crew Operations Responsible Engineer, who's essentially the voice talking to astronauts throughout their flight, will reside. Dragon and Falcon 9 together have years of operational experience, or what we refer to as flight heritage. SpaceX has successfully completed 22 flights of Dragon to and from orbit since 2010, and that includes 21 trips to the International Space Station. And to get us where we are today, not only have we conducted thousands of hours of testing, but we've also enhanced and added a number of safety features to Dragon. One of, those most, one of the most important safety features on Crew Dragon is the launch escape system. It's a huge advancement in the safety of human spaceflight, and SpaceX was able to demonstrate the system in two important tests, the first one coming back in 2015 with the pad abort test, which we're watching some video back from right now. And then a little bit more recently, last January of this year, the in-flight abort test. Dragon's launch escape system is outfitted with eight Super Draco engines that are integrated directly into the spacecraft body. This enables Dragon to separate from Falcon 9 and carry astronauts to safety in case of an emergency on the launch pad or all the way up to orbit. And in addition to the launch escape system, SpaceX has completed over 80 parachute tests, which includes nearly 30 tests of just the upgraded Mark III parachutes that's flying on today's vehicle. And that's to ensure a safe landing back on Earth, even in the unlikely event that one of those four main parachutes fails. And we can't forget the significance of our first demonstration mission just last year, which itself was an end-to-end -end flight test to and from the International Space Station, just no actual humans on board. But now, though, let's go to the one and only SpaceX's principal integration engineer, John Innsbrucker, for our first status update. John? Oh, you're so kind, Dan. Good morning from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. As Dan said, I'm John Innsbrucker, and I'll be bringing you status updates throughout today's countdown. We're currently just inside T-minus four hours, nine minutes. Today, as mentioned, is our second launch attempt. The first attempt was scrubbed on the 27th. In that attempt, the team proceeded deep into the countdown, but when three weather rules concerning lightning and cloud cover were no-go and there was no chance of improving, the SpaceX launch director stopped the countdown at just inside T-minus 17 minutes, and the launch was scrubbed. Now, following the scrub, we drained back the propellants from Falcon 9, and the crew returned to, uh, left the capital and returned to crew quarters. Now, since the scrub, Falcon 9 has remained vertical on the pad, as you can see there on the monitor, it's remained powered up. The launch crew currently reports no significant issues on the Falcon 9. Minimal activity has occurred on Dragon over the same period. The most significant task was topping off oxygen and nitrox in the environmental control system. Now, we just finished up a weather briefing to the crew a few minutes ago. Conditions at Kennedy Space Center for launch, 50% chance of violating conditions, which is also 50% chance of good conditions. The basic concerns are precipitation, cumulus thick clouds, anvil clouds, all related to the threat of lightning. 
We're also watching the weather downrange in case there is an abort and Dragon has to splash down off the coast. Uh, further, several hundred kilometers away, we are watching a, uh, a series of weather patterns that look like they're going to be good, so we are continuing into the count right now. Coming up at T minus four hours, the SpaceX launch director will perform a poll. That'll verify the conditions are safe there at the pad to open it back up to just the support crew. That support team will enter the area and begin preparations for arrival of the astronauts at the White Room at about T minus three hours. Following that poll, the launch director will provide a countdown status briefing. We might be able to hear that depending upon uh, what's going on on the nets. But right now, as the clock continues counting down, we're going to check in with Gary Jordan. He is with the flight control team at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Mission Control, Houston. How are the teams looking there, Gary? Thank you, John, and welcome everyone to Mission Control Houston. This room you see behind me is one of three flight control rooms at the Johnson Space Center, also known as Flight Control Room 1. This is where teams monitor and direct all of the operations on the International Space Station. It remains staffed 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. And today the team is especially focused on monitoring today's launch operations and making final preparations for Bob and Doug to dock with the station tomorrow morning. Today, I'm joined remotely by NASA astronaut Rex Walheim, who was on that last flight from American Shores nine years ago, STS-135, with Doug Hurley. Rex flew on two shuttle missions before that and is now the Deputy Director of Safety and Mission Assurance here at the Johnson Space Center. Rex, thank you for joining me. My pleasure, Gary. Nice to be here. Now, Rex, we're closing in on the suit-up process for Bob and Doug down at the Cape. What were some of the thoughts going through your head as part of the crew suiting up for a shuttle flight for the very last time? Well, it's just uh, it's a really exciting time. Uh, you've kind of practiced it many times before, but, you know, this is, the, is for real. But, again, you never know for sure uh, whether it's going to be for real. So for STS-135, we only had a 30% chance of launching on our actual launch day. So you're thinking, eh, it's probably not going to happen. But, you know, we've got to be ready for game day. And so uh, you get suited up. And you and you uh, and you walk out those storied cor corridors where Neil Armstrong walked out before he uh, went to the moon, and uh, get on the Astro Van in our case, and head out to the launch pad. Rex, as I recall, the weather was not so favorable for STS-135 in the beginning of the day, but started looking a little bit better towards launch time, and you were able to get off the pad. Though you had to scrub for weather on 110 and a few times on 122, it seems to be a normal thing for human spaceflight. Yes, it is. It's like I say, it, you never know what your launch day is. So you have to be prepared anyways, no matter whether the, the vehicle may have issues that they're working at the last minute or the uh, the weather may not cooperate. So. You get ready and uh, and do the countdown. And on STS-135, yeah, it didn't look very good. Like I said, we had a, only a 30% chance of go. And uh, so we got out there anyways, and we got strapped in. And uh, we weren't sure whether that was going to be go or not. And I, our commander looked outside and said, well, I got good news and I got bad news. The bad news is it's raining, but the good news is it looks like it's clearing to the west. And sure enough, they uh, they brought the count uh, back down to Team Ice 9, where they checked the weather, and they decided it was go. And so, hey, we're going. This is going to be great. Then they uh, brought the countdown all the way down to 31 seconds and the clock stopped. We didn't get any alarms or anything, and we're kind of looking around, what's going on? And uh, we heard over the intercom that the launch was halted due to a malfunction. And we're like, you know, what kind of malfunction? And, uh, and uh, sure enough, we figured, okay, well, now we're not going to launch for sure. It's just 31 seconds from launch. We've only got like a minute hold time, and so your mood and it starts going down. And figure, well, it doesn't look like it was going to be it. But turned out the, uh, the team at the Kennedy Space Center knew what the problem was. They wanted to make sure that the gaseous, uh, gaseous oxygen hood, the arm, had moved out of the way so the shuttle could launch. They took a camera, verified it was, and then they picked up the count. And when they pick up the count from 31 seconds, they think, holy cow, now we really are going. And so it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to collect your thoughts. But uh, uh, all of a sudden, T minus six seconds, the engines start up, and uh, T minus zero, you feel that big jolt. And, hey, it is today, and uh, you, you get ready to do the mission. Well, here's to hoping for the best today. NASA astronaut Rex Walheim, thank you for joining us. Let's go back to the Kennedy Space Center to watch the suit up in action as we continue to count down to launch. Leland. Hey, thanks, Gary. Hey, Rex, it was so great to fly with you on STS-122. And I remember you turning to me saying, hey, Leland, it's going to be great. You're going to do great. And you made me feel so good about launching into space. And I just really appreciate your support and your kindness. And uh, that was a great mission, and I, I really appreciate you, man. Hey, it was great fun, Leland, you know. But, uh, you know, you're a pretty big guy, and so you didn't exactly leave a lot of space sitting next to you on launch uh, for your buddy here. I kind of had to, you know, kind of scrunch myself to the side. 
I remember that one sim we had where we put our spacesuits on and got into the simulator, got all strapped in, and you being a former NFL uh, player having played professional football, like I say, there wasn't a whole lot of room for me, so I kind of squeezed my way the best I could. But I remember saying to our commander, Steve Frick, I said, hey, Steve, next time we fly with a professional athlete, why don't we pick a jockey? You know, so it was a little bit, uh, it was a little bit uh, crowded there, but it was a wonderful flight, and it was an absolute pleasure to fly with you, Leland. Likewise. And when you came home on 135, I was with your family. I remember it was a night landing, and I said to, I said, hey, Fergie's back, and your son, I'll never forget this, he said, hi, Dad, and it's all about the families, and you did such a great job on that mission, flying with Doug on that last shuttle mission. So thank you, Rex, for everything you've done. We're going to um, go live in crew quarters in a minute and uh, see Bob and Doug suiting up. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Rex. Thanks. My takeaway from uh, what Rex had to say is you're telling me there's a chance. There is I know a there's a chance. There's a pretty good chance, actually, 50%, in fact. And the astronaut crew quarters is where astronauts live in seclusion before missions to space, and it's where Bob and Doug have been living for the past 10 days. Now, the suit-up room inside of the crew quarters is something of a national landmark in and of itself. This room was first used as a suit-up room for Apollo 7 back in October 1968. And for every crew mission since then, when, when launching from U.S. soil, serving 400 different astronauts on a total of 150 missions, this is the room where Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins suited up over 50 years ago, where astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen suited up for the first shuttle flight, STS-1, back in 1981. And for every shuttle flight over the next 30 years, think of that. Every flight to the moon, every flight of Skylab and Apollo Soyuz, and every single space shuttle flight started in that room. And Leland, I know many of us have experienced some form of quarantine over the last several months, but I would imagine that two weeks in quarantine and preparation for a space flight is unlike any other time in your life. What were some traditions that took place? Oh, we uh, we would get together and sit down and sometimes tell jokes and try to make the mood a little bit lighter. We would review our notes and things, but uh, we would bring our families in and have a crew meal together with our families, and that was uh, was really touching. And uh, it's just card games, different things to get ready for that iconic mission to space. Absolutely. In many ways, everything prior to this moment was preparation, and everything after this is the mission. Um, and prior to Wednesday's first attempt that we told you about, the suit-up room was last used for the final shuttle flight, STS-135, in 2011. And I want to mention one more detail about that mission. We want to show you a picture of the crew from the last American space flight launching from U.S. soil. In the picture, if we can bring it up, you'll see Doug Hurley. There it is, Doug Hurley. He was the pilot for STS-135. Today, is, he is the commander of Demo-2, the spacecraft commander. Also suiting up for that mission was Chris Ferguson, Sandy Magnus, and Rex Walheim, who we just heard from a few minutes ago. And we are standing by to go into the suit up room. We just passed the T minus four hour mark. So suit up is just beginning now. And there is our first look in the room. There is astronaut Doug Hurley getting into his space suit and he's being helped by one of the suit technicians there. So this is our, our first look in the room. Again, Doug Hurley, he has flown into space two times before. He was the pilot on STS 127 and 135. And there's a wider shot you can see astronaut Bob Benkin also in view now. Bob is to the right of your screen, and he was he also flew on two shuttle missions. Bob is a native of St. Anne, Missouri. So if you're watching from Missouri, especially St. Anne, wave hi, there's Bob. And Doug is from Appalachian, New York. He was born in Endicott, considers Appalachian his hometown. Uh, I know a lot of people there because I'm from there too. So if you're watching from upstate New York, shout out to you there too. This is so cool to see. Leland, this must bring back memories for you. It does, but you know, it's a little different than when I was suiting up because there were there were Apollo era lazy boys that were laying sitting in and leaning back in and now they're in these really incredible sleek uh, suits as well as these uh, the seats that are actually the same seats that are in the in the crew dragon vehicle and that's pretty amazing. Yes. These seats are uh, basically ground support equipment seats. They're pretty much the same as the ones in the vehicle as Leland said. So what they're doing right now is strapping the crew into the seats to prepare for the two big checkouts that they're doing right now. Uh, they're going to do a comms check, a bi-directional comms check, where they're going to check that the microphones that are inside of the helmets that the crew are wearing, that uh, the, the suit techs can communicate with them bi-directionally. And they'll also do a leak test, which is a, a pressure test, where they'll pressurize the space suit. So the suits are 
more, much more than just futuristic looking outfits. They do look like they come from a, a sci-fi movie. Um, but they, as we described, they're, they're designed to connect directly into dragon seats to provide communications, cooling, and the ability to pressurize if necessary. Um, a moment ago, you may have seen one of the suit technicians um, attaching a big white umbilical to the leg of the suit. That is the way in which the communications and the, the airflow, all of that is happening through that umbilical, which is connected to the seat. So right now, as you can see, we're getting, the team is getting the crew all buttoned up in their five point harnesses and getting ready for those checkouts. And there's that worm again, Leland, right front and center. How does that make you feel on a spacesuit? It makes me feel just great, <laughs> Marie and Lauren. I, um, you know, we have a lot of heritage and tradition with the meatball, but uh, I'm able to be a little bit more flexible now. Now that <laughs> Lauren has beat this worm thing into me. No, but they're they're getting ready. They're they're focused. They've had breakfast. They've had chances to talk to friends and family, and uh, you know, it's, it's getting real again. And uh, that 50-50 chance, you know, I'm staying positive on 50% chance of going. Uh, you know, seeing the suit techs around them with these futuristic looking flight suits versus the white suits that we've had in the past. It's a, it's, it's, it's a you know, transitioning from that old legacy to this new era in space travel. And I think the working with NASA and SpaceX working together as one team it's just like what we do in space, work together as an international team to get things done. Absolutely, and and this group really gets to know each other well too. There's a wave from Doug and a thumbs up. That's so cool to see. I mean, uh, the people in that room get to know Bob and Doug really well because they've rehearsed this so many times, you know, especially the suit techs. They've, the suits are, you know, custom made for each of the astronauts. So I feel like I couldn't even count the number of times they've had like suit fit checks and leak checks and just making sure every detail uh, with the fit and the function is just just perfect before they get ready to, to launch. And interestingly enough, these suit techs are also the designers of the spacesuit. They've been working with the crew for years as, as we've been building these suits, their training suits, all of the training events in, in Hawthorne where the crew is inside of the Buck, the capsule simulator. Um, this is the team that's been working with them for years. Uh, the team that dressed Ripley, which is the ATD, the dummy that flew in Dummy Demo One. Um, so the mannequin, right? The man yes. <laughs> mannequin, smarty, the smarty. Lots of names for Ripley. <laughs> but, but the point being, uh, they've they've been with these suits from cradle to grave and have been working so closely with Bob and Doug. Uh, uh, pressures and making sure everything uh, looks good prior to arming the launch escape system, but not tracking a constraint at the moment. So overall, Dragon's healthy and uh, ready for crew ingress. Okay, thank you for the update, MD. And this concludes the countdown briefing. So you just heard in that briefing there, they're continuing to move forward towards launch. And as we have a view of Doug Hurley there adjusting his visor, again, he is the spacecraft commander for Demo 2. And while he continues the suit up process, we want to give you a closer look at the veteran Marine Corps fighter pilot and spaceflight pioneer. Very excited, yeah, very excited. Still ready, still pumped? Oh yeah, I think we're ready. Uh, I think we're certainly ready. Joining the SpaceX Demo 2 test. He is a Marine Corps colonel and test pilot. He was selected as an astronaut in 2000. He piloted Space Shuttle Endeavour and Atlantis for STS-135, the final Space Shuttle mission. Introducing NASA astronaut Doug Hurley. It's a life-changing process in so many ways to fly into space. It's just overwhelming in some, some respects. Just the sensations, the rumbling, the shaking, the acceleration. When the engine shut off and you go from, in the case of the shuttle, you go from three Gs to zero Gs instantaneously and things start floating. And, and I remember distinctly just thinking what just happened. To see a rocket launch in person is, uh, it's a pretty emotional event. I remember the first time I saw a shuttle launch and it's just, it was amazing. 
And then when I saw a shuttle launch with my wife on it, that is, that is quite the emotional experience. My name is Doug Hurley, and I'm the spacecraft commander for the Demo-2 mission to the International Space Station. We are doing the first crewed flight for NASA and for SpaceX. So this is the test flight to prove end-to-end -end from launch to docking to ISS operations and then entry, descent, and landing. This will be the first time the Dragon had a crew on board, and so there's a a, a myriad of objectives we want to achieve for this mission. SpaceX has been responsible for design and, and, and essentially making this vehicle what it is. What the astronauts bring to the table is the crew vehicle interface. What would work on orbit, what might not work on orbit, what would definitely work to be able to just have the entire integrated a uh, team that's going to support us getting to and from space station, talking together, working through the challenges that simulators typically uh, throw at you. It was really neat being part of it. It's just been an incredible undertaking to see where we've come just in the last five years that, that Bob and I have been a part of this and to be, you know, shortly uh, flying to the International Space Station with the Crew Dragon. It overwhelms you to think about how many people have in some way, shape, or form touched this program and this and this vehicle to get us to this point. And you know, we are the lucky ones that get to fly it, but we certainly not for one second take for granted the amount of effort that so many other people had to put into this to make it successful. For Doug personally, he's he's worked so hard, I mean through his entire life, um, to get to where we are right now. As a test pilot, this would be a dream to fly a new vehicle. So it makes me so happy to see that he gets to be part of this mission, the spacecraft commander. I'm just glad to see his hard work and his dream has come true for that. It's been a long road in a lot of ways for not only us, but certainly for all the folks that work in the commercial crew program, as well as SpaceX in our case, just working to get to this point. It's been a huge amount of sacrifice and, and time away from home, but the fruits of our labor are, are coming to uh, fruition. We are now getting closer to when we expect to see the crew complete their suit checks and walk out of the Neil, Armstrong's, Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. And before they do, here's an introduction to the Joint Operations Commander for Demo 2. You see to the left of your screen there, former Air Force flight test engineer, Bob Benkin. When you go through the, the launch day preparations, there's a lot of moments that, that kind of stand out to you. One is the kind of the celebratory piece of it, which is that you're walking out of the suit up room and uh, getting in the vehicle that's gonna take you to the launch pad. When you close the hatch, you know, that's really when Doug and I are in the vehicle and it's our vehicle and you know we're really in control of the mission uh, at that point. Test pilots, their task proved that man could fly into orbit around the Earth and return live and well to talk about it. There's always a, a balance of managing risk as you go forward to execute a test point and figuring out a way to you know, collect the data. We hear a sound, okay, is that sound an expected sound? Or we see a light, is that light an expected light? Um, what's the source of it? Does it sync up with something else that's going on or not? So trying to dissect all of that in real time in your head is, uh, you know, a lot of things happen like that on, a, on launching of a vehicle. From St. Anne, Missouri, he is an Air Force Colonel and flight test engineer. He flew aboard Space Shuttle Endeavor twice, introducing NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. My career at NASA has uh, kind of spanned a, a couple of decades at this point. I, I arrived with the class of 2000. Uh, went through the training program, primarily focused on the space shuttle and the International Space Station, learning those systems. Having uh, launched a couple times on vehicles, you know, the, the second time was definitely different than the first time. 
you can feel a little bit guilty of, hey, should I study one more thing? Or is there one more piece of information I should get? Am I really prepared or not? Um, so that's definitely different between uh, uh, where I was on my first flight and where I'm at right now. It's been uh, uh, really interesting, I think, for both my wife and I to have gone through the process of seeing each other uh, launch in space. I've seen her take that risk and had it be in front of her, and uh, I've done that to her. There's just something different about watching a rocket launch when there are people on board. You feel a little bit differently about the pit of your stomach, and I can only tell you it's multiplied uh, significantly when it's uh, somebody that you know, and then somebody, of course, that's a family member. It's even multiplied more. For me personally, as a spouse, watching um, everything that Bob has put into this over the last five years, um, the dedication that he's shown, the perseverance is pretty special. For both of us though, the, the way our minds work, it won't be until sort of the mission is complete that you have really a chance to savor it and celebrate it. This is a huge accomplishment for uh, an Air Force flight test engineer to be part of the demonstration mission of a brand new vehicle. It's going to be amazing. Without a, a partner that has that same appreciation, I think it can be challenging for some folks. There's a, there's a lot of work and a lot of time that uh, takes away from family that, uh, you know, that my spouse appreciates, and I love her for that. Really, my role on the Demo 2 mission is to make sure that we get this vehicle uh, tested and evaluated so that we can move on to more operational missions at the International Space Station. We've got a lot of objectives uh, on board the uh, vehicle that we need to accomplish to, to really make sure that it's uh, good to go. We'll make sure all those systems are working uh, during the test flight so that the future missions uh, will have them available even if they don't plan to utilize them. Through years of the, the NASA team um, helping to share that experience and teaching them the lessons that we've learned by going through this, now there's another capability in the U.S. besides NASA to operate something of this magnitude. When is the last time humans launched on a, a new vehicle? Certainly on the, the American side, it's, it's been several decades. Now we're in a time when we've got multiple vehicles under development. It's a great time from a, a space exploration time frame just to see all that happening. And it's because of this nurturing of the environment, being able to pull in a, a wider group of people who can contribute towards a human spaceflight. It's just a, it's a super cool time. On a deeply personal uh, level, I, I'm really excited that my son has got to get a chance to see me uh, launch into space. Being an astronaut has been a little bit of a, an abstraction thing for him because he's seen me do it in old videos, uh, but he hasn't seen me do it for real. And so I'm excited for him to see uh, this launch. I want to thank the entire commercial crew program team that's worked together to get to this point where we've got vehicles and the launch pad ready to head to the International Space Station. And here is a live look again inside the suit up room in the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. We can see now NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. He's talking to the crew. You won't hear any audio in here. And actually, we had some questions about this Wednesday because people were like, why can't I hear what they're saying? That's by design. It's not a mistake. Um, we are really lucky to be able to show you this video live as they're suiting up. But you don't hear the audio because that's a little bit, you know, we, we try to give the crew a little bit of privacy. Um, and so being able to talk freely and, and share really what's on their minds without uh, having to worry about who's listening is, is part of the reason you don't hear audio in there. But uh, that's Jim Bridenstine there um, talking to the crew, and it looks like Associate Administrator Jim Moorhard um, is also in the room standing to the right of your screen. And these are great moments to get a uh, last chance to talk to the senior leadership of NASA as they're about to go off and launch into the cosmos. And I, I think when you look at the co how Bob and Doug complement each other and how these SpaceX suits, you know, they really complement the, the astronauts too because they're, they're more form-fitted, they're custom-made, and uh, this is a moment where they're getting ready to, you know, do the, do the real deal. And uh, Lauren, I think, you know, the integration of the suit and the, and the vehicle and the seats is just really, really impressive how y'all at SpaceX did that. Yeah, the primary purpose of the spacesuit, it is a, it's a pressure suit. Now, the Dragon capsule is already pressurized, so even in the vacuum of space, the crew is safe when inside of Dragon, but in the unlikely event of an anomaly that causes the capsule to depressurize, we can actually flow oxygen or nitrox into the suit 
and that will keep the astronauts pressurized in flight. So that's its main purpose. So it's that, that form and function and uh, some style there as well. And for the kids out there that have 3D printers or have 3D printed, the, uh, the actual helmets were made by 3D printing. So you could be a spacesuit designer yourself because you already have the skill set and uh, or fly in space one day if you wanted to. And I, you know, I'm curious about what kind of conversation might be going on with them. It looks like they're, it's lighthearted. You can see Doug laughing there. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Bridenstine has said, you know, Bob and Doug, if you want to back out, it's not too late. I would imagine he, he may have said that again. I know they're ready to go. They're as eager as can be. Um, and it looks like they may have another visitor coming in. Oh, no, it looks like the administrator is just being passed something there. But... Uh, you know, and it's really important. I mean, we've trained for so long. The We've gone through the malfunction processes. Now he's doing a selfie. So, so, of course. <laughs> you got to do the selfie. I didn't see them do this on Wednesday, so they were probably kicking themselves when they walked out. Why didn't we do a selfie in there? <laughs> I wonder if he has that Instagram filter to put the glasses on. Do you think he has it on? I, well, you can tweet at him and find out. Hey, I might have to do that. <laughs> No, this is a great lighthearted moment. It helps get the guys in a good frame, frame, uh, frame set mindset to, uh, you know, go off in space in a, in a very calm and cool and collected way. I think he's now taking pictures of the, some of the, the crew techs, the, the suit techs, which is fantastic. It's all about bringing the family and the team together, you know, making everyone feel comfortable on flight day mm -hmm. and helping us get to space safely as we always try to do. And obviously this is, you know, this is a very, serious mission. I mean, we don't want to make make too much light of it, but Leland, you mentioned Wednesday, and I thought that was a really good point, why it's important to, to be able to joke around and keep things light as you're getting ready to go to the launch pad. Yeah, you know, when I went up on 122 with Rex, and we just talked to Rex, you know, we were, you know, in the caravan going over to the launch pad, we were kind of making some jokes, but in, even in as we were suiting up, we would look over at each other, we would, we would get up and high five, and we'd say, hey, you're ready? Let's go, let's do this, you know, and it's just, You've already trained. You know how to do this. You've done it many, many times. And so I think it's uh, that lightheartedness is good. But, you know, right when you get in the vehicle, the three, two, one lift off, that's when you're ready to go. And there are the visitors making their way out of the room. And as we mentioned, Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, I mean, they are two of the finest at what they do. And it's really starting to sink in that the mission is on as you see them in their spacesuits. And seeing them in these suits has always been so inspiring to me from the first time that I saw them at Hawthorne, in Hawthorne at SpaceX headquarters during training. It's kind of like a sci-fi film, um, but unlike a movie prop, uh, which primarily just needs to look cool, our, design, our, our team designed the suit to maximize safety and functionality while maintaining style. Here are two members of our spacesuits team, Chris Trigg and Maria Sundin, telling us about how the suit came to be. I think one of the things that was important in the development of the suit was to make it easy to use, it's something that the crew just has to literally plug in when they sit down and then the, the suit kind of takes care of itself from there. So the suit is really kind of one part of the bigger Dragon system, it's really part of the vehicle. So um, we think of it as kind of a suit seat system, so the seat that the crew is in and the suit are in a lot of ways working together and so it made sense that we were designing Dragon in-house to also design the suit. Our spacesuit is completely designed in-house. It's built here in Hawthorne, California, in the same building as the rocket and the capsule. The spacesuit is uh, custom made for each crew member, and that is to optimize the fit for the crew member. We definitely wanted to innovate and we wanted it to look inspiring, but first and foremost, we wanted it to be, be safe and reliable. The spacesuit's primary purpose is to protect the crew in the unlikely event that the cabin were to depressurize. But the suit does a number of additional things. It provides cooling and communication to the crew inside of the suit, it provides them hearing protection, and the outer layer of the suit is flame resistant, so it provides flame protection as well. When the crew gets in the capsule, they get in their seats and they plug the suit into the umbilical that's attached to the seat. And the umbilical is providing everything that the suit needs. So it provides um, the avionics or electronics for communications, it's providing the air to cool the suit, and then it also provides gas when needed to pressurize the suit. So it's really a single point that lets the suit do all the things that it needs to do. We designed the helmet in-house. The helmet serves a number of different functions. Obviously, it's protecting the crew's head and it's retaining gas like the rest of the suit, but it also houses the microphones as well as the valves that are, are regulating pressure in the suit. 
We had to design the gloves so that they would work with the touchscreens, but the gloves also still had to do a number of other things like the rest of the suit. So all of those things had to come together uh, within the glove. It'll be obviously really amazing to see Bob and Doug in their flight suits. And I think one of the things that's cool about the suit is it's not just a piece of hardware. It's not just a suit. It's a very personal thing. It's Bob's suit and it's Doug's suit. And so seeing the two of them in their, in their suits, using it in flight will be just uh, a really amazing thing. And you're looking live at Launch Complex 39A. That is Crew Dragon in the center of your screen, sitting atop a two-stage Falcon 9 SpaceX rocket that will produce 1.7 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. We are keeping our finger, fingers crossed that the weather cooperates. Uh, it's a 50-50 chance. It looks beautiful right now, but there may be some thunderstorms rolling in later, so we're keeping a close eye on the weather. In the meantime, we're going to head west to Hawthorne for an operational update. Dan? Hey, Marie. Uh, we are here in Hawthorne still. The astronauts have a crew training facility that's equipped with both a cockpit simulator and a full-scale Dragon mock-up to conduct simulations both for nominal and off-nominal situations. And recently, the SpaceX team shared the exact same ISS simulator that the astronauts train on with the public, so you can try your hand at docking the ISS. If you head over to iss-sim.spacex.com, you can try our hand, your hand at docking with the space station. And I've tried it once before. It was really difficult. It, it looks way more, uh, it, it's more difficult than it actually is, I think. Yeah, flying in space <laughs> is really deceiving. Just when you think you're going really slow and you're, everything's okay, the next thing you know, you're careening into the space station. So <laughs> it's way harder. You have to go way slower than you think. It might take a couple of tries, but it's doable. Yeah, but you guys should try it and check it out and see if you can do it. <laughs> so let's check in with John Insprucker for a quick update on Dragon and Falcon nine. John? Well, we're coming up on T-minus three hours and 35 minutes. All continues to go well for today's launch. Now on the launch pad, Falcon 9 is powered on. Engine and stage checkouts were performed last night. All of those looked good. Now we're currently pressurizing gas storage vessels on both the first and second stage. And as I like to report, the good news is there's nothing significant to talk about on the rocket right now. Now on top of Falcon 9 is the Dragon spacecraft. That's being prepared for the crew. The Dragon propellant system was pressurized to final flight pressure about an hour ago. We had the support team arrive in the white room uh, just inside T-minus four hours, and we're waiting right now for the crew to walk out of the ONC building, and they should arrive at the pad by about T-minus three hours. For the Dragon spacecraft, all systems are also currently go. The Air Force range reports no issues at this time. The range will be maintaining both air and sea space clearance around the launch pad. They also help support things like putting the roadblocks up to prevent access to the hazard areas at both the launch site at 39A and uh, around the Cape. Now, the big question, of course, is the weather. And as I said before, we all talk about it, but it's the one thing we can't do anything about. Weather is 50% probability of good conditions. We are going to be watching for the clouds, lightning, thunderstorms. The sea breeze is not as strong today, and that's going to not help push all of that back over central Florida. But right now, things are looking good with both Falcon 9 and Dragon as we count down to liftoff. Now, we want to see where you're following today's launch from, so we're going to jump over to Tahira at our social desk. Thanks, John. So glad to hear that things are at least looking good right now for this launch. Really hope it stays that way. So we just took a look at numbers of viewerships across our social media platforms, and there are now 500,000 of you tuning in for today's broadcast. Welcome, guys. We are so excited to have you. We also have the top cities right now tuning in, and that's Columbia, South Carolina, Houston, Texas, Los Angeles, New York, and Orlando. So it seems like the East Coast is really pulling today's viewership, but hey, last time on Wednesday, California came in and really stole the whole show away. Let's take a look at what's being shared online right now. So right now we have this future astronaut, and I don't know who he had to call, but it looks like he is in this SpaceX suit and his Tesla getting ready for round two. Absolutely love it. Let's take a second look. Okay, right now we have a French bulldog. It looks like taking Bob's uh, place for launch right now. This is so funny. Um, we love to see it, guys. And so 
for those of you tuning in, be sure to use that hashtag launch America on social media and show us how you're getting ready for liftoff. So earlier in the show, we polled users to see which NASA logo you're sporting for today's launch and the results are in. So it looks like about, um, Looks like about 62% of you are wearing the meatball today, and that leaves the worm falling a little bit behind. But hey, now that the worm is back, maybe y'all will be sporting it more often. Um, and so with that, let's head back to Marie at NASA Kennedy. Marie. Thanks, Tahira. We have some uh, really spirited reactions here. We're looking live at the ONC walkout doors, but I just have to tell you, Leland threw up his arms in the air in victory when he saw more people sporting the meatball, and Lauren looks like... Someone I'm just shook. kidnapped She's her dog. I am shook. <laughs> go worm, go worm, go away worm. <laughs> oh, wow. <sighs> you know, you, you, you can't predict, you know, how everyone else feels. That's the beauty of diversity of opinions, you know. <laughs> and other traditions like the meatball and the worm or a card game that we play called Possum's Fargo. And you have to play enough hands to where the commander loses a hand before we can walk out. So that's probably going on right now and they're getting ready to have Doug lose his hand. Yes. And then we can get in the elevator and come out and get in the spaceship. Yep, so we're giving that them that moment in private. And Leland, I wanted to ask you too, because I know, I mean, we had a scrub really late in the count yesterday. We got just under T minus 17 minutes and we were all like, oh, it was like a collective groan across the country, everybody watching. Um, and I know you've you've been through a delay once yourself mm -hmm. on one of your shuttle flights. And I wonder, you know, what does it take to kind of refocus yourself on day two? I mean, do you go through all mm -hmm. the exact same preparations? Do you do anything a little different? Is there a little bit of superstition involved? No, not really. I mean, we try to keep everything the same way because we've, we've practiced this way and now we're in the real day, we're playing this way. So if you stay in the same, kind of the same form and function that you've done before, nothing else hopefully will happen that's out of character to your mission. So I think we just try to stay the same way. Yeah, that's that's good insight. And I know, you know, Bob and Doug, we heard them on the comms after that as they were detanking Falcon 9 and we're waiting for them to get out of Crew Dragon and they were just cool, calm, collected, yeah. thanking the teams for doing a good job. Nobody's getting launch fever. And, you know, they're going to do the same thing today. No matter how many people are watching, they're going to make the same call as they would if nobody was paying any attention. Right. And I was talking to uh, CJ Sturkow before I launched on my first mission, and he said that he made a mistake and flipped the wrong switch on, on Ascent, and he glommed on that and was about to make another mistake. But he said that he had to just focus and get back to, you know, grace under pressure so that he would make a third mistake, which could have been, you know, catastrophic. So that's what we always try to do is to try to do everything the same way, be very deliberate, but be very graceful, not not really try to overthink something, but try to try to stay safe. Absolutely. And, and calm. Yeah, that's that's so key. And I know that's a top of mind for all the SpaceX mm -hmm. and NASA teams um, working on this today. And again, we're just standing by. We expect the crew is going to be leaving the suit up room um, in just a couple of minutes. So we're giving them those last few minutes in private at the ONC building. And again, we're looking at the pad here. One of the other things um, that struck me, you know, we we watched the, the videos about Bob and Doug and when I went home on Wednesday, you know, because people saw a lot of people who were watching and then or maybe are watching again today, saw the videos about them, learned a little bit about their military background. My husband's a Marine, so uh -huh. he's like super pumped about Doug. You know, Doug tweeted Semper Fi. And so I know like all the Marines out there are like just super pumped about seeing this and the airmen that are watching Bob, seeing them represent the Air Force. I mean, it's just such a cool moment for our military community. And as a military spouse, I, I definitely feel some of that pride. I saw Charlie Bolin last night coming from the restaurant and uh, he was very excited about Doug as a Marine and he's a Marine. And so mm -hmm. Semper Fi was definitely something he said, Godspeed Semper Fi, go Crew Dragon. So it's uh, our, our military people that are helping us with this launch, with the recovery, with all these other things is very important to uh, the success of the mission. Absolutely. And we want to turn our attention back to the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. If we could, we want to take you to a picture of the doors. There they are. Those are the doors at the back of the crew quarters building. And it's an area where family, friends, and members of the media can share one final moment with the crew before launch. Now, the walk through those doors has signaled the beginning of the march towards launch for every American mission to space since 1968. This is the moment that is immortalized on film and video 
video for 400 different astronauts from Apollo all the way through Space Shuttle, serving 150 total missions. And soon, the weather cooperates, mission number 151, with the first two commercial crew astronauts. These doors carry with them a legacy of purpose and action. And today, they will announce to all of us the start of this, NASA's SpaceX Demo-2 mission. And you saw just a little bit of uh, my walkout from STS-129, my last mission. And I remember having my friends and family out there. There was my chemistry teacher that was uh, in the crowd. She got me turned on to science and helped me actually become an astronaut. And I, I just remember her being in the crowd saying, go Leland. And it was just <laughs> such a, a memorable moment for me. It kind of got more rocket fuel in my veins, getting me ready for for my mission. Yeah, absolutely. And we were we were just looking at a live picture um, outside of the building where we could see uh, some of the folks gathered. We could see Doug and Bob's immediate families. Um, there's a small contingent of media there. I mean, normally that place would be just kind of jam packed with as many people as we could fit in there to capture that moment. We, of course, had to be uh, had to scale that back a little bit to maintain social distancing. But there's still a very excited group of people standing outside the building right now waiting for that to happen. Yeah, it's so cool to see their families there and that they have that moment with them prior to getting inside of the Teslas. I mean, I it, seeing that the last time we made that attempt was this incredibly emotional moment. Um, I have no doubt it will also be emotional again. Uh, but yeah, that I can only imagine what's going through their heads, you know, in that moment when they're just waving goodbye uh, yeah. for the last time before flying. I mean, Leland, like, were you nervous? Were you you know, it, at that moment, we were, you know, we had been a little jovial in the in the in the suit up walkout. But I think at that moment, we we're thinking about our families, leaving our families. But then at the same time, we're going to do this incredible thing for helping advance our civilization. We are working as a team. All the other teams now with SpaceX and NASA and people all around the world, really, you know, in recovery and all these things helping us get to space so we can advance our civilization. And I think those those moments are really heartfelt for us that a team of people have helped us get to this point. Absolutely. And we are looking at a live picture now of Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley walking down that hallway in the astronaut crew quarters. We just saw Doug wave at the screen and they're just turning the corner, getting inside that elevator. And this, you can't see it from here, but there is a banner hanging there. You can kind of see it in the back. There's a banner hanging on the wall of the elevator with the signatures of all the people who worked on this mission. So it was really important for, for them to hang that up in there so Bob and Doug could see it. Yeah, we see that, and we see all those signatures of people that have helped us through training, through fit check, through all of these moments and, and getting ready for this mission. And it feels like they're going along with us on the ride. Absolutely. And as we wait for the crew to come downstairs to the first floor, we will pause to honor today's efforts with our national anthem. Kelly Clarkson just blew us away with a fantastic rendition Wednesday. Here she is again. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what's so proud Twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watch Were so gallantly streaming I got goosebumps listening to that. I mean, it doesn't get old. We heard it Wednesday, but I, I mean, I could hear that every day of the week. 
She was blowing. Yeah, amazing. That's a live look again at Launch Complex 39A. We are awaiting astronauts Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley to walk out of the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building any minute now. So we're going to be ready to cut to that shot just as soon as we get the word that they're ready to walk out that door. Those doors, excuse me. Again, looking like a, a, it's been a beautiful start to the day here on Cape Canaveral. But we're keeping a close eye on weather because it looks a little iffy as we get later into the afternoon, closer to launch time, which again is 322 this afternoon. It always blows me away every time I visit Florida is, you know, one hour it's this beautiful, clear, gorgeous day. And then an hour later, it's a, a thunderstorm. You said it. Welcome to our world. <laughs> and then an hour later, it's back to clear. Yeah. yeah. Well, just similarly to, uh, to the last attempt, right? I mean, just right. 15, 20 minutes later. Uh, it was it was good to go. I know it just it hurt my soul because <laughs> you ha we have this instantaneous launch window. It's not like with shuttle where we could right. give it a couple more minutes because you had a 10 minute window. We have a single second to get this off the ground. So everything's got to be just right. The conditions all have to be green at that moment. Again, Mother Nature showing she's in charge. Yes. Absolutely. And we just heard we're about 30 seconds, less than 30 seconds now from seeing the crew walk out of those doors so we are standing by to show you that moment live there's a live look at the onc walkout doors you know marie i think my sts 129 patch is still over top of the door there's a bunch of patches up there unless they've removed them and put space station patches up there but but this is a very uh, solemn moment for walkout from, you know, a story legacy of uh, Apollo and seeing Apollo astronauts walk out of these doors. And now we're getting back to U.S. astronauts launching from American soil, walking through these doors again. It's an incredible moment in, in the era of space travel. And we saw some just beautiful moments uh, when they walked out on Wednesday and looking forward to, to seeing those again. I was, you know, I was perusing all of the different newspapers and stories online and just taking in all the photographs and there the doors are opening here they come Great. and there they are nasa astronauts <laughs> small crowd but big cheers nasa astronauts bob Bankin and doug hurley doug on the left bob on the right waving to the crowd there to cheer them on There are their families right in front of them. The virtual hugs, a very special moment. Fist bumps. <laughs> you can hear them. Now they are getting into the Tesla Model X that's going to take them to the launch pad, being strapped into their seats. Their suit techs are attaching their umbilicals, so uh, integrated into the Teslas. These are not just the new Tesla you can just buy off the, off the web or in a Tesla dealership. Um, they've been outfitted with cooling units, and that white umbilical, similar to what you saw in the checkout, the suit room, uh, that umbilical is being connected to the suit to provide cooling air to the astronauts while they're on the way to the pad. And those Falcon wing doors are closing. Super sleek. A rapid departure from the Astro van. <laughs> yes, I would say so. <laughs> and their uh, flight surgeon is in the front seat in the passenger side taking the journey along with them. As I mentioned last time, we always think about the technology and the rockets, but this is what it's all about. The families coming together, supporting the families, us working together as a team to ensure they get up there safely and back home safely for their families.
I couldn't hear everything they were saying, but I, I did catch Bob telling his son to, to be good for mom, and make her <laughs> life easy. <laughs> As a parent, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see that prominent mass of meatball. Now, as we watch the convoy begin their journey to Pad 39A, to our SpaceX and NASA family who over the years made this mission a reality and have, who have worked this launch campaign up to this point, we have you here in our thoughts. And we wish every one of you could be here to see this up close, but we want you to be part of this journey regardless of where you call home and regardless of where you're watching from today. And so for the next few minutes, we are going to follow the convoy, but highlight those whose words and hands and thoughts built all that we see here today. We hope all of you watching can feel the pride each of these NASA and SpaceX team members has for this drive out to the pad. This is Laura Segarra from the Commercial Crew Program. We're so excited about this historical day. Congratulations on being a part of the very first mission for human space flight, commercial human space flight ever. We're behind you, Bob and Doug. <laughs> I'm Nicole from SpaceX in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Congratulations to SpaceX for hitting another major milestone and safe travels to Bob and Doug. Bob and Doug, as the launch vehicle team in here, we've got a lot of our launch vehicle team here to wish you a very wonderful space ride on a Falcon 9. Coming up to we're so excited for you. And launch America, it's time to launch. Let's go. Hi, this is Perla from Hawthorne headquarters. We want to wish Bob and Doug a safe trip to the International Space Station. Go Dragon! in the making. This is such a historic time and our team has worked so hard and we're very excited to be here. Go Bob and Doug! Hi, this is Sam from McGregor, Texas. Go Bob and Doug, go NASA, and go SpaceX. <laughs> Sean O'Rourke from Johnson State Center. Bob and Doug wishing you a great flight. I just wanted to tell you good luck. <laughs> I'm Dustin Kamak with NASA Kennedy's Communications and Public Engagement Directorate, and we all want to wish Bob and Doug safe travels and Godspeed. You are both an inspiration to us all. Now, let's get out there and launch America. Let's do it. Come on. Launch America. Hello, everyone. This is Jessica Lynn Hoffman, and I want to wish Bob and Doug a safe and Godspeed. You are both an inspiration to us all. Now, let's get out there and launch America. Come on. Launch America. I love seeing that group of people. I mean, we saw... Um, all those different groups of folks from NASA and SpaceX, uh, from all different walks of life that have come together to make this happen. And that was just a small fraction of them. Look at that shot. That that's is so cool. cool. <laughs> wow, a little thumbs up from, I guess that's from Bob. Yeah, and you know, it took, it took a little bit of uh, creativity to get this shot to happen. Uh, we have a chase vehicle that's on the other side of the road, which is of course shut down so we could get a camera in there and follow them out. So we are uh, really thankful to Kennedy Space Center Protective Forces for helping us make that happen um, so we could see Bob and Doug all the way out to the launch pad. My ride out was a little bit different than what they're experiencing in this Tesla because we had a, you know, the Astro van had bench seats on each side and we could look across at each other as we were driving out and it was it was it was you know moments where we would tell some jokes and look but sometimes we would just look at each other and we had such gratitude for 
having this opportunity to launch into space and to think about all the people that had a hand in helping us get in that vehicle to drive out to the launch pad to get ready for this momentous moment. And I think that's probably, even though they're sitting you know, side by side, I think they're probably thinking of the gratitude and the people that have helped them get here so that they can be on the, you know, the pointy end of the rocket, getting a chance <laughs> to go up to, uh, up to space. It's just a, a momentous moment. And they're listening to some tunes too. I heard, right, Lauren? Yeah, yeah. They uh, there are at least three songs on their playlist that are, are super interesting. The first is ACDC's "Back in Black." You know that one? <laughs> yeah. Well, who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, another one that they're listening to is the elevator music from the Blues Brothers film, "The Girl from Empanima." <laughs> oh, Leland. <laughs> okay. Got another career. That's enough. Career That's number enough. three. That's enough. <laughs> NFL <laughs> astronaut musician, yep. uh, and of course they are also listening to the Star Spangled Banner, the Army French Horns version. Now we didn't have tunes in the Astro Van, no. And I know that the Tesla has a really kicking stereo system. Is that the still the custom stereo system that's in the Tesla? I haven't been in this one, so I don't know what they're rocking, but I'm sure it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> And again, for, just for some perspective, um, you know, they left the operations and checkout building just a minute ago. And so it's about a nine mile drive from there to the launch pad. It takes them around 20 minutes, kind of depends on how quickly they're trucking. The other thing sometimes that you hear as you're, you're in the convoy is the helicopter, the Huey helicopter flying overhead. And it's, it's kind of also, you know, you're thinking military, you're thinking, really important things and uh it's a it's a moment that also kind of solidifies in you that hey something big is about to happen and uh that boom, 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 the sound of that huey is is just in your head and it feels good that all these people are helping you get there safely yeah i think we heard that actually coming by this building earlier because we were talking i was like i hope that's what i think it is <laughs> and it was pretty low because it was pretty loud you could feel it too. i did i could feel it <laughs> I took this drive yesterday uh, in my rental car, and granted it wasn't in a Model X, and I'm not an astronaut, but driving to 39A, that same route, and trying to put myself, like imagine myself in that headspace, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty awesome. I had to figure out how to get on Falcon 9. Lauren, we're all, we're all astronauts. We're in space. That is true. <laughs> you just got to get on the rocket. Yeah, well, Leland, there's a there's a big group of people that want you that want you there. <laughs> I think we should, you know, listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm all for it. I think we should. Maybe we should make that a poll question. Yeah. Well, we should all maybe go to space. What do you I think? would. I am on board. I mean, not literally right now, but I would like to be on board. <laughs> Lauren, would you go with us? Absolutely. Okay. Poll question. <laughs> We have so many people uh, watching online, sending well wishes to Bob and Doug. I mean, it started early this week as we were ramping up for Wednesday, and I feel like it's just been this buildup of momentum because, you know, we, we were following along Wednesday, and now we're all following along Saturday, and, and we have people watching from home but hopefully don't have to work today um, and can, can really tune into what's going on here. And we, you know, as astronauts, truly appreciate all the support, all the social media feeds. And we think about, you know, our families. Uh, you know, we saw Megan and, um, and Karen there with their sons wishing Doug and Bob well wishes and Godspeed as they head off in these Teslas to mm -hmm. launch pad 39A that launched the Apollo astronauts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, this is just one of those moments where everyone in this country is coming together to wish them well to get them to space safely it's a really great day and they are just now on saturn causeway they just made that right turn onto saturn causeway so to the right of the screen that building is the operations and support building two and on the left it's out of view right now is the vehicle assembly building that iconic building that processed uh the space shuttle and saturn V rocket to also that's where that like mobile transporter takes out. It used to take out the Apollo Saturn V rockets mm -hmm. and the and the space shuttle. It's just an uh, incredible machine. And where they're passing right now, I mean, if we were to run outside, we could wave <laughs> uh, because we are off to the right of your screen there at the press site where you where you see uh, 
group of media there. So from this point there, they've still got about three miles to go from here. I'll see you guys later. I'll, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> you're going to go, you're gonna go hop in. <laughs> And obviously, there it's not just Bob and Doug's Tesla. There's a number of cars in that convoy. They're being escorted by Kennedy Space Center Protective Forces and also SpaceX Security. They have a flight surge in there with them. And we've seen just a sprinkle of folks along the way. Normally, we'd have a whole lot more people out here watching this, but we really appreciate you watching online and from home. Again, wherever you are, at the beach, watching on your phone, your tablet, your whatever mobile device you have. We're gonna be here every step of the journey, taking you through it moment by moment. There's a cool shot with the worm on the roof. There we go. Now, the second now. place worm, yes. <laughs> the mm -hmm. second place worm. So Leland, when I drive down this road on the way to uh, 39A, on the left, there's that area where the crawler used to, mm -hmm. used to drive. Can you tell us a little bit about the crawler? Yeah, right there you can see the, um, the the kind of the gravel where the crawler actually crushes that gravel almost into sand. It's so heavy. When the shuttle will go out and the Apollo 5, um, the Apollo Saturn 5 rocket will go out. And it's just, this thing moves at a glacial rate to get out there because it's got this huge rocket or shuttle on it. But uh, it's, I, and I had a chance to see that when my shuttle went out one day with Alan Poindexter. And it's just this an enormous, you know, tracks and vehicle and, but you guys do it in a different way, don't you? You don't, you don't go out of the vehicle assembly building. You have your own building. Yeah, we have a hangar right there on the pad. So we is, just roll the rocket up the hill. You kind of do it like a Soyuz where you just raise it up right Correct. there from horizontal yeah. to vertical and it's, it's done. Yeah. Horizontal integration, so you don't need an enormous building in order to process the rocket and mate drag into it. And then once you pin into the pad at the very top of the hill, you raise it up vertical with the transporter erector. And again, all these efficiencies to help us get people to space faster and safer. And uh, you know, this is going to be the future of space travel. And also the relationship between NASA and SpaceX working together as a team to get people up. And at this point, the convoy is approaching pad 39A, and they're entering what is known as the BDA, or Blast Danger Area. Now, before any pad technicians, engineers, or astronauts enter that area around the launch pad, the SpaceX and NASA teams do an internal go-no-go no -go poll to make sure everything is clear. This storied launch pad, which has been the beginning point for so many firsts, is the perfect backdrop for today's historic launch that marks a new first and a new era in human spaceflight. And here's a view from our gantry near the launch complex 39A. So we've got another view of the convoy going by here. If I had to count up all the cameras we have all over the place for this, it would <laughs> I'd be here all day. That's a beautiful shot right there, wow. looking at the Kennedy Space Center and Merritt Island and all of the nature around us. It's a it's a big buffer from 39A so that we can uh, be safe and launch our rockets off to space safely. Absolutely, and a lot of people don't realize this is a national wildlife refuge. I mean, I I pass turtles on the way to my car every day. Yeah. Well, when we would run from the operation, operations and checkout building, we'd have to watch out for snakes and mm -hmm. for alligators, and so yeah. to be really careful about the wildlife. We used to have one who lived at 39A. Oh, really? Yeah, an alligator. Well, well maybe we'll see him. We'll keep an eye out. <laughs> Tweet at us if you see any. Did you name him Worm? <laughs> Ooh, it's ahead of my time. <laughs> I don't know how an alligator would feel about being called worm, Leland. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got a ton of you following along on social media. Uh, Lynn says, as a fellow Missourian, we're so proud of Bob. Launch America, we will be watching from the Space Coast cheering loud. And another comment, Godspeed and good luck, Astro Bankin and Astro Doug, hashtag Launch America. There you see the, the SpaceX horizontal integration facility. It's on the left of the screen now. We saw the, the front of it uh, from the other angle. 
Or I'm sorry, no, there it is. I, I was getting my buildings mixed up, so it's on the right now. <laughs> yeah, Bigger that, building. <laughs> the other is the Falcon Support Building. It's where all of our offices are. And yes, you're correct. Thank right you there. for the correction. Laura. There's our hangar. We process Falcon Heavy in there. There are other boosters in that hangar as well. And the Rocket and Dragon that is on the pad right now was put together, or rather final, uh, finally integrated inside of that hangar and then rolled out to that pad to go up vertical. And there it is, that uh, that shot really gives you a sense of the scale of the Falcon 9 rocket. Those Teslas look teeny, teeny, tiny, <laughs> uh, making their way up there. And so as they make their way up to the pad, we're going to throw it over now to Hawthorne, where Jesse and Dan are watching the action. Hi, guys. Thanks, Marie. Yeah, really cool watching the Teslas pull up, driving on the launch pad just a few feet away from the vehicle. This is awesome and getting really excited over here. And with us looking at the launch pad right now, we've had to do a number of upgrades, but not only to the launch pad, but SpaceX has also made changes to both Falcon 9 and Dragon to enable flying crew. And a key update to this latest version of Dragon is its highly reliable launch escape system that is capable of carrying crew to safety at any point during the ascent of the rocket. Another pretty key upgrade is the Dragon's new life support system. As you can imagine, flying humans requires keeping a habitable environment throughout the entire flight, and that means covering everything like providing breathing air, keeping the capsule at a safe pressure, keeping it free of contaminants, removing any carbon dioxide in the air, regulating the temperature, the hu humidity, all of these things, and also implementing that waste collection system a.k.a. the toilet. <laughs> that sounds pretty important. <laughs> the changes to Falcon 9 were small but extremely meaningful to meet NASA's requirements for safety for human spaceflight. And specifically, SpaceX had to prove a high degree of fault tolerance, meaning that small failures in the system would not lead to mission failure. Falcon 9 was already able to hand handle engine failure, but new emphasis was put on making sure that a failure throughout any phase of launch would not mean mission failure. And this goes all the way down to latches, control valves, electronics, wiring, and so much more. All right, well, with the astronauts now on location at Pad 39A, we're going to swing it right back. Marie, Lauren, Leland, take us through the crew making their final steps towards the Dragon spacecraft. Sure thing. So we are looking again at Launch Complex 39A. Uh, just a few seconds ago, we saw the Tesla carrying Bob and Doug pull up to the launch pad. Um, this is this is the site of so much history, you guys. This is where Apollo and Saturn V rockets uh, that launched the moon uh, took astronauts from. I mean, this 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 pad has so much history. Leland, you launched from there. What's it like seeing Crew Dragon and Falcon 9 there with the pad? Uh, with with all of the visual changes that have been made, I mean, what kind of emotions does this stir up in you? You know, when we got out of, out of our Astro van, um, we stepped out and we just looked looked up to see this vehicle, and it was it was creaking, it was groaning, it was making noises, it was getting ready for us to enter it to take us off planet. And you know, you get a chance to take a picture. Sometimes you 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 stand there, you look there, you think about all the training you've done all the preparation, and again, all the people that have helped you get there. And it's just uh, a solemn, amazing moment for all of us. And there's another amazing drone shot. Lauren, you explained this a little bit earlier about kind of how how SpaceX brings the rocket and capsule vertical. Now that we see it, can you kind of explain that again for folks who maybe missed that? Yes, of course. Uh, Dragon is actually processed a few miles down the road at uh, Area 59, or Dragonland as we like to call it. We then put it on a truck and drive it all the way to the hangar where the rocket is. And so uh, what will happen is we'll then break, we call it break over, where the, the vehicle's up vertical will turn it sideways because the rocket is being processed sideways or horizontal into the hangar, lift it, mate it to Falcon 9, and then roll up those hangar doors and essentially pull the, the vehicle uh, in the transporter erector, which is the big white truss structure that you see there. Mm -hmm. All the fluid lines, electrical lines, and everything are connected to the vehicles via the TE, transporter erector. And they basically roll it up those, those rails. You can't really see them. You can kind of see them on the screen, those mm -hmm. rails. Mm -hmm. uh, roll the, the entire TE rocket dragon assembly up to the very top of the pad, pin it into the pad systems, and then roll it up vertical. 
and we are about T minus two hours, 57 minutes, 44 seconds and counting. In just a couple of minutes, we are expecting to hear a formal announcement that the crew is at the pad. Of course, we saw them pull up in the Teslas, and there they are. Uh, looks like they've already gotten out of the car, and they are walking up uh, to the elevator that will carry them all the way up to the 255 foot level and then they'll have a couple of steps to get up to uh, the level where the crew access arm is. I have the ACDC song in my head as I see them walking up. <laughs> you know what I was I was kind of uh, jamming out to on my way in was uh, ZZ Top, Sharp Dressed Man. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know, that might be on my playlist if I were in there. But there they are, taking, taking in the site, um, craning to see the top of the Falcon 9 rocket. It's uh, 230 feet tall if you round up, and then Crew Dragon is another 27 feet from the bottom of the trunk to the top of the nose cone. So, um, if you're when you're out there in person, it's 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 really hard to describe just how how large it is. Look at them getting excited. They're uh, they're ready to get in the vehicle, <laughs> get in the elevator, and uh, make it to the top. There's some fod he's picking up, foreign object debris. Appreciate that. <laughs> They're also wearing fod covers on their shoes, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, we want to make sure that they don't, you know, track the outside inside of Dragon when they go in. And so right before they enter the vehicle, they'll remove the fod, the fod covers off of their boots. You take for granted, you know, all just the little details like that, all of the thought and preparation that has mm -hmm. to go into literally every single piece of this operation. I love the makeover of Path 39A with the sleek black with the white ticking and the lines and it's a, it's a very futuristic look for this iconic um, launch pad and to think what's been there before with Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, uh, Shuttle and now the SpaceX Crew Dragon getting ready for a launch to the International Space Station. Rocket fuel still going through my veins. <laughs> And we feel so honored to be able to launch from here. Oh, here they are. That's a really fast elevator. Yeah. <laughs> I know it really zips. That took them up to 255 feet in just a matter of seconds. They were moving their, their fog covers. Uh, it looks like they were just maybe checking something on his, on his boot or leg. And we should hear a call any moment that the crew has arrived at the pad as they make their way up the stairs and they're headed to the crew access arm now. There's the worm again. Popping. You know it. Meatball. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, there's a meatball on Crew Dragon. <laughs> Those white arrows you see there are essentially illuminating the way for anyone who's up there to find their way to the escape baskets in the event of an emergency that would require them to get far away from the rocket and the pad. And it's hard to tell from this angle, but there's actually a phone right here, and I can't tell if it's Bob or Doug that's using the phone right now, but Leland, can you explain the significance of that? It's the same phone that was there during the shuttle days. Yeah, it's a, you get a chance to talk to maybe friends or family that you haven't had a, maybe couldn't come to the launch. In this case, it's quite a few people, but um, just to have that last moment to talk to someone before you get in the vehicle. It's a beautiful view. And, when, and we're watching the crew. Uh, when they're done using the phone there, we expect them to be making their way into the crew access arm. Um, and coming up at about T minus two hours and 35 minutes, the astronauts will ingress, or that's a word we use to describe climbing into Crew Dragon. And we saw Doug do it a couple minutes early on Wednesday. They were a little bit ahead of schedule, so that, that time could be a little bit flexible. But that's going to happen with the assistance of the suit techs, and they will get strapped into their seats. And so with that coming up, we're going to head over to Hawthorne for a preview of what's in store for the future in space travel. Jesse? Thanks, Marie. 
Yeah, shortly after we begin to regularly fly NASA astronauts to and from the space station, SpaceX will also begin flying private passengers to station and beyond using Dragon. That's right. NASA is enabling up to two private astronaut missions to visit the station each year, just as part of our support of economy and low Earth orbit. It's one of the many ways NASA is working to just open up access to outer space for companies to manufacture products in microgravity, for any new commercial modules in space, and really just to enable more people to be able to explore the stars firsthand. And the more people out there exploring the stars, the closer we become to becoming a multiplanetary species. Earlier, we showed you a first-hand look of where you would train if you were to fly with us on board Dragon. But now, let's take a peek inside of the spacecraft itself. intuitive to know what we need to do at any given moment in time. When I think about comfort for the astronauts, it's, it's really every aspect of how you could interact with the spaceship that comes to mind. We have three different seat sizes. We even go so far as molding the foam around the astronaut's body so that there's not any pressure points and it's just generally a pleasurable journey to space. Dragon is a spaceship that's all about safety and reliability. We designed it to be too fault tolerant, which means that any two things could fail. So I could lose a flight computer and a thruster, and I could still bring the crew back home safely. We also added a launch escape system. If anything goes wrong on ascent, the, the crew can get away from Falcon and get picked up safely. I've worked on Dragon since, since 2012. When I see Dragon lift off, I think I'm going to feel a buildup of emotion of eight years of working with some of the best engineers and technicians across the country that, that put their heart and mind into making this incredible moment happen for, for everybody. All right, so that was a detailed look inside Dragon. Here's a live look at two astronauts about to climb right in. If you're just now tuning in, you're watching our coverage of the mission known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. Two days, SpaceX and NASA are going to be sending people into orbit on a mission to the International Space Station from U.S. soil for the first time since 2011. Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley are the NASA astronauts flying today, and you can see them right there on screen. They are just right next to their ride up to space. Yeah, very exciting. So as you can see, they have already arrived uh, at pad 39A, where Falcon 9 will lift off from at 3.22 p.m. Eastern time today. They have ascended the tall structure already, which is next to the rocket, and it's called the fixed service structure, and also have already walked down the corridor, which is known as the crew arm, which is what they're standing in right now. That's right. And as they prepare to board Dragon, they have this one final stop that they're standing in right now, and that's the white room. The white room is literally just the room at the end of the crew arm that has an opening into Dragon. It is the last place on planet Earth Bob and Doug are going to be standing before they step into Dragon for their ride to the International Space Station. And the term the White Room was first used during NASA Gemini missions, where the room right before entering the spaceship was painted white. And as you can see, we've continued this tradition with painting ours white as well. And on Wednesday, they actually started a new tradition by signing the wall in the White Room. It's a fairly small area that has room for the crew and a few ground support members to complete cargo load at T minus 24 hours and crew ingress at T minus two hours and 35 minutes, which is coming up here shortly. And ingress is how we refer to the crew boarding Dragon. 
Also inside the white room is a movable platform that just gets extended out to the capsule just to make that boarding process much smoother for the crew to climb into Dragon. As you might expect, it's also environmentally controlled. You can see kind of a big seal right up against the, the side hatch, and that's just done so Dragon can be open while keeping all the dust, dirt, and the Florida humidity out of the capsule, making sure it's pristine for the crew. And so that seal's going to stay in place until they begin to retract it, get the arm ready to move out of the way, and by that point, the hatch will already be closed. And the white room also has lots of tools in order to open the side hatch, complete crew ingress, and prepare for any contingencies or emergency that may be encountered. And right now they're just in the white room. They're getting a final briefing. You can see them with a number of different pad technicians. Everybody on that team has a specific job. Some are suit specialists who are going to help Bob and Doug get connected to their seats. Some are specialists with the Dragon capsule itself and are going to be responsible for closing the hatch. And we also typically have a photographer in there just to help kind of capture these moments as the crew gets ready. So right now we're, we're watching and we can see them start to line up there. We'll see Bob or Doug Hurley go in first. And so he'll be the first one through the capsule and he's going to be ingressing. That's just our spaceflight term for entering. You're going to hear a lot of these terms throughout the next couple of days as they make their way up to orbit, ingress getting in, egress coming out. And they're also doing that final FOD check, making sure that the crew don't have any foreign object debris, dust, dirt, anything that could interfere with the systems on Dragon just before they get in. Right, as Leland and Lauren were mentioning earlier, they do have um, stuff on their suits to protect from FOD. Um, and they have FOD covers on their boots, as they mentioned, as well as on their umbilical port on their suits. Um, and that's, Corn, that one. needs to be X removed two before hours they can ingress. Minutes. The crew so has arrived at the like room and its ingress is that. in progress on schedule. Just listening into the nets and hearing those updates live. Yes, once the FOD check is complete, uh, they can enter, which is happening live on your screen right now. And as they climb into Dragon, they will buckle themselves in and attach their umbilicals to their suits. And as you can see, the suit techs are there to help them get buckled and settled into those seats. And as we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, the suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. So the suits help keep them cool as well as delivers nitrox um, in case there is a suit depressurization. As we go through this, we saw Doug Hurley go in first. He's the commander for this mission. He's closest to your screen. And then Bob Bankin's just next to him, and they're going to get some assistance from these suit techs as they get in. There are four seats inside of Dragon for these missions, and they are numbered one through four. If you're looking from the perspective of the suit techs inside the hatch, going from right to left. So Doug Hurley is in seat two. That's the commander seat. And Bob Bankin is in seat three, which for Crew Dragon's the pilot seat. And obviously we don't have anybody in seats one or four today. Crew Dragon is designed to carry four astronauts, though, on future NASA missions, and we'll see that on Crew 1, which will have three NASA astronauts and one from our partner agency, JAXA. And then directly above the crew right now, but right in front of them once their seats get rotated, are the three displays that they'll use throughout the flight. And that just gives them insight into all of Dragon's systems. It allows them to take control of the vehicle and manually fly it, which we'll see them do hopefully only twice during two manual flight tests. As again, Dragon's autonomous, but they can jump in and take over if they need to. And as Dan mentioned, the displays are above them right now, but those seats will rotate back for launch position so that they can easily access those displays. So coming up next, the crew will do a comm check once they're all settled in, uh, and that's so that they can check to make sure that they can hear mission control, and then after that, their seats will be rotated into position. So let's check in with John Insprucker for the latest on the health of both of those vehicles. John, what's, what's the status update today? We're at T-minus two hours, 43 minutes, and counting down for the launch of Falcon 9 with Dragon to the space station. As you see, the Dragon launch pad team has obviously arrived at the pad. They got there shortly after T-minus four hours, opened up the side hatch on Dragon, got ready for the arrival of the astronauts, 
We saw the crew uh, come up the elevators, walk over and enter Dragon, and they're now getting situated inside the capsule. Now the flight team is monitoring data from Dragon. They most recently have completed a command and telemetry check of the radio frequency system on Dragon through the tracking and data relay satellite network. That looked to go well. There are no issues in work as we watch the astronauts getting situated in their seats inside the Dragon spacecraft. The Falcon 9 team is preparing for final checkouts and propellant load. Those checkouts are due to begin at T minus two hours, some 42 minutes from now, when the launch crew officially gets on console in the firing room. All systems on Falcon 9 are currently go. The range continues to be green on the uh, support side. The areas around the pad obviously clear except for the uh, folks doing the entry into the capsule. Uh, air and sea space are clear. We hear helicopter go by from time to time. The big concern is weather forecast. Uh, we are continuing right now at a 50% probability of violation of the weather constraints. The big concerns are going to be the thick clouds, precipitation, possibility of lightning. I mentioned earlier, normally you get a strong sea breeze from the ocean that pushes inland and keeps the clouds from central Florida from building up. But today the sea breeze is fairly weak, so we expect the, the thunderstorms will get closer to the launch pad. We're also checking downrange conditions. If there's a contingency splashdown of Dragon, uh, we're looking at uh, essentially the wave heights, uh, lightning, rain along the trajectory. Right now it's marginal, but it is still go. We do expect that to improve slightly during the day. So fingers crossed there that the downrange weather looks good. But right now at T minus two hours, 41 minutes, as the clock continues to count down, all systems are go for launch. All right, thanks, John I. And as we watch Bob and Doug get buckled into their seats, I'm joined once again by SpaceX's Jessica Jensen, just to kind of walk through everybody what made Dragon a 21st century spacecraft. So first off, thanks for coming in today. I know you got to come in for a launch. That's always tough. Of course. We want, walk us through again kind of Dragon's life history. I mean, we have one in a clean room pretty soon right behind us. Walk us how we got to where we are today to have Bob and Doug climbing into that spacecraft. Sure, so SpaceX was founded to make life multi-planetary. That was why Elon started the company back in 2002. And, but you know, also when he founded the company, we were a very small company for several years. And so we had to look for opportunities to, you know, hey, how do you go from being a small company to actually putting people into orbit? So when NASA came out with the need to fly cargo to and from the International Space Station, we jumped on that because we said, hey, first, not only is carrying cargo to and from the space station cool, I bet we could actually then fly people to the International Space Station. And hey, for eight years now, we've been flying cargo. Yeah. And then now we are have transitioned over into flying crew and cargo together. So that's basically been the evolution of Dragon and it's been awesome. And I know when we see Falcon 9, we get to talk a lot about reusability. Everyone is very familiar with the, the first stage coming back down and yep. how cool that looks. Dragon is also designed with some reusability. In fact, you've flown Dragon multiple times or you've flown Dragons multiple times to the space station. How does reusability factor into Dragon's life cycle? Yeah, so I'll actually talk a little bit about both because I one thing I think everyone always thinks about reusability and hey, it saves money or that's great, but reusability actually improves your reliability. So when we get Falcons back and when we get Dragons back, either after one mission or multiple mission, we can do all these detailed inspections on them. And that's super important because when you fly a vehicle, you can only have so many sensors on it. You can't put a sensor, you know, every single inch of a rocket or a spacecraft. And there's already way more than I think anybody realizes. Exactly. But so, you know, especially for rockets that wind up in the ocean, some people don't have any idea of what they actually went through. So the fact that we get all the hardware back, we were able to inspect literally every square inch of it and make small design changes that actually improve reliability for the whole fleet. So even though Bob and Doug are on a brand new rocket and a brand new spacecraft, that those spacecraft are actually more reliable based on the knowledge we've learned from reusability. We've walked people through a lot of the new systems on Dragon. What are just some of the cool things that are maybe beneath the surface that people don't know about with Dragon? 
So I think one of the coolest things is the autonomous docking system. And what that is, is it's basically we have, you know, GPS sensors on Dragon, but then we also have cameras and um, imaging sensors such as a LIDAR on basically the nose cone or the front part of Dragon as it's approaching the space station. And all these sensors are feeding data back to our flight computer to say, hey, how far away am I from the space station? What's my relative velocity to the space station? And then that feeds into the flight computer, which has algorithms writ by, written by our engineers to say, okay, based on how far away you are in your rates, here's how you fire the thrusters to most effectively get to the docking target. Um, and I think that's just super cool. Well, I mean, we're all waiting for our cars to drive ourselves to work. And for Bob and Doug, that's exactly what it's doing for them. Exactly. And what I think is so cool is the computer does this just like flawlessly. It's easy. When I tried to do it, I failed miserably. I tried to dock Dragon to the ISS three times and I failed. SpaceX Fourth Dragon. time I got it. Good morning. Um, We're ready and I will tell the public out there that on our website, we actually have morning, a Dragon uh, ISS simulator. So you yourself can try and fire the thrusters and see how well you do. Maybe I'm just a bad driver but I think the flight computer does a really good job. I think we all had fun with it. All right, well, we are just starting to hear. They're going to start up those comm checks with Bob and Doug. CDR, PLT, comm check. So let's call. listen in. CDR, loud and clear. PLT, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Umbilical comm check complete. Stand by for a ground station comm check. And again, we're just listening in. They're doing these comm checks, these communication checks. So Bob and Doug are going to do a series of these checkouts with the teams on the ground, both the core here in Hawthorne and the launch director out in Florida. And they're going to be doing this over Dragon to Ground. Uh, and they're also going to be doing it over the Countdown Net. Those are the two main loops or nets that you're going to hear going out. And they're going to be doing it through their different communications paths. We heard them do through the... Uh, TDRS or the tracking data and relay satellites. Those are those primary satellites that were going to be used to talk to Bob and Doug throughout their flight and to send commands to Dragon. They'll also do it through ground stations. SpaceX has a worldwide network of ground net uh, worldwide network of ground stations that they're able to communicate with the vehicle, and that's what we'll be using to get video inside the cabin of Bob and Doug on their flight up. So if you tuned in the other day, this is one of the first things that they do once they get inside the vehicle. And this is just to make sure all the communication systems with the Dragon spacecraft, with the suits, everything are working. They're able to talk to and hear everybody on the ground. Dragon, SpaceX, Comchat, ground stations. SpaceX, Dragon, loud and clear. Core loud and clear, ground station comm check complete. Stand by for TJ's comm check. And just a reminder, you're hearing the core. That's the crew operations responsible engineer. That's if you've followed NASA missions in the past, that's the CAPCOM position. That is this pretty much the singular voice that's talking to the astronauts throughout their flight. And that's a position based here in Hawthorne, California. And you'll also hear Dragon, SpaceX, ComCheck, Tetris. SpaceX Dragon, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Tejas comm check complete. Stand by with comm checks with MD and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, MD on countdown one. Comm check. SpaceX, uh, Jason, loud and clear. Copy, loud and clear. Glad to have you guys on board. Uh, stand by for comm check on Dragon Aground. Dragon, MD, Dragon Aground, comm check. MD, Dragon, loud and clear. MD, loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, launch director on countdown one, comm check. 
Good afternoon, Mike. Loud and clear. I have you the same, and good afternoon. Stand by for my comp check on Dragon to Ground. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to Ground, comp check. SpaceX Dragon, loud and clear. I have you the same. Back to core. And Dragon SpaceX, this, this concludes our launch configuration comm checks. Report when ready for seat rotation for Section 2 of 4.100. Dragon will put that in work. Copy. All right, so all those communications checks were done successfully, and you could even see, and it's so cool when we get these views right inside the cabin. SpaceX Dragon in 2.2, two, we are ready for seat rotation. Copy. We will report when initiating. But you can see Doug Hurley using his right hand. He has the talk button built into the seat itself. So just, again, showing you all of the different systems, how the suit is integrated into the seat, and it's all just one big circle for this whole spacecraft. So really cool to see those comp checks live. Um, Jessica, thank you so much for walking us through some of the really cool updates, the upgrades. Did you have any other cool stuff besides? Let's see. So... I don't know if you guys can see, but we have the Dragon clean room here. And one of the coolest things is it is right on the main floor of our main building. So thousands of employees walk by here all the time and get to see Dragon in its final processing before it goes to the Cape. On Wednesday, the Crew-1 capsule was in here. It looked almost done. It looks a little empty right now, but that's because that capsule went off into our separate test facility for its final propulsion checks. So we do leak checks and things there, and we do that in a separate facility just because it's high pressure testing. Um, and then the vehicle will come back here, get its final thermal protection system put on, and then it will ship off to Cape Canaveral and get ready to launch four astronauts to the International Space Station. I mean, what's, what's it like to see it? Because when you see the first initial pressure vessel, it looks nothing like the final thing. So yeah. what's it like to just kind of watch it go through and you just see little bits get added on, added on, and then the next thing you know, it's a whole spacecraft. Yeah, I mean, that's what's... That's what's so amazing. I'm so impressed. You know, when you look at a machine, you're like, how does this ever get built? How do people ever do this? And it really is just step by step, one piece at a time. Each piece has its critical function, and you get to watch that being built right in front of your eyes every day when you Dragon, come to work. Dragon, SpaceX, as we are ready to initiate seat rotation. Dragon right. copies. And we just heard the seat rotations about to begin. So, Jessica, thank you so much. Cool facts about Dragon for everyone to listen in on and we can see the seats start to rotate now pretty soon bob and doug will be in their launch configuration and they'll be ready to go and we can see the seats slowly start to rotate again they're in this down position just to make it easier to climb in and out of dragon they'll rotate to this launch position to put their backs a little bit more parallel to the ground it, makes taking the g-force a little bit easier for the crew on the way uphill but most importantly positions those touch screens directly in front of them which is just their gateway into dragon dragon spacex seats here in the launch position we copy all right in confirmation the seats are in the launch position let's go down now to gary in mission control houston where i know the entire jsc team is standing by and ready to see dragon take flight today over to you gary Thanks, Dan. Very much so. Great to see good comm checks from Bob and Doug and that their seats have been rotated into their uh, launch position. Here in Houston, Flight Director Zeb Scoville has pulled space station flight controllers, and all systems are go for launch from the space station side of things. Essentially, the station is prepared for Dragon to arrive 19 hour, hours after launch. Chris Cassidy has completed his preparations uh, for Bob and Doug to arrive. He's got a chance to view some of the broadcasts. It even said they were, quote, looking sharp. Flight controllers here will monitor the countdown, but really it's up to the teams in Kennedy and Hawthorne to get us to lift off at this point. So we want to hear your comments as we continue to count down to launch. So let's go to the social desk now. Tahira. Thanks, Gary. So glad to hear that polls are go, at least on your end, and just hoping this weather just 
works out good for today's launch. I mean, people online are on the edge of their seats. We just checked numbers and we are up to 1.1 million viewers right now. That's almost double when we checked last time. And right now we also have Columbia, South Carolina is leading the viewership. So interesting to see how that changes. Let's take a broader look at the conversation online with this heat map of the United States. Now this shows Launch America mentions by state over the past week, and we have California leading right now with the most mentions. And I'm very surprised. I really thought the Space Coast would take it home, but let's see how this changes over the course of the broadcast. And with that, let's see what y'all are posting online right now. Guys, I mean, check out these outfits. Absolutely love it. Um, love to just see how people are making things creative for this launch and really making it their own, putting their personal touch on it. Let's take a look at another. Oh, we are back to the Launch America heat mentions. So let's see how that changes over the course of this broadcast. But really fun to see those photos online. Oh, we have another space pet, guys. These do not get old, so please use hashtag Launch America on social media. Right now, it looks like we have Catstronaut Boris, who is ready for his launch in the Crew Dragon capsule. I just, I love seeing the pet owners unite for this mission. So like I said, definitely use that hashtag. We will be looking for it during the show. Marie, what's the latest at Kennedy? Thanks to Hero, we are at T minus two hours, 26 minutes, 47 seconds and counting from liftoff of the Falcon 9 from the Kennedy Space Center here in Florida, carrying NASA astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin. You see them right now aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft. It's been a very exciting day so far. The crew has been up since about 8 o'clock this morning as they prepare to head to the International Space Station as part of this Demo 2 mission for NASA. And as we speak, the astronauts, as you saw, are inside Dragon and, are, and have completed their comm checks. So now they can communicate with the teams here on the ground. And their seats have rotated upright uh, to their reclined launch positions, allowing them to see and access the display panel. And now they are about to they initiate their, their own suit leak checks to make sure that their seat is in proper working condition before liftoff. And in just a little bit, at about T minus one hour, 55 minutes, it could happen a little bit sooner, though. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, we will see the closeout team begin to close the side hatch in preparation for flight. And that's going to be one of the key visual milestones on the timeline to lift off. Now, we want to take you to a couple of special guests we have joining us. They are with Daryl Nail at the OSB2 viewing location, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, and... Also, Kennedy Space Center Director Bob Cabana is there with Daryl. Hi, Daryl. Hi, Marie. That's right. We're in the uh, fifth floor of the Operations and Support Building here at the Kennedy Space Center with a nice view of Launch Complex 39. And the two men that you mentioned are here to join me to answer a few questions. We're excited to have them both here. And they are, of course, Bob Cabana, the director of the Kennedy Space Center, and Jim Bridenstine, administrator for NASA. Gentlemen, thanks again for making the time to be here. Uh, of course, the big story right now, Jim, is the weather. So let's talk a little bit about that. We, we can see there's some clouds building. That was forecast. You took part uh, in a weather briefing this morning. Uh, what do you know about the weather and, and, and the decision that was made to say, hey, let's, let's give this another shot today? Yeah, so what got us last time was the electricity in the atmosphere. And of course, today there are, in fact, buildups. It doesn't look like there are thunderstorms at this time, but they are expected. Um, the question is, when do those thunderstorms go away? And when those thunderstorms materialize, where are they located? Um, we are predicting about a 50-50 uh, shot uh, of going this time. Um, but given the fact that we are in late May in Florida, um, <laughs> we have to take every shot we can get. So. Um, it's not likely that uh, in, in a couple of days it's going to be any better than it is today. So we're, we're, we are a go for launch right now, um, and we are hoping that the weather will hold up. We almost made it on Wednesday, um, and the trend is better today than it was on Wednesday. So we'll see. And I saw a forecast that said the clearing is supposed to happen right around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So That's right. So we're hoping that that Launch is uh, at 322, right. clearing you know, at the earliest 3 o'clock, at the latest 330. So depending on when that happens... Uh, we'll, we'll either be go or no go, but um, again, uh, we're going to take every shot we've got. Also watching the downrange weather for 
a That's potential right. rescue in case there were an abort. That's right. So, you know, we have these staging areas. When we go from the first stage to the second stage, that's a higher risk evolution. We want to make sure that in the case we have to exercise the launch abort at that point, that the weather is good. And, of course, that's off the coast of, of North Carolina. The big thing there is it's great that we have a launch abort capability. The challenge is that launch abort capability includes parachutes. And with parachutes, you've got to make sure that you've got the weather to come down. If there are thunderstorms or downbursts or high winds, uh, that's problematic for the parachute system. Right, and sea states as well, bouncing that exactly. capsule around in the ocean. Uh, Bob, of course, you're an astronaut. Uh, you know what it's like to hit the reset button and do it all over again. Get into the spacecraft, get ready to go, only to be told, no, we're not going to go today, we're going to try it again. What, what's that like? And then, and then tell me about the mindset as you have to kind of reset. Is there, do you feel less anxious? You, do you feel more comfortable the second time around? You know, Daryl, uh, first off, my last flight, we counted down to 18 seconds and didn't go, man, and when you get to 18 seconds, you're ready. Yeah. The key is, you know, it's the training that we go through, all the repetition that we do. We practice everything, including scrubs. And uh, just because you uh, didn't launch doesn't mean you don't have something to do. So you got to go through those back out procedures. It's all done very professionally. Then it was out of the vehicle and into the Astro van, back to crew quarters. And it, we had a positive attitude. We got a good night's rest and we went through it again. It's just, it's a matter of doing your job, and these guys are well prepared. You know, it's all part of uh, what we do. Yeah, they, they stopped the count at 17 minutes, but you had it all the way up just a few seconds. It's a big difference. And, and the truth is, the next night, actually, everything went really better. You know, the weather was bad the first time. I was kind of glad we scrubbed, and we scrubbed for a, an issue with the vehicle that they later sorted out. As it turned out, we wouldn't have had enough prop to rendezvous with the, the Russian car functional cargo block, but you know, the next night, it was just a, a perfectly smooth launch count. Everything just went like clockwork, and uh, it set the stage for an awesome mission. I think you told the press before you walked out, uh, I think you were over there at astronaut crew quarters, we're going today. <laughs> I, I'm wondering uh, where's the source of that confidence coming from? I, I just got a feeling, you know, you got to have a positive yeah. attitude. I, you know, I, I watched a lot of weather down here uh, supporting shuttle missions, and I'm hoping that those clouds over the I-95 corridor that the Indian River keeps them west of, uh, west of us and that stuff that's building offshore is far enough off that we can stay, stay in an open window here at the Cape. Good. Well, we got your positive vibe going and we appreciate that. Um, Jim, when you were uh, down in the astronaut uh, crew quarters and uh, when they were suiting up, you got a second chance to visit with the astronauts. Kind of tell us about that and, and what was their demeanor, what was their mood today? So uh, again, they seem loose. They were loose last time, they're loose this time. They're definitely ready to go. They're excited. Um, they've been wanting to go for a long time now. Um, you know, what was, I'll tell you one thing that I thought was a little interesting is, um, you know, Bob Bankin was making fun of Doug Hurley because on, on Doug's last flight, um, they scrubbed five times before launching on the sixth time. So Bob Bankin seems to think that Doug Hurley is the problem in this, <laughs> in this case. But to see them joking about that as they're getting suited up, ready to go, um, yes, they're, 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 they're trained, they're ready, but they're also loose. Um, and that's good to see because, um, because they're going to have to be on their game when, when we launch. These guys are, are, are pretty impressive, um, Doug Hurley and Bob Binken. I mean, Doug Hurley, an incredible pilot. Uh, Bob Binken, he, he's got a, a, a Ph.D. in mechanical engineering. And he's a flight test engineer himself right. in the Air Force. Yeah. Well, in, your, in your assessment, why are these guys the right stuff? Well, this is a test flight, um, and, and you know we got we have great astronauts that are you know chemists. We have great astronauts that um, are botanists. We have really talented and diverse, a very very diverse astronaut corps in general. But this is a test flight, and for a test flight, what do you want? You want test pilots. You want people that um, for a living they have made a living flying new things that have never been flown before. And um, you know Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley are the the, the two people that you would want. Um, in a test flight, and that's exactly what this is. Bob, you're a pilot too. You want to weigh in on Doug Hurley. He seems like, uh, you know, he's, he's got the right mentality hey, what and can smooth I say? customer. He's a naval aviator, a marine pilot, a test pilot. Uh, he's all, I'm all in. He's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and tell me a little bit about, um, in terms of the Kennedy Space Center, right? So uh, you've been here since 2007, right? 2008. 2008, sorry, yeah. off by one year. 2011, the Atlantis came to a wheel stop. Um, yeah, I grew up here. Uh, my dad worked for NASA. My uncle was a contractor. When that wheel stop happened, the next day, 
my uncle got the layoff notice, right? Yeah. And it, 30, 60 days. It was depressing. We're it, talking about thousands of people laid off. Super depressing. Atlantis landed on a Thursday. On Friday, 2,000 contractors got pink slips and walked out the door. Mm -hmm. Yet they worked on that vehicle. That was the best vehicle we ever flew, the cleanest. That's the dedication of the workforce here. Right. So and take me back to that time. You, you called it a depressing time. Um, you know, the fact that the shuttle program was something that the government completely uh, had ownership of and paid for. Now we're moving into this commercial crew, which you've overseen making that transition. And tell me about that nine years in, in which we made that move. Well, obviously, everybody was really attached to the shuttle. I mean, it was our history for 30 years. It did an awesome job. The Hubble Space Telescope, all the satellites it deployed, building the International Space Station. But um, when I first got here, I told everybody, the shuttle program's going to end. We got we have to start preparing for our future. And, and nobody wanted that to hear that. But how many times in your life do you get to define what you want your future to be? And we set out on this bold goal of trying to turn KSC into a multi-user spaceport, supporting both government and commercial operations. And uh, I've got a very persistent team. They worked extremely hard. And through a number of agreements, you know, we were able to make it happen. And this is the future. Commercial spaceflight, you know, the administrator says it all the time. We want to establish uh, a commercial environment in low Earth orbit so that we can focus on the hard job of exploring beyond our home planet, to establish that presence in our solar system beyond planet Earth, establish a sustained presence on the moon, get to Mars, establish a presence there. We can't do that if we're locked here in low Earth orbit. And commercial crew with both SpaceX and Boeing, that's the beginning of a whole new era of spaceflight. All right, very good. Um, quick question, we've got, of course, a special guest coming uh, back today. The President of the United States plans on being here. Um, Jim, you took him around the first time around. How did that go? I, I think I saw a picture on Twitter. He signed some space hardware. That's right, so, uh, so he took a look at the Orion crew capsule of course, uh, the Orion for Artemis One is ready to go, um, and he signed, uh, you know, a piece of hardware that will fly on the crew capsule for Artemis Two. Um, so that's kind of, in, and not just him, but the, the first lady and the vice president and the second lady, they all signed it. So, um, so their names are going to fly around the moon on Artemis Two, which is exciting. But I just want to give uh, Colonel Cabana a compliment here because he did bring this spaceport through a very difficult time. And now it is a, a multi-use spaceport, and we do have commercial, and we have, in fact, even international launches here, and now we're going to have commercial crew launches. Uh, Bob has done a wonderful job transforming this spaceport. That's why we're doing commercial crew. NASA wants to be one customer of many customers. We, we want to have numerous providers that are competing on cost, innovation, safety, driving down costs, increasing access, but even better today, uh, when I took this job just uh, a few short years ago, you know, our budget at NASA was around $19 billion. The budget request that President Trump gave us for next year is $25 billion. We are in a great, great position because the President is committed to space exploration. Of course, he's committed to the Space Force. We haven't had this much support for space since John F. Kennedy, and we've got bipartisan support. Everybody wants to see the Artemis program be successful. Everybody wants to see not just the next man, but the first woman on the moon, and that's what we're building here. Yeah, that's key to, the, key to it all is that bipartisan support. And, of course, um, what the work that Bob's been doing here, you can see the commercial activity all around this place. Um, we're going to get to some questions on social media real quick that uh, our, uh, you know, our audience wants to find out. So the first question is from James on Twitter, and he asks... What is the hardest part of going to space? And we're going to have to give that question to Bob. Well, Daryl, you know, nothing's hard if you prepare for it. And uh, what we are afraid of is, a, is stuff we don't have knowledge about. And that's what we do when we learn how to be astronauts. We train, okay? You spend a long time as an astronaut candidate learning. You spend a long time preparing for a mission, for an International Space Station mission, training around the world on all the different uh, modules and everything. You know, it's like two and a half years of training before you get on orbit for that uh, time to actually do your work. So I'd have to say the hardest part is the preparation for it. But you are so prepared when you go. You just have total confidence. You know that you are very well trained for what you're going to do. You have an outstanding team on the ground supporting you. And that is so important to have that ground support as you uh, climb into that vehicle. You know that they've done their very best to ensure your safety and, uh, and a successful mission. But uh, after that, it's a piece of cake, except no simulator on Earth can 
prepare you for what those guys are going to feel. It's better than a cat shot off an I, aircraft I, carrier. I believe it. Maybe one day I'll get to try. The commercialization effort means we want everybody to be able to fly into space. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's a great point about preparation because that's not the highly visible part. The launch is, and so it's good to know that uh, all that preparation leads to that confidence. Um, by the way, just an update uh, operationally, they're uh, getting ready to close the hatch door. You can see uh, on your screen there the, uh, the workers there are uh, getting ready to get that closed and uh, working, on, uh, working on that right there with uh, Doug, uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Binkin on the inside of Crew Dragon. Our next question is from Mathis on Twitter, and he asks, what kind of operations will the astronauts do between the liftoff and docking with the International Space Station? I know you pay a lot of attention, Jim, to the operations, uh, especially of this mission. You bet. Uh, what do you know about that? So there's a number of things. The first thing that they have to do is, of course, we've got a number of burns to get in phase with the International Space Station. We've got um, some boost burns as well. We're talking about you know, operating the rocket engine to, to get in alignment with the space station. But I, I'll tell you, the biggest thing that we need the astronauts to do once they get on orbit and before they dock is rest. We need them to eat, we need them to rest, we need them to be prepared for that docking. Uh, once they are in the range of the International Space Station, um, they're going to start maneuvering the spacecraft themselves. Not automatic, but they're going to do it themselves. They are, in fact, test pilots. And as test pilots, they will test fly this vehicle to make sure that it operates as advertised. And, of course, then they will dock with the International Space Station. And a unique capability here is it's automatic rendezvous and automatic docking. And so um, we're going to be able to see that for the first time as well. That's going to be exciting to see. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Jim Bridenstine, Administrator of NASA, Bob Cabana, Director of the Kennedy Space Center, thank you both for joining us. And we're going to send it back to Marie in the studio. All right, thanks a lot, Daryl and Mr. Bridenstine and Mr. Cabana for joining us. Um, you can see some clouds starting to gather over Launch Complex 39A. We're keeping a close eye on weather. Again, 50 50 percent chance of launching today. We just got to see what the weather's going to do. Um, a little bit ago, we heard the crew complete uh, their comm checks live on the air. We saw their seats rotate. That helps get them into a little bit more comfortable position for the G forces during launch. And more importantly, it helps them be in a better position um, to interact with the screen in front of them. They completed their suit leak checks. Um, we saw during the interview just a few minutes ago the hatch uh, begin to close and so inside the white room there the pad closeout team is in there um, still doing some work that that hatch closes you know it's not as simple as just closing a car door there's a process um, to seal it and check it and make sure that uh, everything is sealed properly right Lauren yeah that's correct <clears throat> if they haven't already started uh, one thing that will be coming up next is the leak check. Uh, what they'll do is they'll attach a, uh, a piece of ground support equipment. They don't have it in their hands right now, so um, it looks like it hasn't started yet. Ah, oh, there it is. You can see it there. Uh, the uh, closeout member number five, it's already attached to the side hatch mechanism. And what they'll do is um, they're essentially checking for the leak rate. And uh, they'll hold pressure there for a few minutes and then track that change in pressure over time to make sure that it's within bounds, making sure that you don't have any issues with those O-rings there that are holding that pressure. And so once they complete that leak check, they will then do what is the uh, called the installation of, or the final installation of the SPEP, or side pressure equalization plug. That's basically a, a plug that um, once the capsule splashes down, what you'll do is um, actually remove that, and what it does is equalizes pressure across the hatch. So once that thing is plugged in, you know that everything is, is super tight and that you shouldn't have any leaks on orbit. One of the other things that I think is pretty cool about Dragon, you can kind of see them uh, on the edges there are some of the windows. And I know that Dragon started out as cargo. It was cargo Dragon. You have your cargo version, and before you moved on to the crew Dragon version, but you even had windows on the cargo version. Can you t explain kind of why that was? Yeah, the very first cargo Dragon that we ever had, that we ever launched, um, had a window over the hatch, over the side hatch. And the reason we did that is we always envisioned Dragon to ultimately be a crewed vehicle. So even in the beginning for the first, the very first vehicle we ever made, which carried, didn't even really carry much cargo, um, 
we put that window there and it to us symbolizes what Dragon's purpose has been all along, you know, the, taking those steps, starting off with the, uh, the CRS program and resupplying the, the space station with, with experiments and, and food and crew provisions uh, for the astronauts on board to now putting our own astronaut, or putting NASA's astronauts in our own vehicle. Um, it's that natural progression to what we were aiming for the whole time. Mm -hmm. And Leland, what's your take on the touchscreen technology? We saw a little bit about that, obviously. This is a very different kind of look um, than what we saw during the space shuttle. We know it's the future. I mean, we had our, our LCD displays and we had lots of buttons to press and, you know, valves and switches. And I think this, this new technology will allow us to get through procedures much more fast, you know, much, much faster. Because we had, you know, paper flight data file that we we're having to turn to different pages and get to things. And I think this will make it much more efficient to go through your malfunctions and your procedures with the touch screens. And I think, you know, having the gloves, being able to, you know, touch the screens and work within the gloves, um, everything's kind of sleek and efficient. You know, there's not a lot of wires and things hanging off. And their knee boards, you can see their knee boards on their left knees. And so that's for some extra little notes and things. The, uh, the hatch is closed now. There's some commentary. Uh, we are ready for the post ingress briefing when you are ready to copy. And we just heard confirmation on the loops that the hatch is closed. So that is a little bit ahead of schedule. We are motivated to go today. <laughs> We're ready. Go ahead. OK, on the weather, uh, we still have some rain showers moving through the area. Uh, but we do have a reasonable opportunity today. So we are proceeding into the count. Uh, we are going to take a look at both pad and ascent track weather at T minus 1 hour and 30 minutes and the next decision point will be prior to prop load. Okay, we copy. And on the vehicle health front, both F9 and Dragon Health remains nominal uh, with no items of note. So we just heard the weather is still iffy. Good news, thank you. The weather is still iffy. This concludes the post ingress brief. Uh, report when ready for contracts with Falcon 9 operators. We are ready for the uh, F-9 operators. Copy. Expect that shortly. So when we hear that chatter pick back up, we're going to quiet right down so that you can listen into that along with us. But we just heard them discussing the weather briefly, still keeping an eye on that. But the next decision point is going to be uh, before prop load. So we're going to press forward for now and then reevaluate on before they start fueling the rocket. But in the meantime, it sounds like Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon are healthy. So um, the vehicle's in good shape, right? It sounds like kind of a little bit of a repeat from Wednesday that we're just keeping an eye on the weather at this point. You can see on their left legs, well, in that previous image. And Dragon SpaceX comm checks with F9. Uh, you can expect it in about one to two minutes. Dragon's ready. All right, on their left legs there, they have the satchels that are strapped to their legs. Inside are some crew provisions, including these tablets that you see uh, that they have displayed there. You say, Lauren, those are tablets versus just knee boards that you can write on? Uh, or the tablets are inside. Oh, they're inside. Yes. Okay. Okay. And so when would they pull those tablets out to use them? Uh, during the mission. Okay. While, yeah, while on orbit. Okay. And I don't know if it's coming, if the, the background noise is coming through over the air, but we hear the rain really picking up outside the studio here. So I'm kind of wondering if Bob and Doug are hearing the sounds of the rain clouds opening up over the pad. It looks like they're, it's still kind of patchy out there. But again, we were following some thunderstorms that look like they may be making their way over here. It, it kind of looks like it's raining from that view. It's kind of, it's a little bit hard to tell through the haze. All right, lunch launch is now uh, just over two hours away. 
Tahira, you are there with the social teams. Now that the hatch is closed and the rain's picking up and all kinds of exciting things are going on right now as we count down and get into the last two hours of the count, I bet things are getting pretty interesting on social media. Hey, Lauren. I mean, yes, they are. So many different things are going on right now. And I think people online are just wondering what's going to happen with today's mission. I have TweetDeck open right now, and it is just scrolling with the conversation of people around the nation talking about today's launch attempt. We also just checked viewership, and we are now up to 1.4 million people watching this live broadcast. So really hope things look good with weather. And on that note, let's take a look at some of the things being said on Twitter right now. So it looks like, oh, we just have some more future astronauts. I really love seeing the young generation just getting mobilized, getting excited about today's mission. Looks like we've also got some Godspeed and safe travels for both astronauts today. Um, really do wish them the best of luck on the second attempt. Hope it happens. Some throwback photos, all from people visiting NASA's centers. And also just, let's do this. I love this can-do attitude. And I just love seeing that people are still keeping the energy alive for today's launch. So there were obviously some disappointing reactions to Wednesday's scrub. But let's take a look at how people are getting excited for today's attempt. Let's roll. Ready for takeoff. Ready to launch America. Three, two, one, go! Ready for lift off? <laughs> I mean, how fun is that video? I think I will definitely have to attempt the worm after this, but just really glad to see everyone in good spirits leading into today's second launch attempt. And I really hope everybody will have something to smile about. And with that, let's head back to Lauren. Lauren. Thanks to hear it. So it looks like people are pretty stoked about today's attempt. Please continue to join the conversation by using the hashtag launch America across all the social media channels. Yeah, I love seeing, I really love seeing the little kids uh, get excited. I know my, my three-year-old is super excited. She's got an astronaut sleeping bag and really? she loves to climb in it. Yeah, it's the the body of the bag is a spacesuit, and then the head is is empty where they where the pillow is. So when she gets inside, it looks like she's got a spacesuit on. So she loves it. And that's the inspiration for that next generation of explorers They're going to take Doug and Bob's place one day. And uh, I think we have some people out there that are so interested in our conversation about the worm and the meatball that they've created something called the worm ball. What? <laughs> yeah, I saw, I was checking my email during that because you like, I emailed you guys the worm ball and I was like, what is this? I, I don't, I'm having a hard time seeing it, but what is the worm ball? So it's a, it's a NASA meatball, which is, you know, what it should be. Yes, yes. Okay, look at okay. it. Okay, there it is. All right, thank you. I need yeah. a visual. So they okay. took the the angular NASA logo and put in the worm inside of the meatball. Can you can you live with that, Lauren? You know what? That's a beautiful compromise. I'll take it. I'll take it. it. <laughs> it's a nice marriage of the two. Oh, I love you, man. Yeah, so, <laughs> truth. truth. And uh, there is another live look at Launch Complex 39A, and we have had the opportunity to share with you a lot about the SpaceX Crew Dragon sitting on top of Falcon 9, a lot about the crew themselves and the significance of today as the official return, we hope, of human launch capability to American shores. But we would be remiss if we did not explain why this pad, 39A, is how ground. We're go, same time, we're go. Many of NASA's storied missions began their daring journey from the exact same spot on Earth. Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. 
This massive structure of steel and concrete has cradled rockets and guided each on their fiery ascent to space for over 50 years. There can be no launch without a launch path, and this hallowed ground has a history greater than any other. Having evolved and been reshaped for each new era of space flight, it's alive with a heartbeat as strong as the first. Launchpad 39A came to life under the direction of project engineer Harry May as NASA ramped up its efforts to achieve an unprecedented calling. Why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? In 1962, Earth moving machines sculpted its massive pyramid base to a height of 40 feet. Then, concrete was poured to hold it in place. To launch the world's first moon rocket, engineers cut a flame trench nearly the length of two football fields down the middle of the mound. It was then lined with heat-resistant bricks to deflect seven and a half million pounds of earth-rattling thrust, first felt on Apollo 8. Less than a year later, Apollo 11 launched from Pad 39A. And hundreds of millions of people around the world watched as it landed on the moon three days later. Nearly a decade after this Apollo era, 39A again took center stage with a new, one-of-a-kind spacecraft, the Space Shuttle. Millions of pounds of additional steel for service structures transformed the look, but not the purpose, human spaceflight. In all, 82 space shuttles blasted off from 39A until the very last start. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. All three engines up and burning. 2, 1, 0. And liftoff, the final liftoff of Atlantis. On the shoulders of the space shuttle, America will continue the dream. Roger roll, Atlantis. With the fleet retired, demolition crews removed the shuttle-era hardware to clear the way for NASA's monumental decision to lease this historic launch site to the private company SpaceX. Today, its sleek and modern design supports a family of rockets that has advanced the commercial age of American spaceflight. Now, 50 years after it first sent humans to the moon, this historic spaceport stands ready for the next wave of human exploration. And we're looking live again at Pad 39A. We're looking at the Pad Closeout team. You can uh, identify them by their numbers there. And we heard confirmation of the hatch uh, being closed just a few minutes ago. So again, things a little bit ahead of schedule. And when I say ahead of schedule, I don't mean the launch time is changing. I just mean um, some of the specific milestones in the timeline. Those times are a little bit flexible, but that launch window remains instantaneous at 322 this afternoon. Um, and Leland, you know, we just saw a piece about the history of Pad 39A. All stations, all stations Chief Engineer, and Countdown 1 for a comm check with the crew. We're going to pause for that comm check. Falcon 9, Guidance, Navigation, and Control. Dragon GNC on Countdown 1, comm check. GNC Dragon, we have you loud and clear. GNC loud and clear, stand by for comm check by the propulsion engineer. Dragon prop on countdown one, comm check. Prop, Dragon, loud and clear. Prop, loud and clear, stand by for comm check with the avionics engineer. Dragon, avionics on countdown one, comm check. Avionics, Dragon, loud and clear. Avionics, loud and clear, stand by for comm check by ground segment engineer. Dragon ground segment on countdown one, comm check. Ground segment, Dragon, loud and clear. 
Ground segment loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control and countdown one. Comm check. Launch control, Dragon, loud and clear. Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. Dragon, Chief Engineer on Countdown 1, comm check. Chief Engineer, Dragon, we've got you loud and clear, Bala. Chief Engineer, loud and clear, this completes the Falcon 9 Responsible Engineer, comm check. And we just saw a thumbs up from Doug Hurley. We listened to a series of comms, comms checks there, and so um, everything... Dragon, Chief Engineer on Dragon to Ground. Loud and clear on Dragon to Ground. Uh, loud and clear. Well, good luck, and let's see if the rain clears up. That sentiment is shared by all you here. Do it. Copy that. So Bob and Doug, along with the launch teams and all of the rest of America, hoping the rain clears up here. Uh, but as far as comms checks go, um, everything uh, sounded pretty normal, pretty nominal there. Uh, so we're just waiting on the weather to clear up. Um, but again, there's a live look at Launch Complex 39A, the site of 82 space shuttle uh, missions where they began. And of course, Apollo, uh, the first mission to the moon, Apollo 11 lifted off from 39A. And Leland, you were just five years old when that happened. Take yeah. us back there. Marie and Lauren, I was five and I was the antenna engineer during the broadcast. I was the kid <laughs> standing behind the black and white Sylvania television holding the rabbit ears and my dad said, move to the left, move to the right. <laughs> and I was trying to look around the television to see what was going on, but I, they said, no, 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 don't move, stay there. <laughs> <laughs> so I never actually saw the actual you know, landing on the moon, Neil and Buzz walking on the moon. And the next day, all the friends, my friends in my community were like, yeah, you wanna be an astronaut? We just had this momentous thing. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it. I want to be Arthur Ashe, because Arthur Ashe trained five blocks down the street from where I grew up. And my dad talked about his, his excellence, his perseverance, his, his athleticism. And so it wasn't until I got to NASA, uh, working as an engineer at NASA Langley, that a friend of mine said, you'd be a great astronaut. And I'm, I just laughed at him. And I didn't fill the application out, but another friend of mine got in, Charlie Camarda. And I said, if he can become an astronaut, I can become <laughs> uh -huh. one. So I applied the next year and I got in, in the 1998 class. And I think about this, again, story, legacy, Pat 39A. I was uh, there in 2008 and 2009, Space Shuttle Atlantis, the last one that came in with Doug and the rest of the crew. And it's just a, an amazing time to see this new era with Lauren, with your SpaceX Crew Dragon about to take off. I never heard that story. <laughs> That's I've got a million what? stories. <laughs> a million <laughs> stories. <laughs> wow. It's it's so cool that, you know, you do have a lot of these kids that are watching today who have never seen mm -hmm. a, a flight, a human space flight uh, from KSC before. And um, this is their first time. And I'm trying to remember back, you know, I, I grew up in the shuttle era. And I grew up in Los Angeles, and I remember sometimes when the shuttle would land at Edwards Air Force Base, mm -hmm. you'd hear those sonic booms. Double and you're, sonic booms. you hear the double sonic booms yeah. in school, and, and, and we all just knew, oh, that's the space shuttle. It was just right. the thing. We right. just knew about that. And it did make me sad that there's a, like an entire generation of, of kids who didn't grow up with that experience. And mm -hmm. I'm just so proud that, you know, today, hopefully, we get to provide that for kids and hopefully have more and more of these launches to the point where it becomes routine, hopefully never right. boring, but routine. And yeah. there's talent in every zip code. So you have to make sure that every kid is has the opportunity to do these types of things. If they believe in themselves and we give them the right tools that they can use to be in STEM fields. And you know, we have a very diverse group of people up mm -hmm. here working together to get Bob and Doug off safely. And I think more people that see this type of diversity will have a chance to say, I can do that too. 
Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, we have a lot of kids watching today and we have an opportunity to hear from another really awesome role model, especially for the little girls in the audience. So we want to throw it over to Gary in Houston to talk to a very special astronaut standing by there. Hi, Gary. Hi, Marie. I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by one of NASA's record-setting astronauts and a recent resident aboard the space station, Christina Cook. Christina, thank you for joining us. It's great to be with you today. Christina, we're coming up on 20 years of continuous human presence on the International Space Station, and you were one of those humans. What's it like to see a new milestone like this launch unfold after so much history already? You're right, so much history indeed, and it's just been great to watch it all unfold. I think for me, the most exciting thing is how NASA is not only innovating in what we do, ex you know, exploring the universe, pushing the boundaries, getting knowledge on the space station, bringing it back to Earth for benefits here, but in how we do it. We're innovating in the implementation of the, those goals and of our mission. And what that means is that bringing in the private sector, bringing in a commercial space economy for low Earth orbit means space is going to be more accessible and more innovative. Innovative, and it's just an awesome new era of history to be able to witness. You hold the record for the longest single stay by a female astronaut in space. What's it like living aboard for so long? Well, it is truly a privilege every single day. I have to I have to say it's a beautiful thing to look down on the Earth and to be able to kind of contribute to a space program that you yourself has, have held in such high regard your entire life. I would say that the biggest challenge going into sort of those longer times is remaining vigilant. The engineers make it so easy to live on board the space station. Sometimes you forget you're actually surrounded by such a hostile environment. So uh, remaining vigilant both day to day to have that appreciation then that you wake up with every day and then also being vigilant, knowing that things could take a turn for the worst at any time, and you have to be ready to react to that. So um, it's a great privilege, but it also comes with great responsibility. You came to NASA after the days of the shuttle program, and you flew on the Russian Soyuz. What does it mean to have this private capability to fly astronauts to the station? Well, I think it's just a great innovation in terms of our partnerships. You know, when we started out, it was individual countries pursuing space exploration. We brought in the international aspect of it, and now we're really folding in that commercial aspect, bringing the innovation of all of our American industrial power and recognizing that the more partnerships we have, the more accessible, the more innovative space exploration can be. So it's an awesome time, and it brings with it so much more capability into the program as well. So it's not only how we're doing it, but it's what it brings. We're looking forward to having this transportation from private companies. How does it help you do your job in space? You know, I think uh, what one concept that we have in NASA for safety and to mitigate risk is called dissimilar redundancy. And here now we're bringing up a whole second way of getting crew to the International Space Station and getting cargo, last minute cargo. So we're increasing how much science we can do on board the space station by twofold. We're increasing how we can, you know, our options for getting items up, stowage items, um, supplies, provisions, science experiments. So we're really just banking on the extra redundancy to make the program that much more robust. We're watching Bob and Doug go through the final phases of preparing for this launch. What's going through your mind so close to liftoff? Oh, it is such a great day indeed. You know, it's interesting because I think it's not so much what is going through your mind, but what's not going through your mind. You know, you're not thinking about all the things could go wrong. You're thinking about enabling success by doing what you've been trained to do. One of the things we have is that on launch day, astronauts are sometimes the most calm people in the room. And I found that to be true on my launch day, too. I think it's kind of this career culmination of everything you've learned, everything you've dreamed of, and you know that it's coming together in that day and that you're going to finally do what you're prepared to do, execute the mission, and it just really brings a sense of calm and readiness. NASA astronaut Christina Cook, always an honor to hear from you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Well, once Bob and Doug arrive at the station, NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy will be ready to welcome them on board. So in anticipation of their launch, he had this message for them. Hello, everyone. I'm astronaut Chris Cassidy, commander of Expedition 63 on board the International Space Station, flying 250 miles above the Earth. Like you, I'm excited about today's launch and the possibilities it will bring to America and to the world. But also, I'm very excited that two close friends will be arriving and joining the crew. I had the privilege of flying with Doug Hurley on both of our first shuttle missions back in 2009. 
Together we came to the International Space Station and helped construct the amazing facility that it is today. Although this will be my first mission with Bob, it was my honor to follow him as the chief of the office when he left back in 2015 to begin training for this amazing mission. Personally, I've been very fortunate to fly in two different spacecraft. Launching from America on the shuttle, and most recently launching from Kazakhstan in the Soyuz. But I can't tell you how exciting it is to know that we're once again launching Americans from the coast of Florida. And finally, here's a story I'd like to share with you. Back in 1981, John Young and Bob Crippen launched on Space Shuttle Columbia, the very first space shuttle flight, marking the last time we flew Americans on a brand new vehicle. With them, they flew an American flag, representing America's technical prowess. Thirty years later, that same flag was flown to the International Space Station. This flag remains here today, waiting for Bob and Doug. Our flag means so many things to our country, and this small piece of America represents what we'll be able to achieve together. We'll never stop exploring. And so Bob and Doug can take this very special flag home to Earth, where it awaits its next journey to the cosmos. In a few years, the Burst Orion crew will take this flag with it around the moon. All of this starts today. I'll be watching outside the window, along with everyone else in America and around the world. I can't wait to look out the window and see my friends on close approach. Go Falcon 9, go Dragon, and go Bob and Doug. I'll see you soon. And there again is a live look at Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we are T minus one hour, 41 minutes, 58 seconds and counting from liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket carrying Crew Dragon with astronauts Bob, Bank Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley strapped inside. Uh, we can see some raindrops on the screen there. Um, it looks like rain coming down at the pad, but we're still uh, monitoring weather, and it sounds like there's going to be another decision point before they start fueling uh, the Falcon 9 rocket, which is scheduled to happen at about T minus 35 minutes. So uh, we just heard a little bit about where they're headed. Uh, if the weather cooperates today to the International Space Station, Leland, you've been there twice, and I know um, just from what you've told us, it's it's this Leviathan in space and <laughs> the site of so much important work and partnerships happening. Right, Chris Cassidy is up there floating in the Columbus Laboratory that I installed, or our team of us installed um, on STS-122. And I think about you know using this robotic arm that was made in Canada, the European Space Agency built the Columbus Laboratory, and my job was to use that arm and attach it to the International Space Station. And as it was getting closer and closer, the motion just stopped. And I'm like, what is going on? And there are four ready to latch indicators that have a very slight spring force that I was moving so slowly with the hand controller, the translational hand controller, that that, that spring force stalled out the motion. And Peggy Whitson was behind me and she said, Leland, there's some commentary. Weather update, I think. Go ahead, sir. Hey, Doug. We're still waiting for a weather update expected at 18 Zulu. Uh, therefore, the next assessment will be closer to the propellant load time. Uh, we are currently no-go in launch weather, but we are showing an expected clear of 1830 Zulu. Okay. Copy all. Thanks for the update. So we just heard if, if they were to launch right now, the weather would be no-go. However, it sounds like there may be an opportunity um, if the weather clears, as it sounds like they expect it may. So again, we're going we're gonna to keep listening um, as we continue talking. If we start to hear any kind of chatter, especially if it's about the weather, we're going to do our best to quiet down so that we don't step on that and, and everyone can hear it along with us. Uh, but Leland, you were just talking about uh, the work on station and, and Peggy Whitson was getting ready to tell you something. <laughs> well, uh, so the Columbus Laboratory is stalled out. It's about to be attached. And there are 10,000 people waiting. Their job security depended on me installing this thing properly. Right. And Peggy said, Leland, push just a little bit harder on the hand <laughs> controller. 
and all four ready to latch indicators went green. And I was like, yes, and that was our primary mission objective. But that paled in comparison to what happened next. Peggy invited us over to dinner in the Russian segment, and we had this meal with people from all over the world, Russian, German, French, African-American, Asian-American, this diversity that we talked about earlier, were up there breaking bread at 17,500 miles per hour while listening to Sade's Smooth Operator. <laughs> it blew my mind. It was Smooth yeah. Operator, right? You what know? an appropriate song for this I know. Song too, right? Wow, and, does she know? She, she knows will. now. Yeah. <laughs> and Dan Tani actually changed the song to from Smooth Operator to Arm Operator. Uh -huh. So you see Arm oh, Operator. <laughs> I love it, love it. And Leland, you actually, uh, we were in an, another taped segment when you got a text uh, from yeah. Drew Foistel. Can you, can you share that with us? Yeah, Drew Foistel, his good friend, just sent me a text saying that uh, the families say hello to all who are watching and thank the nation and the world for their support and interest. And Chris Ferguson just actually sent me a text. He was the commander on STS-135 and one of my classmates from the 1998 class. And he says, way to go, Scott Speed on Crew Dragon. That's awesome. Yeah. It, it's great to, to hear those words of support. Thank you guys for watching and everybody following along at home. I mean, uh, the the COVID-19 situation has been just a just a tough time for people stuck inside, um, homeschooling their kids, still trying to do their jobs. And so it's yeah. it's really cool to be able to uh, to watch this happening. And we see the pad closeout team uh, it looks like they are getting ready or like they've left the, the white room and they've already come down the crew access arm. So they are getting ready to leave the pad now. And we are going to go now to uh, the Operations and Support Building 2, where Daryl Nail is standing by with NASA's Chief of Staff to talk to us a little bit about some of NASA's ambitions uh, beyond the International Space Station and its work with the Commercial Crew Program. Daryl? Yeah, that's right. We're here in the, the Mission Briefing Room at uh, the top of Operations and Support Building here, where there's a lot of important people that are gathering to watch the launch here. And one of those people, it's not me, by the way, one of those people that is important is Gabe Sherman. NASA's Chief of Staff, we appreciate you being here. Hey, thanks for having me, Daryl. You got kind of the insight of what's coming down the sure. pike here at, at NASA. So, so, of course, today is commercial crew, and we're focused on that, seeding the commercial market. But what's off in the horizon for NASA? Well, I'll just tell you, it's, a, it's an incredibly exciting time to be at NASA, and you know this. I mean, you're here every day. Uh, but whenever you think about what we're doing with commercial crew, uh, you know, in the horizon in July, we're launching Mars Perseverance, which is just going to be an incredible, incredible thing for us. You look at the end of this year, you know, SLS, the largest rocket in the world, is, is going through testing right now, going through green run testing, and, and we're hoping maybe by the end of the year we can even get it right out here to the Cape, mm. um, which would be a, just an incredible achievement for our team. So um, there is no shortage of things to be excited about at NASA right now. And it feels like everything is really starting to happen here recently with everything that you just mentioned. And if we get that first Artemis launch, that could be right around the corner as well. Oh, man, you know, we're looking at, uh, I think, late 2021 is what we're looking for. Um, and so you, you think about SLS potentially moving through, from the Green Run to the Cape. Um, you've got Orion finishing up its last little bit of testing. It moved from Plum Brook um, earlier this year, our, our, our station up there in Ohio, down to KSC. So we're looking at uh, checking it out throughout next year. And hopefully we'll have the first integrated flight of SLS and Orion at the end of 2021. And I'm telling you, that, that is going to be a moment. That will be exciting. Yeah. And there will be a thunderous boom right here at yes. the Kennedy Space Center. Um, so with Mars as the end goal, mm -hmm. how, do, how does all of this get to that end point? You bet. Now, and I think that's what's so important about the Artemis program, right? Our, our long-term vision is to get to Mars. But, you know, when you think about Artemis, everything that we're doing at the moon is helping us learn, prove out capabilities and technologies, work through the, the right mission durations, understand how we utilize the resources of the moon potentially to go further onto Mars. So the technology, the science, the exploration, um, architecture that we're putting together, each and every piece of it is helping us learn a little bit more, prove out a little bit more so we can take that next giant leap to Mars. And so everything that we're doing at the moon helps prepare us to move on to Mars. How about the activity in low Earth orbit, like commercial crew, which is happening 
uh, today. Yeah. How does that help us for missions to the moon? Yeah, I think anytime you're launching humans, you're learning, right? And you're taking what you've learned and you're you're moving it forward to the next to the next mission. But I think it's really about the business case. If you think about what commercial crew is, it's NASA moving from owning and operating hardware to buying a service, right? And if you remember just a few weeks ago, um, and we awarded three contracts on the human landing system to commercial companies. And so we're hoping that we move to a day where we're actually buying a service to get our astronauts back and forth to the moon. Um, so actually enabling com the commercial market to go from low Earth orbit all the way out to lunar orbit. And so commercial crew is a great proving ground for that, um, helps us prove out that business case, build those partnerships, and then we get a feed forward to the moon. So. It's, uh, it means a lot. This means a lot as we move out. And, and it's really exciting when you talk about uh, the commercial crew, the commercial, commercial aspect going to the moon right. and those partners. Um, they're going to be studying those landers uh, to see if they are viable for NASA? Yeah, working through a, a tremendous process of with, with the commercial providers and NASA engineers going through initial designs right now, looking at, at the, the capabilities that they've proposed, and then trying to make decisions on which which landing system goes early in 2024, which landing systems are better prepared for sustainability out in the, the later 20s. And so that is going to be an ongoing process throughout this year and moving into next. Um, so it's going to be really exciting to kind of see what, what comes out as, hey, this is the lander that's going to take the first woman and the next man to the moon in 2024. Right, so different than the time of Apollo when we right. went to the moon. Yeah. And that program ultimately came to an end. Uh, the idea here, though, is to try to create some sustainability. Talk right, about that. Right, and sustainability, you, you can get to sustainability if you have reusability, right? And that's, that's what we're seeing with commercial crew, for sure. Um, but whenever you think about our human landing system, um, you're, you're looking at a system that we put out there at the moon once we get to sustainability, and it's going back and forth, taking multiple trips to the lunar surface, back up to Gateway, which um, you're familiar with this kind of our, our smaller space station we're gonna put in orbit around the moon. Um, so we're, we are building an architecture that is gonna enable reusability at the moon. Apollo never had that. And so whenever you think about driving down cost and increasing access, reusability, sustainability are critical. So you get to see everything from a very high level at NASA. What's it like for you personally, I'm curious, to be here at the Kennedy Space Center uh, to watch a launch and, and to just see this amazing facility where all of this activity happens. Yeah, I think sometimes um, people think since I work at NASA, I'm around this stuff all the time. I'm not, right? I don't get to come down here nearly as often as I'd like. So it's just as exciting for me as it is for anybody else in this room. When you think about all the hard work that our team has put in to get us to this day, um, to actually come down and be a part of it with them, um, it's, just an, just, it's just overwhelming and incredible. So uh, we're just a little bit excited. All right, Gabe Sherman, NASA's Chief of Staff. We appreciate you joining us today and enjoy the launch. I, I certainly know you will if we we're able to get that one off. We're going to toss this back now to Hawthorne, California. Joining us now is SpaceX's Lars Blackmore to discuss SpaceX's future ambitions to visit the moon and Mars. Thanks for joining us again today for a second round. You're welcome. Could you tell us just a little bit about your background and what you do here at, space, at SpaceX? Yeah, well, uh, I'm in charge of entry and landing for Starship, which is uh, SpaceX's next rocket uh -huh. after Falcon 9. Uh, mm -hmm. And before that, I worked for many years on the same thing uh, for Falcon. Um, so hopefully today you'll see another one of those landings on a drone ship. Awesome. And speaking of that, what role does reusability play uh, in getting people to the moon and Mars in the future? Well, it's really all about making human space flight affordable. And what you want for that is a 100% reusable rocket. Now, Falcon is only partially reusable, mm -hmm. but Starship is going to be 100% reusable. And we've actually already started working with NASA on using Starship to send astronauts to the surface of the moon for the first time since 1972. Not only that, Starship will be refuelable on orbit. And the combination of those two things will let us send people basically anywhere in the solar system with more payload for less money than I think people have really been contemplating. I think for the first time, we can seriously talk about things like lunar bases or what SpaceX cares about most, 
a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. Right. So what you're saying is I will have an opportunity soon to get on board one of those spaceships. I, I very much <laughs> hope so. Yeah. So speaking of reusability and landing, um, I, I know you mentioned Starship will be refuelable uh, in orbit, but Falcon does come back and land back on Earth. What, what are the challenges with landing, actually landing on the moon and landing on uh, a planet like Mars? Yeah, well, you, you can't land like a plane because the Moon and the Mars either have no atmosphere or have a very thin atmosphere. And, and even if you could, there's no runway that someone's built for you. So that's one of the reasons that we do propulsive landing on Falcon, because we want to figure out how to do propulsive landing. That fundamental architecture works on basically any planet. If you have no atmosphere like the Moon, you do a propulsive landing burn all the way. If you have a thick atmosphere like Earth, you let the atmosphere slow you down as you float down and do a short landing burn at the end. And for Mars, which has an atmosphere but a very thin one, you do something in between the two. Wow. Yeah, that sounds really difficult. Um, and I'm sure there has been a lot of effort put into that. Um, can you tell us anything about um, what we're working on now to get us to a point where we can do a landing like that in such a harsh environment? Yeah, so figuring out propulsive landing is really the key part of it. But what people may not realize is that every time we bring Falcon back, we do something called an entry burn. So just mm -hmm. before we hit the atmosphere, we light the engines to slow the rocket down. Mm -hmm. That happens high up where the air is very thin. And it just so happens that the conditions there are very similar to what a Mars landing burn would look like. So even though it takes months to get to Mars, and you can only do it every two years when the planets line up, we effectively get to practice Mars propulsive landing every time we bring Falcon back, including hopefully today. Wow. And as you mentioned, every time we bring Falcon back, we learn something new. Can you tell us a little bit more about what we learn uh, after the, the vehicle has returned and we're able to check out the vehicle? Yeah, so uh, Jessica actually mentioned this earlier that, you know, I, I talked about how cost is really one benefit of reusability, but reliability is the other benefit. I mean, imagine that you do all this planning to send a rocket up through the rigors of launch and re-entry, but you don't get to see the rocket afterwards. Um, and what, what we would like to do with reusability, what we've been able to do with Falcon 9, is see the rocket, inspect it, and because of that, we've been able to correlate our models pre-flight to what actually happens when you launch, re-enter, and land a rocket. Right, instead of just guessing what happened to exactly. the vehicle after it's left. Exactly. That, that is amazing. Well, thank you again for joining us today for You're a second welcome. round. Hopefully the weather works with us today in a couple hours, actually. Um, let's throw it back to KSC with Marie. All right, actually, we have Lauren here. Now, today's mission opens up the door to one day allowing the general public to be able to visit places like the moon and Mars. And as you've heard through uh, several interviews today, reusability is a really, really important part of that. Imagine if every time you flew a plane from LA to New York, you threw it away at the end of the flight. That would mean essentially airline travel would be too expensive, costing hundreds of millions of dollars a flight, and almost no one would be able to fly. And so that's what SpaceX is trying to do here with reuse, allowing um, not just a handful of people to be able to go to space, but tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of regular folks like you and me to be able to, to go to space. So, you know, myself, you know, when people like me have a chance to go, I know my dream is to land on Jupiter's moon Europa. Uh, scientists believe that there is a liquid water ocean underneath the ice and that it has the potential to be habitable. And so I'm super excited to get up close and personal to maybe some space fish. <laughs> <laughs> Leland, what about you? Where would you go? Wow, that's a pretty interesting destination. Um, I think I would like to go to Mars. We've, we've studied Mars so much and looked at it, and I think maybe having a Martian base that is dog friendly you know, mm. bring the pups along. Yes. Because I think as we explore, we want to take our families, our cultures, our traditions, you know, with us. And, and you know, flying with Doug and Bob is cool, but, you know, having more people. Yeah. There's See? the dogs. The puppers. Taking the, the puppers to space. I mean, you know, they, they're not. <laughs> they look ready to go. They too. are ready to go. <laughs> we just needed some, maybe some like SpaceX type suits for them, <laughs> you know. But it's, it's, uh, it's, that's what it's all about, exploration. Like the settlers going 
the West. You know, they mm -hmm. took everything with them and they started these new communities and these new new traditions. And I think that's what we do with space travel. We start new traditions and communities and bring everyone together as one one family, one civilization. Absolutely. We're here for it. And knowing that the opportunity to fly to space as a private citizen is really just right around the corner, we have a new poll question on Twitter for you. If given the opportunity to fly to the moon, now we're talking the moon, would you fly to the South Pole where no one has ever been, or would you go to the Apollo 11 landing site? So those are going to be some interesting answers. And while there is not a ton of cargo on today's mission, Dragon is carrying two very special payloads, aside from Bob and Doug, of course. <laughs> the first of those payloads is a series of custom art pieces entitled Humankind by Los Angeles artist Christian Tristan Eaton. These indestructible double-sided paintings made from gold, brass, and aluminum celebrate how far humanity has come, as well as how far we still have to go. It includes a beautiful homage to the Saturn V rocket, as well as a nod to Bob and Doug's current ride to space. And you can find more images and information about these pieces on SpaceX's social channels. Next, in the spirit of inspiring the next generation of explorers, we wanted to celebrate the class of 2020, from kindergarten all the way to graduate school. So SpaceX and NASA invited students from around the world to submit their photo to fly on America's first human space flight in nearly a decade. Each graduate's photo was used to create a mosaic image of our beautiful planet Earth, which we printed and it's now being flown aboard Bob and Doug's flight on the Crew Dragon spacecraft. We received nearly 100,000 photos. That's a ton, so thank you and congratulations, graduates. Yeah, I've got a couple of family members and friends who submitted their photos, oh, wow. so they're super <laughs> excited about seeing their faces go to space in that beautiful mosaic. That that's was really great. cool. And again, that's what it's all about, you know, everyone coming together with their experiences and bringing them forward to, to space. And, I, you know, I think regular people flying to space, I mean, we're, SpaceX is going to be flying, you know, non-government people, non-military people, mm -hmm. but people that have a desire to explore and do new things and traditions off planet, as we say sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, f all this time since we've had the International Space Station, it's been government astronauts performing the research because you're the only ones we've been able to send, right? But well, we've I mean, had some tourists, though. We've had people that paid their way on a Soyuz rocket. Sure, to sure. Go. But it, it's a very, it's, it's really the billionaire boys club, you know? That's what Pharrell talks about with, you know, it costs so much money to go to right. space. And I think that price point will come down as we make this more, you know, more amenable for everyday people. Absolutely. And eventually being able to fly artists and musicians yeah. and poets, people who can tell the story of what they've seen out there in a way that really connects to the soul of people down on Earth so they feel inspired exactly. to go. Exactly. Now, following today's mission, we will be one step closer to a future where we can all have that opportunity to gain the orbital perspective and explore new worlds. In just over an hour from now, Bob and Doug will be the first people to launch on an American vehicle in almost a decade. And for the SpaceX team, if I can try to speak for all of us, which is impossible, but I will say it has been an absolute honor to have the opportunity today to have this stage to show the world what we've poured our hearts into over the years with our partners at NASA. And it's just deeply humbling to know that the agency and that Bob and Doug have entrusted us with this critical mission. The, the responsibility that's on our shoulders is, is huge, and, and we're just so grateful to be here today. Absolutely, and I know that you know our NASA teams really share in that sentiment. Um, we heard we heard from just a handful of them earlier when Bob and Doug were riding out to the launch pad. But there are just there's so many people that we're you know we're probably never going to see or hear from on the public stage, but that have poured their hearts and souls, as you said, into this mission. Um, you know, all the engineers up late hours checking, double check checking, triple checking everything um, to troubleshoot and solve problems and get us to this point. So um, it's it's just really awesome that we've made it to this point. When you think about legacy, Katherine Johnson who helped get John Glenn to space, her daughters are watching right now. Mm -hmm. And that again, that legacy going forward to the future of space travel yeah. is powerful. Wow. And we heard from two icons of science and exploration on Wednesday, and we couldn't resist sharing these shout outs with you one more time. Wow, we're making history again. The NASA program. 
I'm there with you guys in spirit. Bob, Doug, good luck. I know you'll be fine. I'll be watching and got everything crossed, arms, legs. I'm tied in a knot. Can't wait for you to get back safely. This is the first time a U.S. built rocket has taken people into space in nine years. It's quite an accomplishment. So for us at the Planetary Society, more rockets means more exploration. More people in space means more exploration. More countries involved in the endeavor of spaceflight means more exploration. This is how we know the cosmos and our place within it. So congratulations, SpaceX. Here's wishing your team and the crew especially a safe journey and the joy of discovery. Let's go. So great to hear from William Shatner and Bill Nye, uh, two um, very recognizable faces following along on the mission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we want to go over to Dan and Jesse and Hawthorne, where we are now just one hour and 18 minutes from launch. Dan, Jesse. Hey, thanks, Marie. Yeah, one hour, 18 minutes. I think we're tying ourselves in knots, just like Captain Kirk. We're, we're really hoping the weather cooperates. In about 20 minutes or so, we might clear. So we're getting hopeful. We're getting yes. our hopes up. Yes, yes. Very excited. Again, we're T minus one hour and 18 minutes from launch. And we are the anticipation is real over here <laughs> since arriving at the spacecraft bob and doug were helped by our closeout engineers to get into their seats attach their suits to special umbilicals that provide breathing air pressurized nitrox and a communications link to dragon systems they conducted leak checks which were successful and communications checks with the core here in hawthorne which is the person who will speak to them directly throughout the mission as well as the launch director in florida this is where they are checking their calm path through both ground stations and the tracking and data relay satellites that we'll use to talk to the crew the entire way to the station. And after all of those suit leak checks were successful, the closeout team was able to get out of the uh, Dragon capsule and seal up that hatch, which also got its own leak check and was confirmed successful. At this point, the closeout team is out of the pad. They're away from the BDA, the blast danger area, and weather operators are about to kick off their final checks on wind speeds at the pad, which are going to be used during the final go, no go for launch. So we're all keeping eyes on the weather right now. Before we get to that final go, no go, all the various teams, both NASA and SpaceX, are going to do internal go polls, just making sure conditions are right with Falcon 9, the Dragon, the crew, the range, and the space station before the final go is given. So let's check back in with the man over in Houston, Gary, for a status and the team supporting the space station for their readiness for launch. Thanks, Dan. The team here in Mission Control Houston remains go for launch. We're also very hopeful about that weather. All systems on board the station that are required to be healthy for this mission are continuing to look good. Chris Cassidy is uh, wrapping up his work day and will be watching Bob and Doug launch here uh, in just under an hour. So station power and communication systems are normal. Computers and networks used for monitoring Dragon's approach have been checked out, and the cabins and the station cabin's atmosphere and pressure are as expected and ready to welcome two new crew members aboard. Mission Control will be closely monitoring Bob and Doug's flight and checking off milestones for most of the flight, and this very same team will be coming back tomorrow to be ready when Dragon gets in range of the International Space Station and we begin integrated operations and prepare for Dragon's docking. So I'll send it back. International Space Station team here is ready for launch. Go Falcon 9, go Dragon, and Godspeed to Bob and Doug. All right. Thanks, Gary. If you are just now joining us, you picked a really good time. We're just a little over an hour to launch. And welcome to our coverage for the mission known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. Liftoff time still holding for 3.22 p.m. Eastern, tracking no issues with Falcon 9 or Dragon. Everything good with the range so far. We're just really keeping an eye on that weather. Over the last three hours, our crew members, Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin, donned their SpaceX suits in the historic crew quarters suit-up room. After that, they walked out of crew quarters, just as every astronaut to fly from space from this port has done since Apollo 7. And then they were transported over to the pad, where the crew members entered the SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft that were looking in live. 
Today is a historic launch. It will be the first time a commercially built spacecraft will launch people into orbit and the first time the U.S. has sent people to the space station from American soil since 2011 with the retirement of the space shuttle program. Over the next hour, we will conduct a series of polls to get ready for launch, have Bob and Doug arm the launch escape system, and begin fueling Falcon 9. Launch is set for 3.22 p.m. Eastern. This will include a 12-minute flight to orbit and then a 19-hour flight to dock with the International Space Station uh, tomorrow morning. Today's mission is the culmination of years of work between teams at SpaceX and NASA. Demo 2 is going to be an end-to-end -end flight test starting with this launch today, going on to dock with the space station tomorrow, and then splashing down at the end of their mission. And this is going to be the final test for NASA to certify SpaceX for regular crew flights to the space station. We've been hearing a little bit from the crew on board Dragon, which you can see on your right screen. They are currently strapped into their seats and already through communications and leak checks. They're able to follow all the milestones still ahead on those display panels just above them, getting insight into all Dragon and Falcon 9 systems as we proceed towards launch. So at T minus one hour and 13 minutes, let's check in with John I for a status update on the vehicles. What's the update, John? Thanks, Jesse. Well, not much, add, not much to add to what uh, Dan and Jesse just brought up. We've had a smooth countdown this afternoon. SpaceX team is working no issues as the pace begins to pick up here in the last 70 minutes. On Falcon 9, we did uh, get the team on console. Earlier, you heard the comm checks between the responsible engineers and the crew. Uh, the engineers will be making calls on Ascent for the crew's benefit, so they want to make sure that uh, they could hear them before we go. The propulsion checkouts of the first and second stages are beginning right now. We're watching them begin to go through the process, opening valves. That check will go for about another 10 minutes, and that'll be our last one until propellant loading. Now the team will assess readiness for launch with a final go-no-go pull at T minus 45 minutes, and that'll be followed by propellant loading starting at T minus 35 minutes. Now earlier today, Dragon operators also performed a series of checkouts of Dragon's flight systems. The spacecraft is also currently go for launch. Our NASA crew, astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, are currently inside Dragon. The hatch is closed. The SpaceX ground crew has left the tower. The next major event for Dragon is retract to the crew access arm that you can see currently alongside the capsule. That will happen somewhere between T-45 and T-42 minutes. Now the range is currently clear for launch from historic Pad 39A. The worldwide network of ground stations and the tracking and data relay satellites are ready to support Dragon as it heads into orbit. The weather, that's the one concern. We will get a weather brief at T minus one hour, so just under 12 minutes from now. Currently, the ground and upper altitude winds are go, so that's one thing that we can check as green. Uh, at the uh, current time, we did have some rain earlier that appears to have let up. But we are red on conditions for both the electric field at surface levels, lightning, and cumulus clouds. There is a expectation that a forecast that will be coming up at about T minus one hour also uh, may give us clearance of those conditions. So everything is focusing now on the weather brief at T minus one hours. Also, we should hope to hear about the final check on the ascent corridor. That's the weather along the Atlantic seaboard in case Dragon had to abort on the way to space. The conditions there have been marginal, but the expectation that it would be good for launch. But we will get all of that coming up here very shortly prior to entering propellant load. Now today we are aiming for a launch at 3.22.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time or 19 hours, 22 minutes, 45 seconds universal time. Once we begin loading propellant, there's no opportunity to change T0. So once propellant is loading, we're committed and we'll get one chance at it today. But currently at T minus one hour, 10 minutes and 30 seconds, everything except the weather is go for launch. Thanks, John, for that detailed update. 
We've got an extensive history now of flying Falcon 9 from the Florida coast, and just last year completed a test run of the mission. We're less than an hour from beginning here today. The purpose of that mission was to demonstrate Dragon's capability to safely and reliably fly to and from the International Space Station. The success of Demo 1 was a really exciting moment, Falcon paved 9, the way for today's please. mission to where we are today. And right now we're getting ready to fly U.S. astronauts from U.S. soil for the first time since 2011. Dragon and Falcon 9 together have years of operational experience, or what we refer to as flight heritage. As I mentioned earlier, SpaceX has successfully completed 21 flights of Dragon to and from orbit since 2010, including 20 trips to the International Space Station. Not only have we conducted thousands of hours of testing, we've also enhanced and added a number of safety features to Dragon. Much of what was learned with the Cargo Dragon was leveraged in the design of this new vehicle. It's fully autonomous, which means it can basically fly itself, but also features that full manual override capability just in case of emergency. Many of the other enhancements help towards SpaceX's goal of reusability and less refurbishment time between missions. So let's take a closer look at these advancements. Standing at almost 27 feet tall from the very bottom of the trunk to the very top of the nose cone, Crew Dragon's comprised of two main elements. You have the capsule, which is designed to hold crew and pressurized cargo, and then you have the trunk, which holds unpressurized cargo as well as having a solar array and radiator. And the nose cone at the top of the capsule protects the docking system as well as the guidance navigation control system, or what we call GNC. The nose cone opens for docking and remains attached to the Crew Dragon spacecraft, and that's unlike the previous version of Dragon, and that helps towards our reusability efforts. Completely opposite the nose cone is that trunk. It has attachment points for Falcon 9, the Dragon capsule, and it can hold cargo. On the very outside of the trunk, one half of, the, of it contains a radiator that rejects heat from the active thermal control system into space. That's the white part, and that uses SpaceX's new Pika tiling technology. The other half contains the solar cells used to charge the spacecraft's batteries. And though we only have two astronauts on board today, the spacecraft is actually designed to accommodate up to seven crew members with modular seats that can be removed and replaced by additional cargo. The seats are made of carbon fiber and are custom sized for any crew member flying on board. The control panel is centered right between the pilot and the commander seats and has those three touchscreen displays that gives the crew insight into Dragon and even the ability to operate the vehicle and fly it manually. And finally, our Super Draco launch escape system is a key safety feature of Crew Dragon, giving the crew the ability to safely escape from the time of launch all the way to orbit. And as we look to the future beyond this test flight later this year, the first operational crewed mission for NASA will take place. NASA astronauts Mike like Hopkins. Captain, that might review your launch commit criteria and indicate readiness at the appropriate time. Step 5469 for propellant load and launch. That's a good sign. That was the launch director. We're getting ready to pull the teams as we move towards that go, no go for propellant loading, which happens at about 45 minutes before launch. But back to our Crew-1 mission, NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker, and Suichi Noguchi of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, were chosen to support this mission. And again, M1D it's called Crew-1. But today, Doug Hurley is the spacecraft commander for this mission. He previously flew on two space shuttle missions as the pilot on STS-127 and STS-135, which was the final space shuttle flight. Here's a closer look at Doug Hurley. Excited? Very excited. Yeah, very excited. You ready? No problem, Oh, yeah. I think we're ready. Uh, I think we're certainly ready. Joining the SpaceX Demo-2 test. He is a Marine Corps colonel and test pilot. He was selected as an astronaut in 2000. He piloted Space Shuttle Endeavour and Atlantis for STS-135, the final Space Shuttle mission. Introducing NASA astronaut Doug Hurley. It's a life-changing process in so many ways to fly into space. It's just overwhelming in some, some respects. Just the sensations, the rumbling, the shaking, the acceleration. 
My name is Doug Hurley, and I'm the spacecraft commander for the Demo-2 mission to the International Space Station. This will be the first time the Dragon had a crew on board, and so there's a, a, a myriad of objectives we want to achieve for this mission. What would work on orbit, what might not work on orbit, what would definitely work to be able to just have the entire integrated uh, team that's going to support us getting to and from space station. It was really neat being part of it. You know, we are the lucky ones that get to fly it, but we certainly not for one second take for granted the amount of effort that so many other people had to put into this to make it successful. For Doug personally, he's, he's worked so hard, I mean, through his entire life, um, to get to where we are right now. As a test pilot, this would be the dream to fly a new vehicle. So it makes me so happy to see that he gets to be part of this mission, the spacecraft commander. I'm just glad to see his hard work and his dream has come true for that. It's been a long road in a lot of ways for not only us, but certainly for all the folks that work in the commercial crew program, as well as SpaceX, in our case, just working to get to this point. And we're a little over one hour, three and a half minutes away from launch. Now let's learn a little bit more about the man sitting next to Doug Hurley inside Dragon, NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. My career at NASA has uh, kind of spanned a, a couple of decades at this point. I, I arrived with the class of 2000, uh, went through the training program, primarily focused on the space shuttle and the International Space Station, learning those systems. Having uh, launched a couple times on vehicles, you know, the, the second time was definitely different than the first time. You can feel a little bit guilty of, hey, should I study one more thing? Or is there one more piece of information I should get? Am I really prepared or not? Um, so that's definitely different between uh, uh, where I was on my first flight and where I'm at right now. For me personally, as a spouse, watching um, everything that Bob has put into this over the last five years, um, the dedication that he's shown, the perseverance is pretty special. For both of us though, the, the way our minds work, it won't be until sort of the mission is complete that you have really a chance to savor it and celebrate it. This is a huge accomplishment for uh, an Air Force flight test engineer to be part of the demonstration mission of a brand new vehicle. It's going to be amazing. Without a, a partner that has that same appreciation, I think it can be challenging for some folks. There's a, there's a lot of work and a lot of time that uh, takes away from family that, uh, you know, that my spouse appreciates and I love her for that. On a deeply personal uh, level, I, I'm really excited that my son has got to get a chance to see me uh, launch into space. Being an astronaut has been a little bit of a, an abstraction thing for him because he's seen me do it in old videos, uh, but he hasn't seen me do it for real. And so I'm excited for him to see uh, this launch. Really, my role on the Demo-2 mission is to make sure that we get this vehicle uh, tested and evaluated so that we can move on to more operational missions at the International Space Station. We've got a lot of objectives uh, on board the uh, vehicle that we need to accomplish to, to really make sure that it's uh, good to go. We'll make sure all those systems are working uh, during the test flight so that the future missions uh, will have them available even if they don't plan to utilize them. Through years of the, the NASA team, I'm helping to share that experience and teaching them the lessons that we've learned by going through this. Now there's another capability in the U.S. besides NASA to operate something of this magnitude. I want to thank the entire Commercial Crew Program team that's worked together to get to this point where we've got vehicles and a launch pad ready to head to the International Space Station. If we look even further into the not-so-distant future, flying on a mission to space will be an option for more people as SpaceX plans to also fly private astronauts on board Dragon. Earlier this year, SpaceX signed an agreement with the space tourism company Space Adventures to fly up to four passengers on an orbital trip aboard Dragon as early as next year. And of course, it's NASA that is making private astronaut missions to, to the space station a possibility. We are looking forward to these missions and we hope that you guys are all too.
All right. We are just 20 seconds away from T-minus one hour. This is going to be a really big moment that everyone's going to want to listen to. We're expecting a weather update, obviously hoping that the weather is improving. And so we should find out in the next 10 seconds or so. So we're going to stand by for a moment and wait for the core to give Bob and Doug a call. And then we'll all hear Dragon the latest. Dragon SpaceX, we are at T minus one hour. You are go for section six. When ready, report go for launch. We'll put it in work. And that right there was a call for the crew to refer to some of their procedures. They do some final checks. You can see them checking harnesses, checking helmets, just making sure that they're strapped in and ready to go. And once they're done with that, the crew will report their readiness for launch. SpaceX Dragon in six decimal four. Bob and I are go for launch. Copy, go for launch, and next up will be Gona Gopo at T minus 45. Dragon copy. All right, the crew is go for launch. So we are inside of one hour, still waiting for the weather update. But I mean, this day, this day is one for the history books. We're returning crewed launches to station from American soil on American rockets been almost nine long years since we retired the space shuttle program. I remember that day. I'm going to remember this day. It's been a long road to get here. Countless hours by thousands of dedicated professionals from NASA and SpaceX. It's been an exciting week, but this last final hour is just so exciting right now. Today's mission will be Crew Dragon's second test flight and its first test with humans on board. It's been an awesome countdown so far. Weather, we're still waiting for that update, so it's still a watch item, but the crew is go for launch, so at T minus 45 minutes, hopefully we'll get an update on that weather. We've had a really clean countdown so far. It started with suit up just over three hours ago. The SpaceX team helping Bob and Doug put on their suits, conducting initial checkouts, including an initial pressure and leak check before they got to the actual walkout. And all of that done in that operations and checkout facility. The crew walkout was where Bob and Doug gave their final goodbyes to friends and family gathered outside the operations and checkout building before they began that roughly 20 minute ride to pad 39A. Really touching moment, saying goodbye to their family, both their, their wives and sons right in front of them. Yeah, it's, very touching moment. It's incredible to be able to watch these moments. And as they got into their Teslas, we got to watch them ride all the way to the pad and we got some great footage there. And as you can see on your screen, this is some playback from earlier of them getting into those Teslas about to make that drive down to the pad. And once they got to the pad, they did take a minute to take in the sights and they headed up the fixed service structure to begin the process called crew ingress where Bob and Doug entered. And there you can see on your screen as they're coming through the crew access arm, entering the white room right before they are able to ingress into the vehicle there. Again, yeah. this was from earlier. Yeah, this all from earlier. And as we said, that white room, the last place on planet Earth, they're standing before they climb into Dragon for the ride uphill. SpaceX carrying over a tradition that NASA had had where that was traditionally the room from Gemini, Apollo, and the space shuttle, that last place. Um, about 30 minutes ago, we're back with some live video here. The team was able to close Dragon's hatch with Bob and Doug safe inside. So we are under an hour ago. Things are going to pick up as we get close to that go, no go to begin propellant loading and then arming the launch escape system. The crew pull for readiness was completed at T minus 60 minutes, and the Dragon pull for prop load is coming up here in just about 30 seconds at T minus 55 minutes. And then following that will be 
T minus 45 minutes will be the internal mission control Hawthorne pole and then the launch director's pole for propellant loading. When we get to about T minus 40 minutes, the crew access arm will retract and Bob and Doug will get the call to close their visors and arm the launch escape system. This is the automated system in place that can fire the eight Super Draco thrusters on Dragon to quickly separate the crew from the rocket, either on the pad or during the flight on the ride uphill. And then once we reach T minus 35 minutes, propellant loading for the Falcon 9 will begin. We got there on Wednesday. We got all the way down to about 17 minutes before launch before we had to cancel because of weather. But we're still we're, we're optimistic right now. Conditions have been improving. And so we're looking to press ahead once again into loading fuel onto that Falcon 9 rocket. Throughout the countdown, we've been getting some incredible views of the astronauts inside Dragon just making all of their final preparations, some close-up views of their suits and on the displays as they just are strapped in and ready for launch. The teams often describe the suits as an extension of that Dragon spacecraft. You can always think of it as a mini spacecraft inside of a spacecraft. It's got all of the life support, everything that they need, just like the capsule. The on Countdown 1 technical pull is complete. No constraints to proceed into launch escape system arming and propellant load. And there's that call out that the crew is ready. They are ready to load prop onto Dragon. So we are pushing forward towards T0. And while those suits do look great, they are also engineered to, correct, to connect directly into Dragon seats to provide communications, cooling, and the ability to pressurize if necessary. All right, well, we did get the call out that the technical teams in the ground are ready for launch escape arming and propellant loading. Again, things starting to pick up, things really mm -hmm. starting to feel real. Let's jump down real quick to the team at Kennedy, see if you guys are just as excited. I can't sit still right now. It's starting <laughs> to feel real. Yeah, it's it's hard to sit still in here, right, Leland? <laughs> 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 that rocket fuel going through my veins still. I know, I know. It's it's so awesome when we see them sitting there in their suits. We're less than an hour away now. So far, things look like we we right. might make it. We might make it. Um, so I I want to ask you what it was like the first time you put on a spacesuit when you knew you were going to space. Oh, that was uh, February of 2008. We were in the ONC building getting the pumpkin suits on. A little bit different than the SpaceX, mm -hmm. fly SpaceX suits. <laughs> but um, it was uh, it was kind of surreal, you know, and to think that all of these, it took 10 years of training to fly in space. Mm -hmm. It took me 10 years from when I got in the Corps in 1998 to flying in February of 2008. So it was a long road to get there but it was so worth it and so sweet. And, you know, learning how to use the green apple, the connections for oxygen, for cooling, much different than these suits that we have here with SpaceX. And so it's a lot more complicated to, to, to go through that whole series of things that you have to do to make sure you're safe in the suit. But we've evolved, we're ready, and uh, they look so cool and calm and collected in their, mm -hmm. their suits and in the vehicle. They're focusing and getting ready to fly in space. And there's so much excitement around the center. I know, Leland, you've been getting some messages. You got another message from another astronaut. Yeah, Sonny Williams. Okay, so Sonny. She's Lauren, kind of the best. She's, the best. she's, a, she's awesome. a commercial crew also. She's she flying. was one yeah. of the original cadres. She was one right. of the original four who trained with Bob and Doug from the beginning of the commercial crew program. And she's one of my classmates. Look at her there. What is uh, she wearing? There she is. Hey, Sonny. The meatball. The, I forgive you, Sonny. <laughs> no, she had the worm one on, on Wednesday. <laughs> So she wore the meatball today. So she's it's the a, best. <laughs> but now she can wear the the, the worm ball. I guess. Yes. The, the worm ball. Yeah, she can she can mix it up. But yeah, Sunny's awesome. She's training to fly on the Boeing Starliner uh, in the not too distant future. So really glad she's watching and showing some love. Uh, so thanks a lot, Sunny, for for sending that note. And again, we're looking at a live view of the Crew Dragon on top of a Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, you can see the crew access arm to the right of your screen. That's the hallway that Bob and Doug walked down. Uh, to get into the white room, which was the last place we saw them standing up before they climbed inside Dragon. And again, the wider shot there of Launch Complex 39A, uh, where we are inside of an hour from liftoff. And I think we're just a couple minutes away from the, the uh, pole we're going to hear before they start propellant load. 
Again, a two-stage rocket there. And gosh, you guys, the weather looks, it looks not that bad. I mean, obviously that is not an official forecast, uh, but it doesn't look quite as bad as it did Wednesday. We've got yeah. a little bit better odds. So uh, there's the countdown yeah, clock. We're... To helium. We're going to pause to listen to that calm. you're just joining us we're less than 50 minutes from the scheduled liftoff of the falcon 9 rocket carrying crew dragon and if we start to hear any kind of update on weather or polling we will pause to listen in for that uh, but if things go as scheduled we should be hearing uh, the launch director verify go for propellant load at about t minus t minus 45 minutes so we're going to send it over to hawthorne to carry the ball john Innsbrucker or or jesse are you there this weather is go at this time dragon copy go weather and there you heard that call out so far we have good weather we are go for launch today this is getting really exciting i don't know about you dan but my heart is beating pretty fast right now yeah we've <laughs> we've been waiting for those words since wednesday <laughs> oh, and yeah. we did we did hear a call to the crew just in case you missed it that they were only tracking one final weather constraint it was the cumulus cloud rule they were expecting it to clear up within 10 minutes and it's cleared up now so we are currently go on weather Yes, and it's been pretty incredible to be so close to launch, and the road leading up to this point has been pretty incredible as well. It has been. It's been a partnership between NASA and SpaceX. We've been working together since we since SpaceX started flying cargo to the International Space Station, now getting ready to launch crew. And we've been really fortunate to work with not only a lot of international partners on the International Space Station, but a lot and of really companies. And there's a reminder here in the control room. We'll be uh, closing doors here uh, once we start with uh, propellant load. Any last minute uh, uh, bio breaks, please go ahead and uh, accomplish those in the next few minutes. And the launch, the launch director just getting the teams ready. We'll be coming up on that propellant loading again. That starts at about 35 minutes prior to liftoff, so in about 12 minutes from now. There's going to be a go, no go coming up really soon. So let's go over to our man, John I, for the latest. John? It's T minus 47 minutes, 24 seconds. We're continuing to count down. As you just heard, the launch director and launch team are preparing for the readiness for launch poll. Now, the launch director is currently checking with Dragon Mission Director and NASA Launch Manager for their readiness. And actually, it sounds like everybody is good there. The launch director will then ask the team, he'll tell them the poll is open. And the 13 members of the SpaceX launch team will be electrically pulled for their go to load propellant as well as continue all the way to launch. Now we will hear that poll results and a briefing from the launch director at about T minus 45 minutes. The good news right now is that the weather is go. All the conditions that were read shortly uh, a while ago at T minus one hour have cleared. We're as the weather forecaster said, cautiously optimistic. Uh, Currently, the probability Hole is complete. We're go for propellant load. Well, we got an early call out there. Launch from... control clear to retract the access arm on time. Remember that arming access arm retract at T minus 45 minutes. Got an early call from SpaceX launch director Mike Taylor that the pole is go. You also heard the direction, T minus 45 minutes to prepare for retract of the crew arm. As we hear more discussion, we'll stop and let you listen in. But right now, weather for liftoff, ground level winds are good, 10 to 15 miles an hour, well within limits. Upper altitude balloons show that conditions are acceptable. The red weather conditions have cleared up, the last one being cumulus clouds. 
And the probability of violation is set at 30% right now. So that's 70% chance of good weather. We're continuing to watch. There is about a less than 10% chance of lightning. We're also watching the abort corridor off of the Atlantic uh, coast. In case, for example, it's stage separation, Dragon had to abort into the ocean. The conditions there are acceptable. There has not been lightning lately. The weather, uh, winds are good, light rain. It is go, but NASA is going to continue to watch those conditions. T minus 45 minutes and counting. Reminder on hold and launch escape protocol. For non urgent no go conditions, brief the CE or LD, and they will approve a boarding launch auto sequence and proceed to launch abort. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will immediately abort the launch auto sequence and proceed to the launch abort auto sequence. Operators shall also advise launch director whether structural break or fire is imminent or occurring for Dragon manual escape flight rules. A reminder on fire alarm instructions in the event of a fire alarm, key operators previously briefed will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personal safety is threatened, evacuate to the south-facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. At this time, weather is go for launch. You can see on the screen, we're inside T-minus 40, we're T-minus 44 minutes, five seconds. Crew access, access arm, arm retracting retract has away. Begun. SpaceX launch director is given the final brief to the crew. And we will be beginning a propellant loading at T minus 35 minutes. So right now on Falcon 9, ready to get into propellant loading. Dragon, crew, getting configured, set up. The arm is pulling away. The range is go for launch. They continue to monitor the air and the sea space. Everything looks good. And we finally have gotten green across the board on the weather conditions but we can't uh, take a deep breath quite yet. We're gonna have to watch the weather all the way down to T0, both here at Kennedy Space Center and out in the Atlantic in the abort zones. Now, earlier we saw many of you following the launch from the United States on our hotspot map. Now that we're inside an hour, we're seeing large numbers of folks logging on, tuning in from coast to coast and around the world. So we'd like to know, is this your first time watching a launch live, not counting Wednesday? And if not, how many have you seen before? Tell us using the hashtag LaunchAmerica from your favorite social media platform. And with that, at T-minus 42 minutes, 50 seconds, conditions are go, and we are counting down for an on-time launch. Let's send it back over to Kennedy Space play. Center as the action begins to pick up on the pad. Dragon, SpaceX, you are go for Section 7, close visors, and arm launch escape system. We will put Section 7 in work, visors come and close. All right, the countdown clock is continuing to tick. My heart is continuing to beat 5 million beats a second. And we are getting so, so close. Uh, Dragon in 7.2, visors are closed. We're arming launch escape system. Copy. And as, you just, and as you just heard, the crew is arming the launch escape system. That is one of the absolute last big milestones uh, prior to liftoff, other than nominal Falcon operations. So just a minute ago, we saw the crew access arm retract, and obviously we just heard on the comms, uh, Bob and Doug getting ready to arm the launch escape system, and so that is something that protects them all the way to orbit. So when, when fueling starts at about T minus 35 minutes, so just over six minutes from now, they will have the capability to abort uh, to separate from Falcon 9 either on the pad or even after liftoff. Um, that's a critical safety capability. And we are going to go over to Hawthorne now to take us through these next minutes. Jesse? Switch in to switch in to nitrogen. And we did hear that call out that they are arming the launch escape system, so very exciting. SpaceX has designed a Crew Dragon and Falcon 9 to be the safest launch, launch uh, system ever flown. Uh, so we brought back Nick Picone, SpaceX's Nick Picone, to talk more about this again. Thanks for coming back and joining us today, Nick. 
Hey, Jesse. Happy to be here. Uh, still <laughs> monitoring the launch here with our recovery and ground operations teams. Awesome. And Nick was our mission manager for our in-flight abort uh, test earlier this year and now works on the Starlink team. Um, Nick, on Wednesday you uh, talked about the launch escape system. Could you just give us a brief summary today for those that are joining today? Sure. So the launch escape system, again, is our, uh, our ultimate safety feature to keep Bob and Doug safe in the event of a, a major Falcon anomaly on the pad. The system is designed to automatically fire if either vehicle detects a dangerous condition developing. And if that happens, Dragon will use its eight Super Draco engines to push the capsule off and away to a safe distance away from this Falcon. Um, this, this capability is absolutely critical. Um, it's what keeps the crew safe. Uh, and we're now active and armed on the pad uh, with it protecting the crew. And as you mentioned, the launch escape system allows the to Dragon to separate and get away from the vehicle. Um, I believe it goes into the ocean. What, what happens after it lands safely in the ocean? Correct. So for most of our failure modes, the successful end state is Dragon deploying parachutes, splashing down safely in the ocean. But since a launch escape can happen while the vehicle's on the pad or anywhere in flight up the orbit, uh, it could be splashing down right off the coast of Cape Canaveral. It could be splashing down thousands of miles away in the North Atlantic. If that happens, to make sure we can get to Bob and Doug as, as quickly as possible, uh, the Space Force's 45th Space Wing, Task Force 45, has pararescue teams staged and ready uh, all around the world, um, ready to drop in and, and rescue Bob and Doug as soon as possible. And you mentioned that the launch escape system will keep them safe all the way up to orbit. Uh, what, what other options are there after Dragon is in orbit? Sure. So if for any reason we're unable to dock to the International Space Station, uh, we have several pre-planned return trajectories, which will bring the capsule down to a splashdown point close to shore. Uh, where NASA and SpaceX recovery forces will be waiting to recover them. Um, it'll look like an otherwise totally normal um, recovery operation except for the early end of mission. Um, this, uh, this operation is something we're doing with one of two identical crew recovery ships. We do that because uh, the landing sites, we want to maintain as much flexibility as possible. There could be changing weather conditions that bring down one site and leave the other one up. Uh, so we have those two identical ships, one in the Atlantic, one in the Gulf of Mexico and our space operations team can redirect the spacecraft to go to whichever site uh, is the safest option for the crew at that time. And with the vehicle in almost any scenario, it sounds like the vehicle will land into the ocean. And that's a, it, it may look like a gentle landing into the ocean, but it's a pretty dynamic event happening. Um, and you mentioned there, there are teams that are ready to go and um, go and rescue the vehicle and the, the astronauts on board. How do you prepare for something like that, especially with so many different scenarios that could happen? Sure. So we're lucky to have had about a decade of recovery experience with Cargo Dragon 1 uh, in our previous trips to the International Space Station. Um, that, along with our booster recovery missions, we've got a great team of recovery operators here who have a lot of offshore experience with our spacecraft. Um, the system, though, that we, we, we took that experience, we built up a new crew recovery ship, uh, two identical crew recovery ships, I should say, uh, which have a lot of those lessons learned baked into the design of that ship and the operations. These new ships have complete medical facilities, an operational helipad and redundant communications, power and propulsion to make sure they're robust and ready for anything we encounter offshore. We've also done tons of training exercises with SpaceX team, the NASA team, and the rescue forces I mentioned earlier, practicing capsule recovery, emergency scenarios where we have to get the crew out of the capsule while they're still in the water, um, as well as those helicopter evacuations taking off and landing from the pad uh, many times so that we make sure the team is, is ready to do that. Uh, they're all staged and ready. Um, they feel ready to support and uh, will be ready to call on us if, if anything goes wrong today. Awesome. It sounds like Bob and Doug are in some really good hands and will be safe no matter what um, uh, occurs uh, on the vehicle. So thank you, Nick, for joining us again, for, for walking us through all of those details. I hope you're just as excited as we are for a launch coming up here very, very shortly now. So we're going to send it over to KSC to Lauren. Thank you, Jesse. So as you just heard, fueling is about to begin at T minus 35 minutes. We are about uh, 50 seconds away from that. Um, and so we're getting really, really close to the first launch of astronauts into orbit from American soil since 2011. 
The launch escape system is armed, which, as you know, happens before fueling. And dragon propellant load, that's the, the, the propellants that are inside of the dragon capsule, not the rocket. Prop load for Dragon took place weeks ago and just a, a few miles down the road in what we call Dragonland. And those propellants, they are MMH or monomethyl hydrazine, which is uh, the fuel that we use. It's hypergolic fuel. And NTO or nitrogen, nitrogen tetraoxide, that's the oxidizer. Those two come together and they ignite in space to propel the vehicle. You don't need that uh, T-TEB or a, a third thing to ignite because uh, um, hypergolic propellants don't require it. You just oh, need the fuel started. and the oxidizer. And as you just heard, uh, propellant load has started on Falcon 9, and that's awesome. All right, so that uh, the, that bipropellant system feeds all of the engines on Dragon. So Dragon has 12 service section um, engines in each. So there's three in each quad. Three, 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 and three. Those are used for on-orbit maneuvering for Dragon. There's also four additional Dracos that are underneath the nose cone for large Delta V maneuvers mm -hmm. that the vehicle will perform. But the engines that uh, that Nick Pacone was talking about earlier are Super Draco engines. Uh, we have two in each quad of the vehicle, so eight total, and those are bigger engines with a high flow propellant system, and those are what lift Dragon off of Falcon 9 in the unlikely event of emergency that requires us to get off of Dragon, mm -hmm. off of Falcon. Now, um, you probably remember, uh, let's see, a Mercury, Apollo, Soyuz, they have that big pointy tower on top. Uh, that's the launch escape system for those vehicles. It, it's actually just another rocket on top of the spaceship that lifts the vehicle off. Um, in the case of Dragon, our escape system is integrated into the vehicle completely. Uh -huh. And so that's one, just better from a one less thing you have to jettison every single flight. Um, but it also allows us to have escape capability from the pad before T0 all the way through to orbit. And so even if the very last minute, if we needed to get off of stage two while we're in space, we could actually escape to orbit. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's the escape system for for a little, little baby dragon here. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Lauren, and, and thanks for, for walking us through that because I think it's really important that people understand um, that critical safety capability, and that's, that's the whole point when we hear that launch escape system right. is armed. What that means is that in an instant, they can separate from Falcon 9, shoot up into the air, and they can splash down safely in the Atlantic Ocean under Dragon's parachutes. And it was designed to do that. So um, now that fueling is underway, we're, it's been uh, going on for about two minutes now. So they have that, safe, that safety capability uh, ready to go on standby in an instant if they need it. And so we want to go over to Hawthorne now for an operational update from John Insprucker. John? Send fuel and stage two fuel, all flow rates tracking nominally. We're T-minus 32 minutes, counting down these final minutes. Everything's still looking good for Falcon 9 and Dragon for an on-time launch. Falcon 9 did begin propellant load at T-minus 35 minutes at planned. Now, on the Falcon 9, we use a fuel and oxidizer as the propellants that power it. The fuel is commonly known as RP-1. That's rocket propellant grade 1 kerosene. The oxidizer is densified liquid oxygen, also called LOX. Densified means it is kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles. This allows for more oxidizer to be loaded into the first and second stages. Now with the fuel and oxidizer on hand, we need an ignition source to complete that fire triangle, as we call it. For this, Falcon 9 uses a fluid called T-TEB. It ignites in the presence of oxygen and gives off a green-colored flame. Now it's hard to see on the first stage ignition due to the water that will be spraying on the pad, but you might just see the green flare as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation over two and a half minutes into flight. Now currently first stage fuel tank is about 10% full. The first stage, as a reminder, as you look on the left side of your screens, the first stage is the long white cylinder at the bottom topped off by the black cylinder. So over two thirds of the rocket is that first stage. 
So the fuel tank is getting loaded. We're also loading the liquid oxygen into the first stage also. The second stage, which is the top one third between the Dragon and the uh, black cylinder, uh, that's the white second stage. That is being loaded with fuel right now. That's about 8% loaded at this moment. Liquid oxygen loading is going to begin on second stage at T minus 16 minutes 30 seconds. Liquid oxygen loading will continue on both stages all the way down to the last few minutes of the count. We're also loading helium into pressure vessels on the stages. That's used to pressurize tanks in flight as the propellant is pulled out by the strong Merlin turbo pumps. On board the Dragon spacecraft, astronauts are monitoring systems while the propellant is loaded into Falcon 9. While we did, we mentioned we had trained them with sounds that we had recorded on board. They've been through most of a propellant load and they are now experiencing those sounds and vibrations. Stage one, the range helium continues load started. To report no problems. They are go to support launch. Weather, the last of the red conditions cleared up about 15 minutes ago. Everything is marginal but acceptable on the weather. We'll continue to watch all the way through the countdown. Now, as a reminder, today we are now into an instantaneous launch window now that we've begun propellant loading. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we'll have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity tomorrow, May 31st. Thanks, John. For Demo 2, Bob and Doug's flight to station will take about 19 hours, and their journey is fairly similar to the trip our cargo dragon makes back and forth to the International Space Station, but with two noticeable differences, and that's docking and splashdown. And as we await T-0 in just under 29 minutes from now, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks to make sure Dragon and Falcon 9 are both ready for liftoff. And we're continuing to get live views inside the capsule with Bob and Doug. And you're now also looking in firing room four down there at the Cape. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon make their ascent until the Falcon 9 first and second stage separates and sends Dragon on its way to the space station. And at this point, mission operators will prepare Dragon for on-orbit operations, where the vehicle will execute a series of burns that gradually raise its orbit to align more closely with the space station, as you can see in this animation. And just after putting Dragon into the same orbital plane as the station, the teams will get ready for Dragon's approach and docking maneuvers. The next Dragon will make its approach and actually dock with the space station. And this is a very different process from what we've seen with Dragon cargo deliveries in the past, which use a process called berthing. Berthing requires a spacecraft to approach the station and then stop so a crew member can maneuver the station's robotic arm to capture the spacecraft. Docking on this version of Dragon can be done autonomously with no crew on board the station. It's typically a faster process, both when arriving and leaving, but it does still require pinpoint accuracy to approach safety. Once captured, a spacecraft then gets attached to a common berthing mechanism, the same type of port that we use to connect each of the modules on the station together. It's a little bit slower of a process, but the hatches are significantly larger than the docking ports, which makes them perfect for bringing up those really big cargo items. Dragon will spend up to 120 days docked before preparing to return home. Following successful completion of Dragon's test objectives and cargo loading operations, the crew will close the cabin, perform final system checks, and configure the vehicle for undocking. Once the automated undocking sequence is complete, Dragon will complete two departure burns using its Draco engines, pushing it away from the space station. And next up on the trip, the orbit entry and landing, or splashdown which is going to cover all the operations following that final departure maneuver. It's going to include events like the trunk separation, closing of the nose cone, a deorbit burn, and then eventually as they get into the atmosphere, the deployment of the drogue and the main parachutes, and all of that ends with splashdown right off the Florida coast. At that point, teams from SpaceX will move in with their recovery ship, grab the capsule out of the water, and work to get Bob and Doug out of Dragon after a successful mission in space. So we are 26 minutes away from launch. Fueling of Falcon 9 is continuing. Let's check in one more time. Down with the team at Kennedy. Murray? 
All right, thanks, Dan. We are so pumped right now because things have cleared up and it looks like we might actually do this today. If you're just joining us, we are now 25 minutes, 46 seconds and counting from the first launch of astronauts Stage to the two, International uh, Space Station from U.S. soil in nine years. This will mark the beginning of a new era where more people will be able to fly to space than ever before. And we want to share with you the results of a poll we asked a little earlier. If you could go to the moon, now it's not where the astronauts are going today, they're going to the space station, but if you could go to the moon, would you rather visit the South Pole where no one has been before or the Apollo 11 landing site? And it was a pretty even split. We had 46% of you say you would go to the moon's south pole, and 54% of you would go to the Apollo 11 landing site. I kind of side with the Apollo 11 landing site because I'm a history buff, and I want to see where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot. So I, I don't know. What do you guys think? Lauren, wh which place would you go? I'd come with you on that one, and I would love to go see that flag there and mm -hmm. those footsteps, those footprints there. They'll still be there, right? There's they no should window still be there. Still be there. Yeah. Leland, how about you? I, I think I'm with both of you because it's just like, you know, the meatball, you know, the classic. Yeah. Going to the classic spot, and that's where – all of it started. That's where all that inspiration came, even though I was an antenna engineer not seeing it. But <laughs> besides that, that's that's history. And hopefully maybe it wouldn't have to be one or the other. That's true. That's exactly. True. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we're going to learn more from going where we've never been before. Exactly. And so we need exactly. to go to the South Pole, too. Um, and we are thrilled to see all of you following along online. Thank you for answering our poll. And we're going to go over to Tahira, who's been monitoring all the action with uh, less than 25 minutes to go. Tahira, I'm sure things are heating up online. Hey, Marie, I mean, you're completely right. Now that we have that go for launch, people are on the edge of their seat right now, waiting on this historic moment to take flight. As you can see, photos are still coming in of just everyone around the country showing their excitement for this launch. And it's really been a touching thing to see how everyone's kept this excitement going from Wednesday's first attempt. So we just took a look at numbers and we are now over 3 million people tuning in for this historic launch. And so for me personally, I just want to wish Bob and Doug the best of luck. This will be my own first time watching humans lift off to space from the United States. And it's just going to be a super emotional moment for that. Marie, back to you at Kennedy for these last minutes before launch. All right. Thanks to Hira and Leland. We got 23 minutes and some change to go. What do you think Bob and Doug are feeling right now? I think, you know, they're, I mean, they're very calm, cool and collected as test pilots. But mm -hmm. I think they're thinking about what are the steps that I have to take if, if a malfunction or something happens. And so the nominal stuff is all kind of automated. But if something happens where they have to intervene with those touch screens, that's what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. And we are we're just inside 23 minutes now. So on Wednesday, we were five minutes further in the countdown when we heard that call to scrub and we the weather was still very touch and go at this right. point on wednesday but today it, it at least for right now i don't want to jinx that i'm afraid <laughs> to even say it out loud but it looks better today yeah and it it, it feels like whew, I, i'm feeling it a lot it more right. than i yeah. did it on wednesday right. And, you know, speaking of Bob and Doug and them being really calm and, and cool and collected, haven't had the opportunity to be in meetings with them and to watch them train, uh, I have to say, and, and, and to all of my friends who work with them every single day, the, the feedback is always just what great people they are right. mm -hmm. and just how not just bright and sharp they are, but just good people. Right. And uh, around the, the office, we often refer to them as the dads. Yeah. The dads? And they're the that? dads. They, they, they're, they're dads. They are dads. Okay. And we've met their families. And when you, when, you, when you see people on that very personal level, it starts to mean so much. They're, they right. are a part of our team. You know, yeah. they're, they're not a customer. They're our team. They're not a payload. They're right. our team. They're a yeah. family. And so we're just so excited to see the dads up there today. Yeah. <laughs> Go dads! And, yeah. <laughs> All right, we, we're going to go send it over to uh, Gary for an update from Houston. Gary? Hey, Marie. The uh, space station team here is focused. All eyes are on the system checks that are happening across the board, and we're listening in as we close in on launch. And I can tell you that things are looking very good. Chris Cassidy will be watching from the International Space Station, right now flying over the Pacific Ocean. It's heading to cross right over the launch pad. We might even get some good views from the station. I uh, hope to be capturing those. 
We'll have the launch view and the big screen up front, and everyone's excited to see our two crew members on their way to the International Space Station. But before we get to it, I just want to pass on good luck from the entire flight operations community here in Houston. It's always exciting to be doing something wholly new and history-making with station operations, and we can't wait to see our team members Bob and Doug in low Earth orbit and heading to the International Space Station. That's it from us here in Mission Control Houston. I'll send it back over to the team in Hawthorne for the latest happening there. John. T minus 20 minutes, 30 seconds. We're Strong continuing the started. countdown. Everything is still looking good for launch of Falcon 9 and Dragon. 22 minutes, 45 seconds after the hour. Stage right two, now on the right hand side, complete. you can see a large white cloud coming off of the strong back. That is normal. As we get ready to load the second stage with liquid oxygen, we have to chill in the plumbing lines going up that strong back. And so as we relieve pressure, the moist, humid Florida air condenses around it, and that gives you the cloud. So that tells us that things are actually on schedule. We did begin propellant load at T-minus 35 minutes. Fuel loading on the second stage, I believe we just heard the call out that it is complete. First stage fuel load is continuing, and right now that's a little more than, uh, that's about 60% of the way full. So things are looking good. Second stage is getting ready to begin the liquid oxygen loading. After they finish chilling in the lines that you see on the monitor, they'll begin the load at T-minus 16 minutes and 30 seconds. The range right now is go, ready to support. Weather continues to be go. Uh, as we inch our way closer, uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, we're waiting to uh, hear if anybody calls out an issue, but for the moment, as you can see on the screen, it looks good. Now on the Dragon tide, the Dragon mission director and the team there are reporting no issues. They've done their communications checkouts. The crew access arm, as you can see, is retracted away from the spacecraft. The crew is strapped in and they are ready to go. Now final instructions will be going to the crew at T minus 10 minutes. The crew displays will be configured for launch and that setup will give astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley insight into how the launch is proceeding and provides constant updates on vehicle health. We've already heard the crew give their go, close their visors and get ready for launch. For Dragon, it'll enter terminal count at T minus five minutes. When it transitions to internal power, we'll hear continued callouts on the countdown net as we get close to zero and to liftoff. But right now at T minus 18 minutes, 15 seconds, everything continues to be go for an on-time launch. So Dan, Jesse, things are looking pretty good. How are they doing over at your stand? Things are great from about 15 feet away from you, John. I and honestly, things are looking pretty great down at the pad there. We're seeing a lot more blue in the sky. Green is the color we want when we're talking about weather, and that's where we're sitting right now. So we're continuing to count down. We are under 18 minutes away from liftoff. Again, it's an instantaneous liftoff um, at, uh, it's going to be 12.22 and 45 seconds here on the West Coast, 3.22 and 45 seconds over on the East Coast there in Florida. Just a reminder, it's going to be about a nine-minute ride up to orbit for the Falcon 9 and Bob and Doug on board Dragon. It'll be a two-stage flight, so we'll see the first stage fly until we hear Miko, or main engine cutoff, about two and a half minutes into flight. After that, the second stage will take over and continue to power them the rest of the way. Second engine cutoff comes in just under nine minutes at about eight minutes and 44 seconds. Following that second stage completing its job, it'll continue to coast for about three minutes. It'll do a a slight attitude adjustment and null out any rate, so make sure it's not in any kind of a spin before they do separation. So that's when the Dragon spacecraft will physically separate from the Falcon 9 vehicle and Bob and Doug will be flying free. It's about a 19 hour ride if we launch today on time. So that means Bob and Doug will get on orbit. They'll have a number of burns or those firings of those Draco thrusters that they'll do. Over Stage two, several, locked load started. We hear the locks. The liquid oxygen load has now started on stage two. But again, they're going to be doing a series of burns on the way uphill towards the International Space Station. Five spread out over the, the first 16 hours or so of their flight until they get much closer, and it's time uh, for that approach and docking. And we are expecting that 
with an on-time launch to happen today. Uh, that'll be coming tomorrow in the afternoon. All right, now that we're under 16 minutes away, we have a special guest joining us. I'm going to toss it over to Jesse. We are T minus 15 minutes and 45 seconds from liftoff of our second demonstration mission today. And we have the honor of having SpaceX's president and COO, Gwen Shotwell, join us. Thanks, Gwen, for coming out and taking a few minutes to chat with us. Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> we know you've been on console. Um, how's the countdown been going so far in there? Countdown is clean today, just like it was Wednesday. Uh, we did clear the weather hurdles sooner mm -hmm. uh, than we did on Wednesday. And the only thing we're watching right now is downrange weather and lightning at the staging location. Of course. But we will clear that hurdle at uh, T minus seven minutes. Awesome. Great. Very exciting. Um, now I'm going to throw it back to 2012 because you were on console for Dragon when it was first making its way to the space station. How does that experience compare to today? So, uh, I was nervous then. I stopped getting nervous for launches. Today I'm nervous again. <laughs> Super nervous. Stomach and throat. Understandable. Um, no, it's a fantastic Fantastic day today. I'm really excited. The team is pulled together. It's such a professional operation. And when I say team, by the way, I mean SpaceX and NASA. This, uh, these folks have been working incredibly hard and have done an, a, a fantastic job. Yes, and we are all so excited. And we know that you have to get back into, inside of Mission Control, but is there anything that you wanted to say before liftoff to NASA and SpaceX? Well, I want to thank NASA, of course, uh, for their, uh, their generosity and their help with getting to this place. I want to thank all the SpaceXers who have come together uh, to make this moment uh, in history. And uh, I want to thank Elon for hiring me. <laughs> <laughs> we thank Elon for hiring you as well. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. We'll let you get back to Mission Control. Um, and good luck with launch today. Thanks, Jesse. And Godspeed, Bob and Doug. <laughs> well, we are so excited. We are just a few minutes away from countdown. So we are going to turn it over to Dan and John for the mi final minutes in terminal count. Uh, take it away, John. T minus 13 minutes, 30 seconds, continuing to count down. We are continuing to load fuel onto the first stage. That should finish up in uh, just about six minutes. Fuel is completely loaded on the second stage. That's closed out. And we are continuing to load liquid oxygen on both the first and second stage. The liquid oxygen load beginning on the second stage uh, just uh, about three and a half minutes ago. We are also loading cryogenic helium into the storage vessels on the first and second stage getting in the last little bits of helium when we keep it uh, cryogenic, cold and liquefied, that gets us, uh, just like we do with liquid oxygen, the maximum amount into the storage volume so that we can get the most performance out of the vehicle. Right now we are in a fairly quiet state on the vehicle. Ground pumps continuing to put the propellant in to first and second stages. Next significant issue, callouts that we're going to hear will probably be inside the T minus 10 minutes when uh, they talk to the crew. We'll listen for that. But at the moment, everything continuing to look good at T minus 12 minutes and 20 seconds. We're getting real close now, John. It's only a little over 12 minutes away. Just a reminder for everybody, it's about a nine minute ride uphill. We'll have some dueling boxes going on as that first stage is going to be coming home while the second stage is carrying Bob and Doug into orbit. So obviously, we'll be keeping an eye on our astronauts the whole way uphill. Some of the calls that you'll be hearing as there will be what we call performance calls over the Dragon to Ground the entire way uphill. And you'll just hear uh, some of the SpaceX engineers calling out uh, trajectories and booster a performance so we're always looking for that word nominal i know that's one of john's favorite words that's one of mine too we want to hear nominal as much as possible up on the way uphill you might also hear some number and letter combinations and those correspond to the different abort zones that bob and doug are in during their flight uphill there's one a and one b 
which signify that they're on the first stage. Those carry them from there in the Cape all the way up to about the very top of North Carolina. And then we'll have 2A through 2E or 2 Echo. And that will be on the second stage. And that goes from North Carolina all the way up to about the tip of Newfoundland. Uh, so in the northern Atlantic. And then there is a zone of the northern Atlantic that we're going to avoid. And so you should hear the call out be something similar to forward to Shannon. And that just refers to Shannon, Ireland, which uh, they'll be going off the coast of Ireland at the later stages of the uh, second stage if they have to abort. So just prepping you now for some of those calls. You're hopefully going to hear that word nominal a whole lot on the way uphill. Ten and a half minutes. Things are pretty quiet. As John I said, it'll pick up at right at about ten minutes. We'll wait for the crew just to confirm that their displays are in order. The crew is already strapped in and reported that they are go for launch. And we'll continue to watch the fuel gauges tick up on the Falcon 9 vehicle until fueling cuts off at just about two minutes prior to launch. Dragon and SpaceX confirmed displays are configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon displays are configured for launch. Copy. Bob, Doug, on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, it's been a huge honor to help you get ready for today's historic mission. Know that we're with you. Have an amazing flight and enjoy those views of our beautiful planet. Thanks, Jay. Uh, it is absolutely our honor to be part of this uh, huge effort to get uh, the United States back in the launch business. Uh, we'll uh, talk to you from more, but thank you. Copy all. Thanks for those words. The SpaceX core, so again, that voice that's going to be talking to Bob and Doug throughout their mission from right here in Hawthorne, just offering a few quick words. The crew did confirm their crew displays are configured for launch. We are coming up on nine minutes and counting. We've gotten through T minus 10 minute with the crew discussions. Activity is now going to switch over to Falcon 9. Our next major event comes at T minus 7 minutes. We begin what we call engine chill. Pre valves will open. Those currently separate propellants uh, on the first stage from getting down to the Merlin engines will open the pre valves. That'll allow fuel liquid oxygen to flow to the top of the pumps. And more importantly, when we open uh, the valves, that will allow us to begin chilling the nine Merlin 1D turbo pumps on the first stage engine. It will take a few minutes to get them cold enough to where they would then be ready to pass the large amounts of liquid oxygen through the pumps and into the main thrust chambers when we get to engine ignition at T minus two seconds. We don't want to try to run uh, highly chilled liquid oxygen through a warm pump. Uh, you would flash that into gas and running gas Sorry, through a high speed hydraulic. pump is not a good thing. So right now, we are waiting for T minus seven minutes. That'll start the engine chill. Shortly after that, we will also get the fuel shut down. Listening to the SpaceX launch director in the background there. As I mentioned, at T minus seven minutes as we start the chill, we will also get into the uh, final topping off of stage one fuel, and then the fuel load will complete. Stage one and stage two engine chill has started. We've heard the call out. Stage one engine chill has started. That's gone up to the crew so that they've got situational awareness. As I mentioned, the pre valves are open. And now we are topping off first stage fuel, getting ready to finish the fuel load. Liquid oxygen load on first and second engine stage will continue until the last three to two minutes of the countdown. Should hear that call out RP1 load complete coming up in about six minutes. Again, RP1 is just that densified kerosene or that rocket fuel 
that Falcon 9 is going to be used to power Bob and Doug to orbit today. And stage one fuel is closed out. Right on time. That call out indicates that the fuel loading on the first stage uh, is complete. Draining back the lines now. So first stage and second stage fuel are complete. Liquid oxygen loading is continuing on both stages. You can see on the view on the left side of the monitor, the condensation, uh, the cold gas wrapped around the stages as the tank skins are chilled by the densified liquid oxygen picking up the humidity Falcon from the Florida air. Line. Looks like at this moment we're a little more than 90% full on the oxidizer on the first stage, ticking up towards that 80% mark on the second stage. We'll be counting down all the way till about two or three minutes, as John and I just said, until everything is loaded. Falcon 9 heaters out. And then we will be go for launch. Dragon has transitioned to configure for terminal count. Vehicle tanks pressing for strong back retract. We're pressurizing the Falcon 9 tanks. We're going to open the clamp arm around the second stage and begin to retract the strong back. We'll move back about two degrees. That'll get us to the liftoff position. At liftoff, the strong back will then recline about 45 strong degrees away. Started. Stage two, RP1 bleed. Launch director called out the strong back retract has started on the left. You'll see it go back just a couple of degrees. Stage one, RPM lead. We are just four minutes away from liftoff. Again, at this moment, Bob and Doug are really just laser focused on those displays. They have insight directly into Dragon and the Falcon 9. They're able to see where their fuel loading is at, how everything's progressing down with the count. AFTS final setup started. Three and a half minutes from launch. And the strong back is now reclining away from the Falcon 9. And back igniter purges. I'll go bleed. Dragon has transitioned to terminal count and is on internal power. Stage one, locks load close out. Okay, we're T minus two minutes, 42 seconds. Stage one, locks load is closed out. Stage two will continue to load for about another half a minute or so. Once we get the completion of stage two locks loading, we have to vent down the line. So you'll see another large white cloud coming off of the strong back. That'll be normal. That'll happen Vehicle around transitioning to T minus power. one minute and 40 seconds. We're going on internal power now. Just a few seconds away from the stage two locks load being complete. It's been almost nine years since we've been in this position. A lot of work done by thousands of people to get to this point. All our eyes focused on two now. Stage two, lock float is closed out. Propound fills are complete. Dragon is an auto idle. Stage two, locks load complete. All fuel, all oxidizer on Falcon 9. One minute, 34 seconds to go till launch. Ground gas closeouts is starting.
Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon is in countdown. FTS is armed for launch. Under a minute now, the FTS, the flight termination system, has been armed. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. SpaceX Dragon, we're go for launch. Let's light this candle. T minus 30 seconds. Stage one tanks pressing for flight. T minus 15 seconds. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Godspeed. Bottom dog. America has launched. One alpha. And so rises a new era of American space flight, and with it the ambitions of a new generation continuing the dream. 20 seconds into flight, stage one propulsion is nominal. T plus 30 seconds into this historic mission. Flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9, and look at them go. Falcon power telemetry nominal. M1D throttle down. We're throttling down to get ready for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. We're in the throttle bucket. Reports say all systems are go. Vehicle is supersonic. We've exceeded Mach 1 on the Falcon 9. M1D throttle up. We're throttling back up to full power as we're through Max-Q. Copy, one Bravo. And we heard that one Bravo call out. That's just the second aboard zone that they're in. They'll continue to be on this until the first stage has done its job and they switch over to the second. At this point, Bob and Doug pulling about 2.3 Gs, 2.3 times the Earth's gravity, already moving at over 1,500 miles per hour. We've heard the call out for MVAC engine chill. That's getting the MVAC engine ready to light. That'll come at about 2.44 into flight. Right now, everything continuing to look good. Next major event coming up is going to be the triple. We'll have main engine cutoff of the nine first stage engines, stage separation, and then ignition of the second stage engine to continue to carry astronauts into orbit. Coming up in about 20 seconds. M M1D throttle down. We heard we're throttling down the Merlin engines on the first stage. And we have Miko. Miko. Two Alpha. Falcon stage separation confirmed. Copy two Alpha. MVAC ignition. All right, we have stage separation confirmed. The first stage beginning its flight back. The second stage being powered by that single Merlin 1D vacuum engine has ignited and is now carrying Bob and Doug into orbit. So they're going to continue under the power of this second stage. Stage two propulsion is nominal which will cut off at SECO, or second engine cut off, at about 8 minutes and 44 seconds into today's flight. So a little over 5 minutes to go still on this second stage. You heard the call out to Alpha, so they're now in the longest abort zone that carries them all the way from about North Carolina up the eastern seaboard almost to Canada. Things looking good, though, getting good call outs, nominal propul pul propulsion on that second stage. Bob and Doug continuing to make their way into orbit. Dragon SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Acquisition of signal in Bermuda. SpaceX Dragon, nominal trajectory. 
All right, here in nominal trajectories, the Dragon pointed in the right direction, continuing to make their flight uphill. Heard acquisition of Signal Bermuda. That's one of the other ground stations that they're using to get telemetry and data back from this spacecraft. Stage two propulsion is still nominal. little over four minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. Bob and Doug flying at more than 5,600 miles Dragon per SpaceX hour. Dragon SpaceX nominal trajectory. Already almost 200 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Nominal trajectory continuing. And while they continue uphill, it looks like we are getting a view of the first stage as well. Yep, on your right screen, you can see that first stage with the grid fins deployed. It's making its way back to attempt to land on our drone ship. Of course, I still love you today. And we're just about a minute, uh, a couple minutes away from the entry burn, and that's where three of the nine Merlin engines do ignite to help slow the vehicle down as it re-enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. And then after the entry burn will be the landing burn, which is just a single engine Dragon, burn. SpaceX nominal trajectory. And you heard nominal starting chill for entry burn. There's that call out. They are still on a nominal trajectory on Dragon, still on second stage. And that's that MVAC engine on second stage on your left screen. Again, on your right screen is that first stage booster coming back towards our drone ship. Of course, I still love you. We're about a minute away from entry burn. Meanwhile, that second stage continuing to power Dragon into orbit. Again, if you're keeping an eye on that timer, that's going to continue to burn until 8 minutes and 44 seconds into flight. So a little over two minutes from now, we'll hear the call out Seco. It'll then be a little stage under, two propulsion a little is still over. good a little over three minutes until Dragon physically separates from the second stage of the Falcon 9 after the upper Dragon stage SpaceX gets a chance. Dragon SpaceX nominal trajectory. Dragon copies nominal trajectory. Continuing to check in with Bob and Doug as they are on a nominal trajectory. Just about 10 seconds away from that first stage, starting that entry burn on your right screen. We should be able to see that view live. Stage one entry burn startup. And there is that entry burn that beginning. Burn. This burn lasts about 36 seconds long. Stage two FTS is saved. That entry burn continues. We're just about a minute away from SECO. We'll have a number of events all happen in rapid succession. Uh, it'll Happy be the shutdown. second engine cutoff. Stage one we'll be looking for down. that uh, stage one landing burn shortly after. Yeah, actually, just within a few seconds of each other. It's such a cool view on your left screen, seeing Bob and Doug on Dragon. Right now, you can see the displays that they are seeing right now themselves. Terminal guidance. And back throttle step. We are coming up 25 seconds or so away from SECO, or second engine cutoff. This is also the point where Bob and Doug are experiencing their highest G-force. We're seeing the counter tick up to right about 1.8. Copy, Shannon. You heard Shannon, so that just means they're in their final abort zones. If they were to abort at this point, would either be in abort to orbit or to land off the coast of Ireland. Standing by for second one cutoff line start confirmation. And back throttle step. And back shut down. Stage one landing Confirmation of Seco's second engine cutoff. 
Now we are waiting for our first stage to make its way to our drone ship. Of course, I still love Dragon, you. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal orbital insertion. Launch escape system is disarmed. Nominal orbital Captain insertion. Nominal orbital one insertion. Ready to deploy. And what you're seeing on your screen is a live view of our drone ship, where our first stage will be coming down. Looks like we lost that live view, but we'll wait for confirmation of that landing shortly here. Falcon 9 first stage is successfully landed. And the there you can see on your screen, Falcon 9 has landed. This is the first Falcon 9 to carry okay, humans to me. orbit, so very exciting for us. And as you can see on your right screen, Bob and Doug are still making their way to their targeted orbit. m one to recovery one. <laughs> so exciting today. <laughs> it doesn't stop. It does not stop. All right, we did, we did hear again that call out, good orbital insertion, so that means Falcon 9 and Dragon right now exactly where they're supposed to be. And we need an FRC on recovery one. And it's right at about 12 minutes when Dragon will separate. Looks like we saw a zero G indicator floating around there. I know Bob and Doug owe us a little bit about what exactly that is that they brought up with them. <laughs> And before separation, before Dragon initiates separation from the second stage, they do make sure to make, they, they do ensure that the vehicle is not spinning and it is in good con condition before we separate. That's right. The upper stage does small attitude maneuver using some cold gas thrusters built into the rocket body itself. Exactly. So we do expect that separation to occur in about a minute from now, but they do wait until they have full confirmation that it is ready to separate. Such cool views. I cannot get over this view that we are seeing right now. Bob and Doug on the right screen, inside of Crew Dragon, out in space. Yeah, already 200 kilometers over planet Earth, or a little over 124 miles, traveling in excess of 2,700 meters. 27,000 meters per second, or about 16,000 miles per hour. So again, we're just standing by. That separation event should be coming up shortly. Then they'll begin a series of checks on the Draco thrusters that are going to be used to maneuver and then power Dragon on its flight to the International Space Station. Standing by for separation. Expected loss of signal, wallops. It sounds like we had an expected LOS loss of signal with one of the ground stations. Waiting for confirmation now of that. Dragon setup. separation confirmed. Dragon separation and confirmed. <laughs> there is a great view right in front of you Found of Dragon December. separating. Separation and there's that call out. Dragon is now officially making its way to the International Space Station today. <laughs> Dragon SpaceX, with that separation call, uh, we have a few words for you from our Falcon 19. Standing by. Dragon, Chief Engineer on Dragon to Ground. Bob Doug, on behalf of the entire launch team, thanks for flying with Falcon 9 today. We hope you enjoyed the ride and wish you a great mission. Thanks, Bala. Congratulations to you and the F9 team for the first uh, human ride for Falcon 9, and it was incredible. Uh, appreciate all the hard work, and uh, thanks for the great uh, ride to space. Copy all. Good luck. Luck. Proud of you guys and the rest of the team. Uh, thank you so much for what you've uh, done for us today, putting America back into low Earth orbit from the Florida coast. Copy all. Good luck. Godspeed. All right, so Bob and Doug are in and Dragon space. Dragon SpaceX, we confirm nominal equals activation and service section Draco checkouts. Uh, no scone deploys in progress. Copy all. We're monitoring. The core here in Hawthorne giving the crew a heads up. 
that we have confirmation the nose cone is deploying. So, again, that nose cone is going to open up a little bit more than 90 degrees, goes up to about, I think, 105 degrees, and that's going to expose uh, the actual docking ring and the hatch that they're going to be going through once they attach to the International Space Station. And also four of those Draco thrusters, we call them the forward bulkhead thrusters, they're going to be used for these major phase burns or firings of those thrusters to actually raise their orbit gradually over the coming hours. Also heard good activation of the ECLIS, that's the Environmental Control and Life Support System. That's everything controlling their atmosphere, uh, just keeping Dragon a nice, safe, habitable environment where they're going to be living for the next 19 hours until they arrive at the space station. Right, exactly. And Falcon 9's job may be done for today, but the mission is not over. Crew Dragon's job is not done. As you can see, Bob and Doug are still inside Crew Dragon making their way. It will be a 19-hour trip to the International Space Station before they dock tomorrow morning. And such cool views. I love that we can get these live views here and see and watch what they're doing now that they are in orbit. Yeah, it's, it's incredible to just be looking over their shoulder to be along for the ride. And we're going to be with them, and we're going to be with all of you the entire way uh, for their journey to the space station. We're going to be covering live throughout. Uh, Bob and Doug will obviously have a sleep period uh, where they'll get about eight hours of sleep a little bit later today before they wake up for all of their final approach. Uh, one of the major things we are looking forward to in the next couple of hours is going to be their first turn at the controls. So they're actually going to be using those touchscreen displays to take control and manually pilot Dragon. We'll walk you through what that's going to look like. And assuming we have some good ground station coverage, we'll be able to get views from right inside Dragon, looking over their shoulder as they manipulate the controls at the display. But, I mean, it, we had a, a smooth ride uphill, both stages of the Falcon 9 doing their job, placing Bob and Doug in orbit. I mean, this is, this is a day, this is a historical day. This is us kicking off that new era of space flight that we've all been talking about and longing for since the space shuttle program came to an end in 2011. Yes. And the weather, the weather cooperated. Yes. Second time's a charm. <laughs> right. All right, so day for the history book, books. As you can see, we have lost some live signal there, but the mission still continues, and we're going to send it over to KSC um, to continue uh, broadcasting live with you. Loss of signal in Newfoundland. Yeah, Jesse and Dan, we are just in awe over here. When I woke up this morning and looked at the weather forecast, I was like, Man, we're going to be back here on Sunday, but we we did it, we did and it. the room cleared out. Everybody was outside watching, and the and the inside the lights were shaking, the cameras were shaking. Lauren came back in with tears in her eyes. <laughs> uh, this is really amazing. I, I I can't believe it. I saw it <laughs> with my own eyes. This is I, I'm a little bit speechless. Um, just so grateful that we got them up there, and there's a lot more to go. A lot more to go, but I'm so happy they're safe right now. I'm just so happy. Yeah. Leland, you were talking <sighs> about it. It's amazing what we can do when we work together. Yes, American astronauts on an American rocket from American soil showing you what Americans can do when we come together as a team and blast Doug and, and Bob off to the cosmos. This is, this is what it's all about, and their families and everyone is working together to uh, to take them up to space safely. So I'm, um, I don't know what to say. Um, that rocket <laughs> fuel is still in my in my veins, and uh, I want to go get on the rocket. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's too late now. Maybe I the know. next one. I know. But Thank we want to go over to uh, Daryl at OSB2. The, he's there with the administrator, who um, hopefully has more words than we do because we're still kind of speechless. Daryl. Pretty incredible here, Marie, at the operations support building, where a chorus of applause has been happening from the beginning of launch and throughout the various stages. Some very special guests were here to watch it. That includes President Donald Trump, Vice President Mike Pence, and NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine, who joins me now. And you were with the President and the Vice President. Um, America's back launching human astronauts again. Tell me how you feel about that, and tell me about the president watching the launch and what happened there. So this has been a long time coming. Um, it's been nine years since we've launched American astronauts on American rockets from American soil, and now it's done. <laughs> we have done it. 
It's been way too long. I want to give a lot of credit to Charlie Bolden. He was my predecessor as the NASA administrator. Uh, he fought hard for this program at a time when it didn't get any, any support in Congress. Uh, we now have an administration that is fully supportive of, of our spaceflight initiatives, not just on the exploration, discovery, going to the moon, onto Mars, but also from a Space Force perspective. Our budgets are going up, things are strong, and today was just, uh, it was an, uh, uh, just an amazing day. You know, one of the things the President did right out of the gate when he became President is he created what's called the National Space Council. And he put the Vice President as Chairman of the National Space Council. And on that National Space Council, you've got the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Commerce, the Secretary of Transportation, the Secretary of Education, um, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, all of these different um, amazing individuals that deal with space day in and day out. A lot of people don't realize how many parts of the federal government deal with space. And the Vice President invited those members of the National Space Council here as well. So um, we, we just had, and then we had members of Congress, bipartisan members of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, who have been involved in supporting this program um, you know, for, for a long time now. So um, I'll just tell you, I, I, I'm breathing a sigh of relief but I will also tell you, I am not going to celebrate until Bob and Doug are home safely. Um, tomorrow, they're going to dock to the International Space Station. Tonight, I'm heading to Houston to be at the, the Johnson Space Center uh, when that happens. So um, it is, it is a, it's a bit of a relief. The, the nose cone is now open. Um, it's now deployed, uh, which means that um, you know now we're going to go into some, some burns. We're going to have some phasing burns. We're going to have some... Um, some you know boosting burns, and we're going to get uh, as much as we can in alignment with the International Space Station um, as early as possible here. But also, um, I know it's hard, but you know the big thing that we need to do now is <laughs> we got to get Bob and Doug, who have now gone through this exercise twice. They need to get some rest. Um, but I, I can guarantee you there will be no rest for a good, a good amount of time while they're up there in orbit. And they are certainly on their way. And a lot of people joining us for this entire celebration and watching it. We just heard uh, 10 million people watching live as this launch happened. And President Donald Trump becoming the third sitting president to watch a launch live from the Kennedy Space Center. The first. Well, to be clear, the, I think he's the only sitting president to watch American astronauts launch on a brand new rocket that has never launched before. Uh, and uh, that's a big risk. You know, he also said we're going to go to the moon by 2024. That means he's, <laughs> he's putting himself at risk to say, look, I'm going to be accountable, potentially, I'm going to be accountable to the, the initiatives that I put forward. And I think that's, we have not had that kind of leadership for space in a very, very long time. And, uh, and we're, we're so grateful for it. What was it like watching the launch with the president? How did he react? Oh, I, I'll tell you, um, it's obviously something that um, is near and dear to him. He said it a year and a half ago. He put it in the State of the Union speech. He said, we're going to launch American mm -hmm. astronauts on American rockets from American soil. And, of course, I was like, in my, in my head, I'm thinking, we better get, we better get after this. <laughs> um, and, uh, of course, we've, had, we, we've worked overtime to, to, to make it happen. Um, we might be a little behind schedule, <laughs> but we got it done, and we got it done Safely, we're knocking on wood, um, but um, but so far so good. It's looking good. You personally, Jim, as that rocket was lifting off, and you felt that rumble. Yeah. Uh, what'd you feel? What'd you experience? Well, I was praying. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I was praying. I was praying for Bob and Doug. I was praying for their families. I was praying for their safe return, even though they're just going. Um, but man, I'll tell you, it was. Uh, I've heard that rumble before, but it's a whole different feeling when you've got your own team on that rocket and uh, and they are our team they are America's team this is launch America this is everything that America has to offer in its purest form and times are tough right now there there is no doubt um, we've got the coronavirus pandemic we have other challenges as a country but I hope this moment in time is an opportunity for everybody to reflect on humanity and what we can do when we work together when we when we strive and when we achieve and if this can inspire a young child to become the next Elon Musk or the next Jeff Bezos or the next Sir Richard Branson, uh, then that's what this is all about. Or the next Jim Bridenstine. Yeah. <laughs> well, I wouldn't put me in that category. but. Well, we appreciate your leadership for the space agency at this time. And congratulations on Thank an amazing you. day in the launch. Thank you. It's been a, a great ride. All right. Very good. Marie, we'll send it back to you in the studio. 
Doug and Bob are on course to arrive at the International Space Station tomorrow, May 31st, at 10.27 a.m. Eastern Time. And we'll be staying on the air for continuous live coverage along the entire ride to the station. So though our coverage here is concluding, we will turn it over to the teams in Hawthorne and Houston to take us through the next phases of the Demo-2 mission, all the way through hatch opening and a welcome ceremony on the space station for Bob and Doug tomorrow. That's right. And as you follow along, we invite you to tune into a post-launch news conference. That's happening here at 6.30 this evening, Eastern Time on NASA TV. We'll have NASA and SpaceX leaders here to take questions live on this unprecedented achievement and human spaceflight. And in addition to NASA TV, you can follow along always on Twitter at, at NASA and NASA.gov for mission updates as it progresses. Here now are highlights from the mission so far, May 30th, 2020. Remember this day. You'll, you'll have this memory forever, the day America returned astronauts to orbit from U.S. soil. Wow, we're making history again. Let's go.